Book One of the Nicomachean Ethics. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Geoffrey Edwards. The Nicomachean Ethics by Aristotle. Translated by Thomas Taylor. Book One. Chapter One every art and every method and in like manner every action and deliberate choice appear to aspire after a certain good hence it is well said that the good is that which all things desire of ends however there appears to be a certain difference for some of them are energies but others of them besides these are certain works but in those things in which there are certain ends besides the actions in these the works are naturally adapted to be better than the energies since however there are many actions and arts and sciences there will also be many ends for the end of medicine is health of the shipbuilding art a ship of the military art victory and of the economic art wealth but such arts as are of this kind are arranged under one certain power just as the bridle making art is arranged under the equestrian art and such other arts as pertain to equestrian instruments both this art however and every warlike action are arranged under the military art and after the same manner other arts are arranged under other powers but in all these the ends of those arts which are architectonic or master arts are more eligible than all the ends of the arts which are subordinate to the master arts for the latter are pursued for the sake of the former it makes however no difference whether the energies themselves are the ends of actions or something else besides these in the same manner as in the above mentioned sciences chapter two if therefore there is a certain end of actions which we wish to obtain for its own sake but we desire other things on account of this and our choice is not directed to all things for the sake of something else bracket, for thus there would be a progression to infinity so that appetite would be empty and vain close bracket. if this be the case it is evident that this end will be the good and to that which is the most excellent will not therefore the knowledge of this end be of great importance with respect to life for by having like archers a mark at which we may aim we shall obtain what is fit in a greater degree if this however be the case we must endeavour to adumbrate what it is and show to what science or power it belongs but it would seem that it belongs to that power which is the most principal and is especially architectonic and the political power or science appears to be a thing of this kind for this ordains what sciences ought to be instituted in cities and which of them ought to be learnt by the several individuals and to what extent we likewise see that the most honourable of the powers or faculties are arranged under this power as for instance the military the economical and the rhetorical powers since however the remaining practical sciences use this political science and since it also legally establishes what ought to be done and from what it is required to abstain the end of this science will comprehend in itself the ends of the other sciences so that this will be human good itself for though the good of an individual and a city is the same yet to obtain and preserve the good of a city appears to be something greater and more perfect for we must be satisfied indeed if we can effect the good of an individual alone but it is more beautiful and divine to effect the good of a nation and cities these are the things therefore which the method being political requires chapter three it will however be discussed sufficiently if it is rendered perspicuous according to its subject matter for accuracy must not be similarly investigated in all discussions as neither in all the works of art things beautiful however and just 
with which the political science is conversant possess so great a difference and are involved in so much ambiguity that to some persons their subsistence appears to be from law only and not from nature what is good likewise possesses a certain ambiguity of this kind because it happens that many persons are injured by it for some have perished through wealth but others through fortitude we must be satisfied therefore in speaking about and from such things if we can indicate the truth by a rude adumbration and if our conclusions in discussing things which have a frequency of subsistence are similar in accuracy to the things themselves after the same manner likewise it is requisite to admit every thing that has been said for it is the province of an erudite man so far to investigate the accurate in each genus of things as the nature of the thing will admit since it appears to be a similar thing to assent to a mathematician when speaking probably and to require demonstrations from a rhetorician every one however judges well of those things which he knows and of these is a good judge hence the man who is learned in anything judges well of that thing but he in short forms a proper judgment about everything who is learned in everything hence a youth is not a proper auditor of the political science for he is unskilled in the actions pertaining to life but reasonings are from and about these and besides this if he yields to his passions he will in vain and without any advantage be an auditor of ethical doctrines since the end here is not knowledge but action it makes however no difference whether a person is a youth as to his age or has juvenile manners for the defect is not from time but from living and engaging in every pursuit from passion since the knowledge of such persons in the same manner as that of intemperate is useless but a knowledge of these things will be very advantageous to those whose appetites and actions are conformable to reason and thus much by way of preface concerning the auditor of ethics how he ought to admit discussions of this kind and what we propose to consider in this treatise chapter four repeating therefore what we have said since all knowledge and deliberate choice aspires after a certain good let us show what that is which we say the political science desires and what the supreme good is of all actions by name therefore it is nearly acknowledged by most men for both the vulgar and the learned call it felicity but they conceive that to live well and to act well are the same thing as to be happy concerning felicity however what it is they are dubious and the multitude do not form the same opinion of it as the wise for some of them indeed conceive it to rank among the number of things which are clear and evident such as pleasure or wealth or honour but others assert it to be something else frequently likewise the same person forms a different opinion of it for when diseased he conceives it to be health but when poor riches and those who are conscious of their ignorance admire those who assert something grand and above their comprehension some too besides these many goods are of opinion that there is another good subsisting by itself which is the cause to all these of their being good to examine therefore all the opinions would perhaps be a vain undertaking but it will be sufficient to consider those that are most eminent or which appear to be in some respect reasonable we must not however be ignorant that arguments from principles and to principles differ from each other for plato well doubts about and investigates this whether the way is from principles or to principles as in a race from the president of the games to the goal or the contrary for we must begin from things that are known but these subsist in a twofold respect for some things are known to us but others are simply known perhaps therefore we should begin from things known to us hence it is necessary that the auditor of discussions about things beautiful and just and in short about political concerns if he is to be benefited should be adorned with worthy manners for the principle is this that the thing is so viz that certain actions are worthy and others are unworthy 
and if this is sufficiently apparent it is not at all requisite to know why it is so but such a one either possesses or will easily acquire ethical principles let him however who has neither of these hear what hesiod says he the first rank of excellence maintains who from himself in everything is wise and what even to the end is best foresees he too is good who yields to wise advice but he who neither from himself is wise nor to assent to others can endure is but a useless despicable man chapter five let us however return from whence we have digressed for it seems that men do not unreasonably form an opinion of good and felicity from the different kinds of lives the vulgar indeed and the most worthless part of mankind place felicity in pleasure and on this account they embrace the life which consists in the enjoyment of pleasure for there are three kinds of lives which especially take the lead the one we have just mentioned the political life and the third is the contemplative life the multitude therefore appear to be perfectly servile deliberately choosing the life of cattle and they support their opinion by the example of many persons in power who have preferred a voluptuous life and have lived like sardanapolis but men of elegant minds and those who are addicted to practical concerns place felicity in honour for this is nearly the end of the political life this however appears to be more superficial than the good which is the object of our investigation for honour seems to be rather in the persons that honour than in him who is honoured but we prophesy that good is something appropriate and of which it is difficult to deprive its possessor farther still it seems that men pursue honour in order that they may believe themselves to be worthy persons they seek therefore to be honoured by wise men and by those to whom they are known and with a view to virtue it is evident therefore that according to these men virtue is more excellent than honour perhaps however some one may apprehend that this virtue is rather the end of the political life but even this appears to be more imperfect than the chief good ought to be for it appears to be possible that he who possesses virtue may sleep or be unemployed through the whole of his life and besides this may be afflicted with evils and experience the greatest misfortunes but no one would proclaim a man thus living to be happy unless for the purpose of defending his position and concerning these things indeed enough for we have spoken sufficiently about them in our miscellaneous writings but the third life is the contemplative which we shall make the object of our consideration hereafter the life however which is engaged in the acquisition of riches is a certain violent life and it is evident that wealth is not the good which we investigate for wealth is useful and for the sake of something else hence the things which have been before mentioned may be considered as ends rather than wealth for they are loved on their own account it appears however that neither does felicity consist in these though many arguments are adduced to prove that it does these things therefore we shall dismiss chapter six perhaps however it is better to consider universal good and inquire how it is said to subsist though such an inquiry as this will be arduous because the men who have introduced ideas are our friends but it may perhaps seem to be better and indeed necessary to the salvation of truth to subvert the opinions even of our friends for both being our friends i e plato and truth it is wholly to give the preference to truth those however who have introduced this opinion do not make ideas of things in which they admit there are the prior and the posterior hence neither do they establish an idea of numbers but good is predicated of essence of quality and of relation that however which has a subsistence per se and essence are naturally prior to that which subsists as a relative for this i e a relative resembles the branch of a tree and an accident of being so that there will not be a common idea in these again good is predicated in as many ways as being for it is predicated in essence 
as god and intellect which are essences and are said to be good and in quality as the virtues in quantity as the moderate in relation as utility in time as occasion and in place as a habitation and after the same manner in the other predicaments it is evident therefore that there will not be a certain common universal and one good for it would not be predicated in all the categories but in one alone farther still since of all things which subsist according to one idea there is also one science of all goods there would be one certain science but now there are many sciences of things which are under one category thus for instance with occasion the art of commanding an army is conversant in war but the medical art in disease and with the moderate indeed the medical art is conversant in food but the gymnastic art in labour it may however be doubted what their intention is in denominating every idea itself since in man itself and in man there is one and the same definition of man for so far as man there is no difference between them but if this be the case neither so far as good will be good itself and goods differ nor will it be in a greater degree good from being eternal since neither is that which is white for a long time more white than that which is white only for one day the pythagoreans however appear to speak more probably concerning the good for they place the one in the coordination of things good whom spusippus also seems to have followed but the discussion of these things pertains to another treatise a certain doubt however presents itself concerning the particulars we have just mentioned because reasons are not assigned concerning every good but things which are of themselves the objects of pursuit and love are predicated according to one species and those things which are effective of these or in a certain respect preserve them or impede their contraries are predicated on account of these and after another manner it is evident therefore that goods may be predicated in two ways and that some things indeed are good per se but others are good on account of these separating therefore goods per se from things useful let us consider whether they are predicated according to one idea but what kind of goods can be said to be good per se are they such as are pursued alone apart from other things such as to be wise to see and some pleasures and honours for these though we pursue them on account of something else yet at the same time may be ranked by some one among goods which are good per se or is the good per se nothing else except idea form therefore or idea will be vain but if these also rank among goods which are good per se it will be requisite that the same definition of the good should be conspicuous in all of them just as there is the same definition of whiteness in snow and cirrus but of honour and prudence and pleasure there will be other and different definitions so far as they are goods the good therefore is not something common according to one idea in what manner however is it said that there is one idea of the good for it does not resemble things which are fortuitously homonymous is it because all goods are from one and are referred to one good or is it rather according to analogy for as sight is in the body so is intellect in the soul and another thing in another perhaps however these things must be omitted at present for the accurate discussion of them will be better adapted to another philosophy and in a similar manner concerning idea for even if there is some one good which is predicated in common or which is something itself separate by itself it is evident that it can neither be practicable nor acquired by man but now that which is practicable by man and which he may obtain is the object of investigation perhaps however the knowledge of this separate good may to some one appear to be better with respect to those goods which may be acquired and which are practicable for having this as an exemplar we may in a greater degree 
know those things which are good for us, and by knowing may more easily obtain them. This assertion, therefore, has indeed a certain probability, but it seems to be dissonant to the sciences, for all the sciences aspire after a certain good, and investigate that which is wanting, omitting the knowledge of it, though it is not reasonable to suppose that all artists are ignorant of, and do not search for an aid of such great importance. It is likewise dubious what advantage a weaver or a carpenter would derive to their arts from the knowledge of the good itself, or how he who surveys the idea of the good will become more skilled in medicine or in commanding an army. For it appears that the physician does not in this way consider health, but that he considers the health of man, and perhaps rather the health of this particular man, for he restores to health an individual, and thus much concerning these things. Chapter 7 Now, however, let us return to the investigated good, and show what it is. For it appears that there is a different good in a different action and art, since there is one good in the medical art, another in the art of commanding an army, and in a similar manner in the remaining arts. What, therefore, is the good of each? Is it not that for the sake of which other things are affected by that art? But this in the medical art indeed is health, in the art of commanding an army is victory, in the art of building a house is a house, and something else in another art. And in every action and deliberate choice it is the end, since all of them perform other things for the sake of this. Hence, if there is one certain end of all actions, this will be the practical good. But if there are many ends, these will be practical goods. The reasoning, however, in its transition arrives at the same thing, as was asserted by us in the beginning. But we must endeavour to render this still more clear, because, therefore, it appears that there are many ends, and of these we choose some on account of others, such as wealth, flutes, and in short instruments, it is evident that all ends are not perfect. That, however, which is most excellent, appears to be something perfect, so that if there is only one certain perfect end, this will be what we investigate, but if there are many, it will be the most perfect of these. We denominate, however, that which is pursuable for its own sake, more perfect than that which is pursuable for the sake of something else, and that which is never eligible on account of another thing, than things which are eligible both on their own account and for the sake of something else. In short, the completely perfect is that which is always eligible on its own account, and never on account of something else. Felicity, however, especially appears to be a thing of this kind, for we always choose this on its own account, and never on account of anything else. But we choose honour, and pleasure, intellect, and every virtue on their own account. Indeed, bracket, for though we should derive no farther advantage than what the possession of them affords, yet each of them would be the object of our choice. Close bracket. Yet, we also choose them for the sake of felicity. No one, however, chooses felicity for the sake of these, nor, in short, for the sake of anything else. The same thing also appears to happen from that which enables a man to be sufficient to himself, for perfect good appears to be self-sufficient. But we call the self-sufficient that which is not only sufficient to him who lives a solitary life, but which is also sufficient to parents and children, to a wife, and in short, to friends and fellow citizens, since man is naturally a political animal. A certain boundary, however, must be assumed of these things. For if good is to be extended to parents and their offspring, and to the friends of friends, there will be a procession to infinity. But this, indeed, we shall consider hereafter. We call, however, the self-sufficient that which, subsisting by itself, alone makes life eligible, and in want of nothing. But we think that felicity is a thing of this kind, and, besides this, we think that it is the most eligible of all things, and is not conumerated with any other good. For, if it were conumerated, 
with even the smallest good it is evident that it would be more eligible since that which is added would become an excess of good but a greater good is always more eligible felicity therefore appears to be something perfect and sufficient to itself being the end of actions perhaps however to say that felicity is the best of things is to assert that which is acknowledged by all men but it is requisite that we should yet more clearly say what it is perhaps therefore this will be effected if the work of man is assumed for as to the player on the flute to the statuary and to every artist and in short to those who have a certain work and action the good and the excellent appear to be in the work this also may appear to be the case with man if he has a certain work whether therefore are there certain works and actions indeed of a carpenter and a shoemaker but of man is there no work and is he naturally indolent or shall we say that as of the eye the hand and the foot and in short of each of the parts of the body there appears to be a certain work so likewise of man shall we admit that besides all these there is a certain work what then will this work be for to live appears to be common also to plants as well as to men but the peculiar work of man is now investigated the nutritive and augmentative life therefore must be rejected and a certain sensitive life will be consequent to this it appears however that this also is common to a horse and an ox and to every animal a certain practic life therefore accompanied with reason remains but of this one kind is obedient to reason but the other possesses reason and energizes discursively since this life however is predicated in a twofold respect i e according to energy and according to habit it must be admitted to subsist according to energy for this appears to be predicated according to a more principal mode of subsistence but if the work of man is the energy of soul according to reason or not without reason and we say that the same thing is the work of the human species and of a worthy man just as the same thing is the work of a harper and of a good harper and in short this is the case in all things excellence according to virtue being added to the work for the work of a harper is to play on the harp and of a good harper to play well on it if this be the case and we admit the work of man to be a certain life and this to be the energy of the soul and actions in conjunction with reason but by a worthy man these things are well and beautifully performed and everything is well accomplished according to its proper virtue if this be the case human good will be the energy of soul according to virtue but if there are many virtues it will be the energy of soul according to the best and most perfect virtue and besides this in a perfect life for as one swallow does not make spring nor one day so neither does one day nor a little time make a man blessed and happy let this therefore be a description of the good for it is necessary perhaps as in a picture first to delineate and afterwards add the colours but it would seem that any one may be able to adduce and distinctly arrange things which are well delineated and the time is the inventor of or a good co-operator with things of this kind whence also accessions are made to the arts for any one may add to what is wanting it is also requisite to call to mind what has been before said and not to search for accuracy similarly in all things but investigate it in each according to the subject matter and so far as is appropriate to the method pertaining to the inquiry for a carpenter and a geometrician investigate a right angle differently the former indeed so far as is useful to his work but the latter explores what it is or what the quality is which it possesses for he is a contemplator of truth after the same manner therefore we must proceed in other things lest what is superfluous should become more abundant than the works themselves neither must the cause be required similarly in all things but in some as for instance concerning principles 
it is sufficient to have shown properly that they are but the subsistence of a thing is the first thing and the principle of principles however some are surveyed by induction others by sense others from a certain custom and others in a different way but we should endeavour to discuss everything so far as its nature permits and should earnestly apply ourselves to define well for this is of great importance with respect to what is consequent the principle therefore appears to be more than half of the whole and many of the things which are objects of inquiry become manifest through it chapter eight felicity therefore must be considered by us not only from the conclusion and the particulars from which its definition consists but also from the assertions of others concerning it for everything which is inherent in a thing accords with the truth but what is true is rapidly dissonant with what is false since goods therefore have a twofold distribution and some of them are said to be external but others pertain to the soul and the body we call those pertaining to the soul the most proper and principal goods but we place the physical actions and energies about the soul hence it is well said according to this opinion which is ancient and assented to by those who philosophize that felicity is the energy of the soul according to virtue it is also rightly said that certain actions and energies constitute the end i e felicity for thus felicity will consist in the goods pertaining to the soul and not in external goods with this reasoning likewise the assertions accord that the happy man lives well and acts well for nearly felicity will be a certain living well and acting well it appears moreover that everything which is sought for in felicity is inherent in the definition we have given it for to some indeed felicity appears to be virtue to others prudence and to others a certain wisdom but to others it appears to be these things or some one of them accompanied with pleasure or not without pleasure others also comprehend in the definition of felicity external affluence but of these opinions some are supported by the authority of many and ancient men and others by a few and renowned men it is not however reasonable to suppose that either of these have wholly erred but that they have erred in some one particular and are right in most things with those therefore who say that felicity is every virtue or a certain virtue our assertion accords for it is the energy of the soul according to virtue perhaps however it differs in no small degree to conceive that what is most excellent consists in possession or to conceive that it consists in use and that it consists in habit or in energy for it is possible that habit when inherent may be effective of no good as in him who is asleep or who in some other way is inactive but this cannot be the case with energy for he who possesses virtue in energy necessarily acts and acts well but as in the olympic games not the most beautiful and the strongest are crowned but those who contend for some of these are victorious so those who act rightly obtain those things in life which are beautiful and good the life also of these is in itself delectable independent of external pleasure for to be delighted is among the number of things pertaining to the soul but to every one that is delightful of which he is said to be a lover as a horse to a lover of horses and a spectacle to a lover of spectacles after the same manner also just things are delightful to a lover of justice and in short what pertains to virtue to a lover of virtue things therefore delectable to the multitude are hostile to each other because they are not naturally delightful but to the lovers of what is beautiful in conduct those things are delectable which are delectable by nature and such are the actions according to virtue so that they are delectable to these and are so per se the life also of these is not at all in want of pleasure as a certain appendage but contains pleasure in itself for in addition to what has been said he is not a good man who does not rejoice in beautiful actions for neither would any one call him just who does not rejoice in acting justly 
nor him liberal who does not rejoice in liberal actions and in a similar manner in the other virtues if this however be the case actions according to virtue will be of themselves delectable but they are also good and beautiful and especially each of these if the worthy man judges well concerning them but he judges in the way we have said felicity therefore is a thing most excellent most beautiful and most delectable nor are these to be separated from each other according to the delian inscription quote, that which is most just is most beautiful but to be well is the best of things and for a man to obtain the object of his love is the most delectable of things Close quote. for all these are inherent in the best energies but we say that felicity is all these or one of them and that the most excellent at the same time however it appears as we have said that external goods are requisite to felicity for it is impossible or not easy to perform beautiful actions without the assistance of externals since many things are indeed performed as it were through instruments by means of friends and wealth and political power the privation also of some things such as nobility a good offspring and beauty defile a blessed condition of being for he cannot be entirely happy who is very deformed in his body or of ignoble birth or who leads a solitary life and is deprived of children and perhaps he can in a still less degree be entirely happy if his children are very vicious or being good die as we have said therefore a completely happy life requires such a prosperity as this whence also some arrange prosperity but others virtue in the same place with felicity chapter nine hence also it is doubted whether felicity is a thing which may be acquired by discipline or custom or in some other way by exercise or whether it accedes by a certain divine allotment or from fortune if therefore any other thing is the gift of the gods to men it is reasonable to suppose that felicity also is the gift of divinity and especially because it is the best of human concerns this however will perhaps be more adapted to another discussion but it appears that though it should not be sent by divinity to men but is procured through virtue and a certain discipline or exercise it belongs to the most divine of things for the reward and end of virtue appears to be most excellent and something divine and blessed felicity also will be a thing very common for it is able to be present through a certain discipline and attention to all men who are not mutilated with respect to virtue but if it is better that felicity should be acquired after this manner rather than from fortune it is reasonable that it should be so acquired since natural productions subsist in such a way as it is most beautiful for them to subsist and in a similar manner things which are produced by art or by any other cause and especially such as are produced by the most excellent cause to commit however the greatest and most beautiful of things to fortune would be very lawless and reprehensible the object of investigation likewise is apparent from the definition of felicity for we have said that it is a certain energy of the soul according to virtue but of the remaining goods some indeed are present from necessity but others cooperate and are naturally adapted to be useful organically these things also will accord with what we have said in the beginning for we established the end of the political science as the best end but this pays the greatest attention to the citizens in order to render them characters of a certain description and that they may be good men and practisers of beautiful actions reasonably therefore do we neither call an ox nor a horse nor any other irrational animal happy for it is not possible that any one of them can partake of such energy as this through this cause likewise neither is a child happy for he is not yet on account of his age a practiser of things of this kind but those children who are said to be happy are proclaimed to be blessed through hope 
that when they become men they will obtain the rational energy in perfection for felicity as we have said requires perfect virtue and a perfect life for many mutations and all various fortunes happen in life and it is possible that he whose affairs are in the most prosperous condition may in old age fall into the greatest calamities as in heroic poems it is fabled concerning priam but no one would call him happy who experiences such misfortunes and who dies miserably chapter ten shall we say therefore that no other man is to be proclaimed happy as long as he lives but that according to solon it is requisite to look at the end of life if however we admit this is a man therefore then happy when he dies or is this perfectly absurd especially to those who say as we do that felicity is a certain energy but if neither we call him who is dead happy nor was this the intention of solon but his meaning is that a man may be securely proclaimed blessed as being now out of the reach of evils and misfortunes even this also is attended with a certain doubt for there appears to be a certain good and evil to him who is dead if there is also to him who is alive but without sensation such as honour and ignominy and in short the prosperity and adversity of his descendants this however also presents us with a difficulty for it is possible that to the offspring of him who has lived to old age blessedly and has died rationally many mutations may happen and that some of them may be good and may obtain a life according to their desert but that the contrary may take place with others it is likewise evident that there may be an all various apostasy in them from the manners of their parents it would therefore be absurd if he who is dead should also be changed together with them and should at one time become happy and again miserable it is likewise absurd that the affairs of descendants should not for a certain time be of any consequence whatever to parents let us however return to the former subject of doubt for perhaps that which is now investigated may be surveyed from it if therefore it is necessary to look to the end of life and then to proclaim each man blessed not as being now blessed but because he was so before is it not absurd when he is happy i e while he is living that what is present with him i e felicity should not be asserted of him with truth because we are unwilling to proclaim the living happy on account of the mutations of life and because we apprehend felicity to be something stable and by no means easily to be changed but fortunes frequently circulate about the same persons for it is evident if we should follow fortune we must frequently call the same man happy and again miserable thus evincing the happy man to be like the chameleon and possessing an infirm stability or shall we say that it is indeed by no means right to follow fortune for living well or ill is not among the gifts of fortune but human life as we have said requires the goods of fortune the energies however according to virtue are the mistresses of felicity but the contrary energies are the mistresses of the contrary that also which is now the subject of doubt bears testimony to our assertion for in no human affair is there so much stability as in the energies according to virtue since they appear to be more stable than even the sciences themselves and of these very energies those that are most honourable are also most stable because blessed men principally and most assiduously live in these for this appears to be the cause that oblivion does not happen concerning them the object of investigation therefore is present with the happy man and he will be such through life for always or the most of all men he will perform and contemplate things pertaining to virtue will bear the changes of fortune most beautifully and in the most perfectly elegant manner as being truly good and a square without blame since however many things happen from fortune and which differ in magnitude and parvitude it is evident that prosperous and in a similar manner adverse circumstances 
when they are small, are of no consequence to the life of man, but that such as are great and numerous, if they are indeed prosperous, render life more blessed. For they are also naturally adapted to adorn life, and the use of them is beautiful and good, and that, on the contrary, if they are adverse, they oppress and injure beatitude, for they bring with them molestation, and are an impediment to many energies. At the same time, however, even in these, the beauty of good conduct shines forth, when a man bears many and great misfortunes easily, not through an insensibility of pain, but in consequence of being generous and magnanimous. But if energies are the mistresses of life, as we have said, no one who is blessed will become miserable, since he will never do anything that is odious and base. For we are of opinion that the man who is truly good and wise will bear all fortunes in a becoming manner, and from existing circumstances will always perform the most beautiful deeds just as a good general will use the army under his command in the most warlike manner, and a shoemaker from the leather with which he is supplied will make the most beautiful shoes, and the same thing will take place with all other artists. If this, however, be the case, the happy man will never become miserable, nor yet if he should fall into the calamities of Priam will he be blessed, nor again is he various and easily changed for he is not easily moved from felicity, nor by any casual misfortunes, but by such as are great and numerous, and after such calamities as these, he will not again become happy in a short time, but if he does recover his felicity, it will be in a certain long and perfect time, in which he will become a partaker of things of a great and beautiful nature. What then prevents us from calling the man happy who energizes according to perfect virtue, and who is sufficiently supplied with external goods, not for any casual time, but through a perfect life? Or ought we to add that he must also thus live and die conformably to nature, since the future is unapparent to us, and we admit that felicity is an end, and entirely and in every respect perfect? But if this be the case, we must call those among the living blessed, to whom the particulars we have mentioned are and have been present, but we must denominate them blessed as men, and thus much concerning these things. Chapter 11. That the good or bad fortune, however of descendants and of all friends, should contribute nothing to the happy man, appears to be a thing very unfriendly and contrary to the opinions of mankind. But since many things happen, and which possess an all various difference, and some of them pertain to us in a greater, but others in a less degree, to discuss them severally appears to be a long and an infinite undertaking. It will, therefore, perhaps be sufficient to speak of them universally, and to adumbrate what they are. As of the calamitous circumstances, then, which happen to the happy man, some have a certain weight and are of importance in life. This is likewise the case with respect to all his friends. It makes a difference, however, whether each of the calamities happens to the living or the dead, and the difference is much greater than whether the illegal and dreadful deeds which are the subject of tragedy have been formerly perpetrated or are perpetrated now. In this way, therefore, the difference may also be collected. Perhaps, however, it ought rather to be doubted concerning the dead, whether they partake of any good or ill. For it appears from these things, that though something should arrive to them, whatever it may be, whether good or the contrary, it is something debile and small, either in its own nature or to them. But if it should possess a certain power, yet it cannot be so great, or of such a kind, as to make those happy, or not so, or to deprive those of blessedness who are. The prosperity, therefore, and in a similar manner the adversity of friends, appears to contribute something to the dead, yet with respect to them they are of so little consequence as neither to make those that are happy unhappy, nor affect anything else of the like kind. Chapter 12 These things being discussed, let us consider, with respect to felicity, 
whether it is among the number of things laudable or rather of things honourable for it is evident that it does not consist in power it seems therefore that everything which is laudable is praised because it possesses a certain quality and is in a certain respect referred to something for we praise the just and the brave man and in short the good man and also virtue on account of works and actions we likewise praise the strong man and the racer because they are naturally adapted to possess certain qualities and have reference in a certain respect to something good and worthy but this also is evident from the praises which pertain to the gods for they appear to be ridiculous when referred to us this however happens as we have said because praise subsists from relation but if praise is given to things of this kind it is evident that no praise can be given to the most excellent things but something greater and better pertains to them as also appears to be the case for we proclaim the gods to be blessed and happy and we also proclaim the most divine of men to be blessed and in a similar manner we celebrate what is good for no one praises felicity in the same way as he does justice but he proclaims it to be blessed as something more divine and excellent than justice eudoxus likewise in his defence of pleasure appears to have given it the palm of victory in a proper manner for in consequence of its not being praised as being among the number of good things he considers this an indication that it was more excellent than things that are laudable but god and the good are things of this kind for other things also are referred to these for praise indeed is given to virtue since from this we are enabled to perform beautiful deeds encomiums however pertain to deeds and in a similar manner to bodies and souls the accurate discussion however of these things is perhaps more adapted to a treatise on encomiums but to us it is evident from what has been said that felicity is among the number of things honourable and perfect it seems likewise that it is so because it is a principle for we all of us do everything else for the sake of this but we admit that the principle and the cause of what is good is something honourable and divine chapter thirteen since however felicity is a certain energy of the soul according to perfect virtue we must direct our attentions to virtue for perhaps we shall thus also speculate better concerning felicity but it seems that he who is skilled in the administration of public affairs labours especially about this for he wishes to make the citizens worthy persons and obedient to the laws and as an example of these we have the legislators of the cretans and the lacedaemonians and any others there may have been of this kind if however the speculation itself is of the political science it is evident that the inquiry will be conformable to our intention from the beginning but our discussion must be concerning virtue viz human virtue for we investigate human good and human felicity and we call human virtue not the virtue of the body but of the soul and we say that felicity is the energy of the soul if however this be the case it is evident that he who is skilled in the administration of public affairs ought to know whatever pertains to the soul just as he who intends to cure the eyes ought to have a knowledge of the whole body and this in a greater degree by how much more honourable and excellent the political is than the medical science of physicians likewise the more elegant are busily employed about their knowledge of the body he therefore who is skilled in the administration of public affairs must direct his attention to the soul but he must direct his attention to it for the sake of these things and so far as is sufficient to the objects of inquiry for to consider the soul still more accurately is perhaps more laborious and difficult than the present discussion requires we have also said some things sufficiently concerning it in our popular writings and those who must be consulted such as that one part of the soul is irrational but another rational but whether these parts are separated in the same manner as the parts of the body and everything which is partible 
or they are two parts in definition alone and are naturally inseparable as in the periphery of a circle the convex and the concave is of no consequence in the present discussion of the irrational part however one part resembles the common and vegetative power i mean the power which is the cause of nutrition and increase for such a power as this may be admitted to exist in everything that is nourished in embryos and also in perfect animals since it is more reasonable that this power should exist in them than any other the virtue therefore of this power appears to be common and not human for this part seems especially to energize in sleep but a good man and a bad man can in the smallest degree be distinguished in sleep whence it is said that the happy differ in no respect from the miserable during the half of life but this happens reasonably for sleep is an inactivity both of the worthy and the depraved soul except so far as certain motions gradually arrive at the soul and on this account the phantasms of worthy are better than those of worthless men but of these things enough the nutritive part therefore must be omitted since it is naturally destitute of human virtue there appears however to be another certain irrational nature of the soul which nevertheless participates in a certain respect of reason for we praise the reason of the continent and also of the incontinent man and that part of the soul which possesses reason for it rightly excites to the most excellent deeds there appears however to be in them i e both in the continent and incontinent something else naturally contrary to reason which wars against and resists reason for indeed as the paralyzed parts of the body if we wish to move them to the right hand are on the contrary moved to the left thus also it is in the soul for the impulses of the incontinent are in a direction contrary to the dictates of reason in bodies however we see that which is moved contrary to the intention of the will but in the soul we do not see that which is moved contrary to reason though perhaps we ought nevertheless to think that in the soul also there is something opposite to reason which is adverse and proceeds in a direction contrary to it but it is of no consequence in what manner it is different from reason this part however appears as we have said to participate of reason it is obedient therefore to the reason of the continent man and perhaps it is still more obedient to the reason of the temperate and brave man for all things are in concord with his reason it appears therefore that the irrational part is twofold for the vegetable part in no respect participates of reason but the part which desires and in short the orectic part participates in a certain respect of reason so far as they are attentive and obedient to it in this way therefore we say that a man has a regard for or pays attention to his father and his friends and not after the same manner as he has a regard for the mathematical sciences but that the irrational part is in a certain respect obedient to reason admonition and all reproof and exhortation indicate if however it be requisite to say that this part also possesses reason that which possesses reason will be twofold the one indeed properly and in itself but the other resembling a child attentive to his father virtue likewise is distributed according to this difference for we say that of the virtues some are dianoetic or belong to the power which reason scientifically but others ethical and we denominate indeed wisdom intelligence and prudence dianoetic virtues but liberality and temperance ethical virtues for when we speak concerning the manners of man we do not say that he is wise or intelligent but that he is mild or temperate we likewise praise a wise man according to habit but we call the laudable habits virtues end of book one Recording by Jeffrey Edwards Book Two of the Nicomachean Ethics. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by J. 
Geoffrey Edwards, The Nicomachean Ethics, by Aristotle, translated by Thomas Taylor. Book Two, Chapter One. Since, however, virtue is twofold, one kind being dianoetic, but the other ethic, the dianoetic, indeed, for the most part receives both its generation and increase from doctrine on which account it requires experience and time but the ethic is produced from custom from whence also it derives the name which declines but a little from ethos Thus a stone, which naturally tends downward, cannot be accustomed to tend upward, though some one should hurl it upward ten thousand times. Nor can fire be accustomed to tend downward, nor can anything else among the things which have natural tendencies different from these be accustomed to any other tendency than that which it has from nature. The virtues, therefore, are neither from nature, nor are ingenerated in us preternaturally but they are produced in us in consequence of our being naturally adapted to receive them and becoming perfect through habit again with respect to such things as are ingenerated in us by nature of these we first receive the powers but afterwards employ the energies of those powers which is evident in the senses for it is not from frequently seeing or frequently hearing that we receive these senses but on the contrary having these senses we use them and we do not have them by using them with respect to the virtues however we receive them by first energizing according to them in the same manner as in the other arts for those things which it is necessary to do in consequence of having learnt how to do them these by doing we learn how to do thus by building we become builders and by playing on the harp we become harpers Thus, too, by acting justly, we become just, prudent by acting prudently, and brave by acting bravely. But what happens in cities bears testimony to the truth of this, for the legislators, by accustoming the citizens to virtue, render them worthy characters, and this indeed is the intention of every legislator. But such as do not affect this well, err. And in this one polity differs from another, the good from the bad farther still from the same things and through the same things every virtue is generated and corrupted and in a similar manner every art for from playing on the harp both good and bad harpers are produced and analogously builders of houses and all other artists for from building well they will be good builders but bad from building ill since if it were not so there would be no occasion for a preceptor but all men would be naturally good or bad artists the like also takes place in the virtues for by acting in our compacts with men we become some of us indeed just but others unjust and by acting in things of a dreadful nature and by being accustomed either to be terrified or to be confident in danger some of us become brave but others timid the reasoning likewise is similar with respect to desire and anger for some men indeed become temperate and mild but others intemperate and irascible these from being in this way conversant with these things but those from being conversant with them in that way and in one word habits are produced from similar energies hence it is necessary to render energies endued with a certain quality for habits follow from the differences of these it is of no small consequence therefore to be thus or thus accustomed immediately from our youth but it is of very great consequence or rather it is everything chapter two since therefore the present treatise is not for the sake of theory like other discussions for our attention is not directed to this business that we may know what virtue is but that we may become good men since otherwise no advantage would be derived from it this being the case it is necessary to consider with respect to actions how they are to be performed 
For, as we have said, they are the mistresses of the qualities which habits possess. To act, therefore, according to right reason is common, and is now assumed to be so. We shall, however, hereafter speak concerning this, and show what right reason is, and how it subsists with reference to the other virtues. But this must be previously granted, that every treatise of practical affairs ought only to be an adumbration, and not an accurate discussion, as also we observed in the beginning, because reasonings are required conformable to the subject matter, and in practical affairs, and things contributing to them, there is nothing stable, as neither is there in things which are salubrious. Such, therefore, being the universal reason, in a still greater degree, will the discussion of particulars be deficient in accuracy, for it neither falls under art, nor under any precept. It is, however, necessary that those who are engaged in practical affairs should always direct their attention to an opportune time, in the same manner as in medicine, and in the pilot's art. But, though the present discussion is of this nature, we must endeavour to give it assistance. In the first place, therefore, this must be observed, that things of this kind, viz., actions which produce in us the habits of the virtues, are naturally adapted to be corrupted by excess and defect, as we see in strength and health, which are the virtues of the body. Bracket, for it is necessary to use things apparent as testimonies, in things which are unapparent. Close bracket. Since exercises which are excessive, and also those which are deficient, corrupt the strength of the body, in like manner meat and drink, when taken in too great or too small a quantity, corrupt the health. But these, when commensurate, produce increase and preserve it. This, therefore, is also the case in temperance and fortitude, and the other virtues. For he who flies from and is afraid of all things, and endures nothing, becomes timid. And he, who in short is afraid of nothing, but marches up to all things, becomes audacious. In a similar manner, he indeed who gives himself up to the enjoyment of every generations, increments, and corruptions are produced from and by the same things, but the energies also of the virtues will subsist after the same manner, since this likewise is the case in other things which are more apparent, as, for instance, in strength. For strength is produced by taking much food, and enduring many labors, and the strong man is especially able to do both these. Thus, too, it is in the virtues, for by abstaining from pleasures we become temperate, and, having become temperate, we are especially able to abstain from them. The like also takes place in fortitude, for by being accustomed to despise things of a terrible nature, and to endure them, we become brave, and having become brave, we are especially able to endure terrible things. Chapter 3 it is necessary, however, to consider as an indication of habits the pleasure or pain which is attendant on actions. For he who abstains from corporeal pleasure, and is delighted in doing so, is a temperate man. But he who is grieved when he abstains from them, is intemperate. And he indeed who endures dreadful things, and is delighted with his endurance, or feels no pain from it, is a brave man. But he who feels pain from the endurance of them is a timid man. For ethical virtue is conversant with pleasures and pains. For we act basely through the influence of pleasure, but we abstain from beautiful conduct through the influence of pain. Hence it is necessary, as Plato says, to be so educated in a certain respect immediately after our youth, that we may be delighted and pained with things from which it is requisite to feel pleasure or pain. For this is right education. Farther still, if the virtues are conversant with actions and passions, but pleasure and pain are consequent to every passion and action, on this account also virtue will be conversant with pleasures and pains. The punishments likewise, which are inflicted through these, indicate the truth of this. For they are certain remedies, but remedies are naturally adapted to operate through contraries, 
again as we have also before observed the nature of every habit of the soul is referred to and conversant with those things by which it is adapted to become better and worse but habits become depraved through pleasures and pains by pursuing or avoiding these either such as ought not to be pursued or avoided or when it is not proper or in such a way as is not proper or in as many other modes as such things are distinguished by reason hence some persons define the virtues to be certain apathies and tranquillities but they do not define them well because they speak simply and do not add in such a way as is proper and when it is proper and such other additions as are usually made it is admitted therefore that virtue is a thing of this kind which is conversant with pleasures and pains and practices things of the most excellent nature but vice is the contrary from what has been said likewise we may obtain still greater evidence about these things for as there are three things which pertain to choice and also three which pertain to aversion viz the beautiful in conduct the advantageous and the delightful and three the contraries to these the base the disadvantageous and the painful the good man indeed acts rightly in all these but the bad man erroneously and especially in what pertains to pleasure for pleasure is common to all animals and is consequent to every thing which is the object of choice for the beautiful and the advantageous appear to be delightful again pleasure is co-nourished with all of us from our infancy on which account also it is difficult to wipe away this passion with which our life is imbued we likewise direct our actions by pleasure and pain as by a rule some of us in a greater and others in a less degree on this account therefore it is necessary that the whole of this discussion should be conversant with these things for to rejoice or be pained properly or improperly is of no small consequence in actions farther still it is more difficult to fight with pleasure than with anger as heraclitus says but both art and virtue are always conversant with that which is more difficult for that which is well done is better when it is effected with greater difficulty hence on this account also the whole business both of ethics and politics is conversant with pleasures and pains for he who employs these well will be a good man and he will be a bad man who employs them badly we have shown therefore that virtue is conversant with pleasures and pains and that it is increased and corrupted by the same things by which it is produced when they do not exist after the same manner and that it likewise energizes about the things from which it originated chapter four it may however be doubted what our meaning is in asserting that men by acting justly become just and temperate by acting temperately for if they act justly and temperately they are already just and temperate just as those who perform things pertaining to grammar and music are grammarians and musicians or shall we say that this is not the case in the arts for it is possible that a man may do something grammatical both from chance and the suggestion of another person he will therefore then be a grammarian if he both does something grammatical and grammatically that is according to the grammatical art which he possesses again neither is the thing similar in the arts and the virtues for things produced by the arts contain in themselves efficient excellence it is sufficient therefore to these to be affected with a certain mode of subsistence but things which are performed according to the virtues are not done justly or temperately if they subsist in a certain way but if he who does them does them in consequence of being disposed in a certain way and in the first place indeed if he does them knowingly in the next place if with deliberate choice and also deliberately choosing to do them on their own account and in the third place if he does them with a firm and immutable disposition of mind these things however are not conumerated as requisites to the possession of the other arts except the knowledge of them alone but to the acquisition of the virtues the knowledge of them is of little or no efficacy while the other particulars pertaining to them are capable of effecting no small thing but are all-powerful and these are obtained from frequently acting justly and temperately things therefore are said to be just and temperate when they are just as a just or temperate man would perform 
but he is a just and temperate man not who merely does these things but who does them so as just and temperate men do them it is well said therefore that a man becomes just from acting justly and temperate from acting temperately but that from not doing these things no one will ever become a good man the multitude however do not thus act but flying to words they fancy they shall philosophize and thus become worthy characters acting similarly to sick persons who attentively indeed hear what the physicians say but do nothing which they order them to do as therefore these by such a method of cure never have their body in a healthy condition so neither is the soul of those ever well who thus philosophize chapter five in the next place we must consider what virtue is since therefore three things are produced in the soul viz passions powers and habits virtue will be some one of these but i call passions indeed desire anger audacity envy joy love hatred cupidity emulation pity and in short those things to which pleasure or pain are consequent and i denominate powers those things according to which we are said to be susceptible of the passions viz according to which we are able to be angry or pained or are inclined to pity but i call habits those things according to which we are well or ill disposed towards the passions thus for instance with respect to being angry if we are vehemently or remissly disposed towards it we are badly affected but if moderately we are well affected and in a similar manner with respect to the other passions neither the virtues therefore nor the vices are passions because we are not said to be worthy or depraved according to the passions but we are said to be so according to the virtues or vices and because according to the passions we are neither praised nor blamed for neither he who is afraid nor he who is angry is praised nor is he who is simply angry blamed but he who is angry after a certain manner but we are praised or blamed according to the virtues and vices further still we may be angry and afraid without any deliberate intention of being so but the virtues are certain deliberate elections or are not without deliberate choice in addition to this also we are said to be moved according to the passions but we are not said to be moved according to the virtues and vices but to be disposed in a certain way on this account neither are the virtues powers for we are neither said to be good nor bad from being able simply to suffer nor are we through this either praised or blamed and again we possess powers indeed from nature but from nature we do not become either good or bad we have however spoken concerning this before if therefore the virtues are neither passions nor powers it remains that they are habits and thus we have shown what virtue is generically chapter six it is necessary however not only to show that virtue is a habit but likewise to show what kind of a habit it is we must say therefore that every virtue renders that of which it is the virtue well disposed and causes its work to be well accomplished thus for instance the virtue of the eye causes both the eye and the work of it to be good for by the virtue of the eye we see well in a similar manner the virtue of a horse causes the horse to be good for the race for carrying his rider and sustaining the enemy in battle but if this be the case in all things the virtue of man will also be a habit from which man becomes good and from which he accomplishes his own work and how this indeed will be effected we have already shown but it will again be now manifest if we consider what the quality is of the nature of virtue in everything therefore which is continued and divisible it is possible indeed to assume the more the less and the equal and this either with respect to the thing itself or with reference to us but the equal is a for instance if ten things are many but two a few six are assumed as a medium 
with reference to the thing, for six equally surpasses and is surpassed. But this is a middle according to arithmetical proportion. The middle or medium, however, with reference to us, is not thus to be assumed. For if to eat ten pounds is to eat much, but two pounds a little, it does not follow that the master of the gymnastic exercises will order six pounds to be eaten. For this perhaps will be too much or too little for him who is to take food. For Milo, indeed, it would be too little, but for him who is beginning the exercises it would be too much. And the like must be understood of the course and wrestling. Thus, therefore, every scientific man will avoid excess and defect, but will search for the medium, and make this the object of his choice. He will, however, explore that medium, which is not the middle of the thing, but is a middle with reference to us. corrupt that which is excellent in them but that mediocrity preserves this and if good artists as we say operate looking to this but virtue in the same manner as nature is more accurate and better than all art if this be the case it will tend to the medium as a boundary i speak however of ethical virtue for this is conversant with passions and actions but in these there is excess and defect and the middle thus for instance it is possible to be afraid to be confident to desire and abhor to be angry and to pity and in short to be pleased and pained in a greater and less degree and to be both these improperly but to have these passions when it is proper and in such things towards such persons and for the sake of that which and as it is proper this is the middle and the best and pertains to virtue in a similar manner also in actions there is excess and defect and the middle but virtue is conversant with passions and actions in which the excess indeed is erroneous and the defect is blamed but the medium is praised and possesses rectitude and both these pertain to virtue hence virtue is a certain medium and tends to the middle as a boundary again to err is manifold for evil, as the Pythagoreans conjecture, belongs to the infinite, and good to the finite, but it is only possible to act rightly in one way. Hence, the one is easy, but the other difficult. It is easy, indeed, to deviate from the mark, but difficult to hit it, and on this account, excess and defect belong to vice, but the medium to virtue. For simple the good, all various are the bad. Virtue, therefore, is a pre-elective habit, or a habit accompanied with deliberate choice, existing in a medium with reference to us, and which is defined by reason, and in such a way as a prudent man would define it. It is also the medium between two vices, the one being characterized by excess, but the other by defect, and farther still it is defined by this, that some of the vices fall short of, but others surpass the becoming, both in passions and actions but virtue both discovers and chooses the medium hence according to the essence and the definition which explains the very nature of a thing virtue is a medium but according to that which is best and subsists well it is a summit not every action however nor every passion receives a medium for some passions, as soon as they are named, are complicated with depravity, such as malevolence, rejoicing in the evils of others, impudence, envy, and in actions, adultery, theft, and murder. For all these, and others of the like kind, are thus denominated, because they are themselves bad, and not the excesses nor the defects of them. Hence, it is not possible at any time to act rightly in these, but they are always attended with error. Nor does acting well, or not acting well, in things of this kind, consist in committing adultery, when, and as it is proper, but simply to do any of these things is to act wrong. To require, therefore, a medium in these, is just as if some one should think it proper that there should be a medium, excess and defect, in doing an injury, and in acting timidly and intemperately 
for thus there would be a middle of excess and defect and an excess of excess and a deficiency of defect as however there is no excess and defect of temperance and fortitude because the middle is in a certain respect the summit so neither is there a middle excess and defect in those passions and actions but in whatever manner they are exerted they are attended with error for in short neither is there a middle of excess or defect nor are there excess and defect of the middle chapter seven it is necessary however not only to assert this universally but also to adapt it to particulars for in what is said concerning actions universal assertions indeed are more common but those that are particular are more true since actions are conversant with particulars with which assertions ought to accord these therefore are to be assumed from description of fear and confidence therefore fortitude is the medium of the characters however which exceed the one indeed which exceeds by a privation of fear is anonymous but that which exceeds in confidence is audacious and he who exceeds in being afraid but is deficient in confidence is timid in pleasures and pains however though not in all pleasures but in such as are corporeal and in those especially which pertain to the touch and in a less degree in pains the medium indeed is temperance but the excess in temperance but those who are deficient in the pursuit of pleasures do not very frequently occur on which account neither have they obtained a name they may however be called insensate in giving and receiving money the medium indeed is liberality but the excess and defect are prodigality and illiberality in which men exceed and are deficient in a contrary way for the prodigal indeed exceeds in spending money but is deficient in receiving it and the illiberal man exceeds in receiving but is deficient in spending money at present therefore we think it sufficient summarily to adumbrate these things but afterwards we shall discuss them more accurately with respect to wealth however there are other dispositions of the mind and the medium indeed is magnificence for the magnificent differs from the liberal man in this that the former is conversant with greater but the latter with small things the excess however is an ignorance of elegance and decorum and illiberal profusion but the defect is an indecorous parsimony in spending money and these vices differ from those which surround liberality but in what they differ we shall afterwards show with respect to honour and ignominy the medium indeed is magnanimity but the excess is called a certain inflation of the mind and the defect pusillanimity as we have said however that liberality corresponds to magnificence but differs from it in this that it is conversant with small things so too magnanimity which is conversant with great honour another certain virtue corresponds and which also is itself conversant with what is small for it is possible to aspire after honour in such manner as is proper and more and less than is proper but he who exceeds in his desires of honour is said to be ambitious but he who is deficient is unambitious and the middle character between both is anonymous the dispositions also are anonymous except the disposition of the ambitious man which is denominated ambition hence the extremes contend for the middle place and we indeed sometimes call the middle character ambitious and sometimes unambitious and sometimes we praise the ambitious and sometimes the unambitious man but from what cause we do this will be shown hereafter now however conformably to the manner in which we begun let us speak about the rest with respect to anger therefore there is likewise excess defect and a medium but since these are nearly anonymous we call the middle character a mild man and the medium mildness but of the extremes let him who exceeds be wrathful and the vice be wrathfulness and let him who is deficient be a man void of anger and the defect a privation of anger there are likewise three other media which have indeed a certain similitude to each other but differ from each other for all of them are conversant with the communion of words and actions but they differ because one of them is conversant with the truth 
which is in them, but the others are conversant with the delectable, and of this, viz. the delectable, one kind consists in jest, but another in all the concerns of life. We must, therefore, also speak concerning these, in order that we may in a greater degree perceive that in everything the medium is laudable, but the extremes are neither right nor laudable, but reprehensible. Of these, therefore, the greater part also are anonymous, but we must endeavour in the same manner as in the rest to give names to them for the sake of perspicuity, and the facility of understanding what follows. With respect to truth, therefore, the middle character may be called veracious, and the medium truth, but of dissimulation, that kind which exaggerates may be called arrogance, and he who possesses it an arrogant man, and that which extenuates may be called irony, and he who employs it may be denominated ironical, or a dissembler. With respect, however, to the delectable, and that kind which consists in jest, the middle character, indeed, may be called facetious, and the disposition itself facetiousness. But the excess may be denominated scurrility, and he who possesses it a scurrilous man. And he who is deficient may be called a rustic man, and the habit itself rusticity. In the other species of the delectable, which pertains to the concerns of life, he who delights in such a way as is proper is a friend, and the medium is friendship, but he who exceeds, if it is not with a view to any advantage, is studious of pleasing, but if for the sake of advantage is a flatterer, and he who is deficient and in all things unpleasant is contentious and difficult to be pleased. There are, likewise, media in the passions, and in things pertaining to the passions, for bashfulness is not a virtue, and yet the modest man is praised. For in these things one indeed is called the middle character, another is said to exceed, and another to be deficient. And he indeed who exceeds and is bashful in all things is, as it were, astounded. But he who is deficient and is not ashamed of anything is impudent, and the middle character is the modest man. Indignation is a medium between envy and joy for the calamities of others. But these habits are conversant with the pain and pleasure arising from what happens to others. For he who is propense to indignation is indeed pained from those that do well undeservedly. But he who is envious, surpassing the indignant man, is pained from all that do well. And he who rejoices in the calamities of others is so much deficient in feeling pain from the prosperity of bad men that he is delighted with it. These things, however, are discussed by us elsewhere, i.e. in the second book of the rhetoric. With respect to justice, however, since it is not predicated simply, we shall make it the subject of discussion hereafter, viz. the fifth book, and show how each of its parts is a medium. In a similar manner also we shall speak concerning the rational or intellectual virtues in the sixth book. Chapter 8 Since, however, there are three dispositions of the soul, two indeed of vices, of which the one subsists according to excess, but the other according to defect, and since virtue is one of these dispositions, and is a medium, all these three dispositions are in a certain respect opposed to all. For the extremes are contrary to the middle, and to each other, but the middle is contrary to the extremes. For, as the equal is, with reference to the less, greater, but with reference to the greater, less. Thus the middle habits exceed with reference to the deficiencies, but are defective with reference to the excesses, both in passions and actions. For the brave with reference to the timid man appears to be audacious, but with reference to the audacious man, timid. In a similar manner also the temperate man, with reference to him who is insensate, appears to be intemperate, but with reference to the intemperate man, insensate. But the liberal, when contrasted with the illiberal man, appears to be a prodigal, but when compared with the prodigal, illiberal. Hence, the extremes propel the medium each to the other, and the timid calls indeed the brave man audacious, but the audacious man calls him timid, and analogously in the other extremes. These, however, being thus opposed to each other, there is a greater contrariety in the extremes to each other than to the medium for these are more remote from each other than from the medium, just as the great is more remote from the small, and the small from the great, than both of them from the equal. 
Farther still, in some extremes there appears to be a certain similitude to the medium, as in audacity to fortitude, and in prodigality to liberality, but in the extremes there is the greatest dissimilitude to each other. Things, however, which are very distant from each other are defined to be contraries, so that those things which are more distant are more contrary to each other. But to the medium, in some things indeed, the deficiency is more opposed, and in others the excess. Thus, to fortitude, audacity, indeed, which is an excess, is not opposed, but timidity, which is a defect. And to temperance, the want of sensibility, which is an indigence, is not opposed, but intemperate, which is an excess. This, however, happens from two causes, one indeed from the thing itself. For one of the extremes being near to, and more similar to the medium than the other, hence not this, but the contrary is more opposed to it. Thus, for instance, since audacity appears to be more similar and nearer to fortitude, but timidity appears to be more dissimilar, on this account we oppose the latter to fortitude, rather than the former. For things which are more distant from the medium appear to be more contrary. This, therefore, is one cause from the thing itself, but another cause is from ourselves. For those vices, to which we are naturally more adapted, appear to be more contrary to the medium. Thus, because we are naturally more adapted to pleasures, we are more easily impelled to intemperance than to moderation in the pursuit of pleasure. Those things, therefore, are said to be in a greater degree contraries to which a greater accession is made. And on this account, intemperance, which is an excess, is more contrary to temperance than the other extreme. Chapter 9 That ethical virtue, therefore, is a medium, and how it is so, and that it is a medium between two vices, the one existing according to excess, but the other according to defect, and that it is such in consequence of looking to the medium in passions and actions as to a mark has been sufficiently shown. Hence, also, it is laborious to be worthy, for in everything it is laborious to obtain the middle. Thus, the middle of a circle cannot be discovered by everyone, but by him who is skilled in geometry. In like manner, to be angry, and to give and spend money, is in the power of everyone, and is easy. But to be angry, and to give and spend money to whom, and as much, and when, and on what account, and as it is proper, cannot be accomplished by every one, nor is it easy, for this is to act rightly, and is rare, and laudable, and beautiful. Hence it is necessary that he whose attention is directed to the medium as to a mark should first recede from that which is more contrary, as Calypso also admonishes. Far from the smoke and waves direct the helm. For of the extremes, the one indeed is more erroneous, but the other less. Since, therefore, it is difficult to obtain the medium accurately by making a second navigation, as they say, the least of the evils must be assumed, but this will especially be effected in the way we have mentioned. It is likewise requisite to consider what the vices are to which we are most propense. For different men are naturally prone to different vices, but this will be known from the pleasure and pain with which we are affected. We ought, however, to draw ourselves to the contrary part, for by removing ourselves very far from air, we shall arrive at the medium, which those do who straighten distorted pieces of wood. But in everything we should especially avoid the delectable and pleasure, for we are not uncorrupted judges of it. In the same manner, therefore, as the Trojan nobles were affected towards Helen, we ought to be affected towards pleasure, and in everything where pleasure is concerned, to employ their decision, for thus, by dismissing it, we shall err in a less degree. By thus acting, therefore, in short, we shall be especially able to obtain the medium. Perhaps, however, this is difficult, and principally in particulars, for it is not easy to determine how, and with whom, and on what account, and for how long a time, it is requisite to be angry. For we, indeed, sometimes praise those who are defective in anger, and call them mild, but at other times we praise those who are exasperated, and call them virile. He, however, who deviates but a little from rectitude, whether he inclines in the more or the less, is not blamed. But he who deviates much from it, for the error of such a one is not latent. 
it cannot however be easily determined to what extent and how much he is blamable as neither is this easy in any other sensible thing but things of this kind rank among particulars and the judgment of them pertains to sense thus much therefore is indeed manifest that the middle habit is in all things laudable and that it is necessary at one time to incline to excess and at another to deficiency for thus we shall easily obtain the medium and rectitude of conduct end of book two recording in memory of mitchell edwards Book three of the Nicomachean Ethics. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Geoffrey Edwards. The Nicomachean Ethics by Aristotle. Translated by Thomas Taylor. Book three. Chapter one since therefore virtue is conversant with passions and actions and praise and blame accompany things of a voluntary nature but pardon and sometimes pity such as are involuntary it is perhaps necessary that those who speculate concerning virtue should define the voluntary and involuntary this will also be useful to legislators in conferring rewards and inflicting punishments but those actions appear to be involuntary which are done by force or through ignorance and the violent is that the principle of which is external being of such a nature that it contributes nothing to the advantage of him who acts or of him who suffers as if for instance the wind or men who are the masters of some one should bring him to a certain place with respect to such things however as are performed through the fear of greater evils or for the sake of something beautiful in conduct as if a tyrant who is the lord of parents and children should command one to do a certain base action and on these conditions that if he did it his parents and children should be saved but if he did not they should die with respect to such things as these it is dubious whether they are voluntary or involuntary something of the like kind also happens in losses at sea when in a tempest the goods of the ship are thrown overboard for simply considered no one throws them into the sea willingly but every one who is endued with intellect does so for his own safety and that of the rest of the crew such like actions therefore are mixed but they are more similar to voluntary actions for they are then eligible when they are performed but the end of the action is according to opportunity a thing therefore must be said to be done voluntarily or involuntarily then when it is done but he threw his goods into the sea voluntarily for the principle of moving the organic parts in such like actions is in the man himself but those things of which the principle is in himself he has the power to perform or not such things therefore are voluntary simply considered however they are perhaps involuntary for no one would choose any one of these on its own account but in such like actions men are sometimes praised when they endure something disgraceful or painful for the sake of great and beautiful circumstances and if they do otherwise they are blamed for to endure the most disgraceful things with a view to nothing beautiful or moderate is the part of a bad man to other things however no praise is given but pardon is granted to them when a man does what he ought not to do in consequence of being compelled by such things as surpass human nature and which no one can endure and perhaps there are some things which we ought never to do by any compulsion but we ought to suffer the most dreadful evils and die rather than do them for those circumstances appear to be ridiculous which compelled the alcmaeon of euripides to kill his mother it is however sometimes difficult to judge what is to be chosen in preference to something else and whether this is to be endured instead of that and it is still more difficult to persevere in our decisions since for the most part things which are expected are attended with molestation and things which we are compelled to do are base 
Hence, both praise and blame are given to those that act from compulsion, and to those who do not. What kind of things, therefore, are to be called violent? Shall we say that they are then These are of themselves indeed involuntary, but now, and instead of certain other things, are voluntary. They are, however, more similar to voluntary actions, for actions are conversant with particulars, and these are voluntarily performed. It is not, however, easy to show what things are to be chosen in preference to others, for there are many differences in particulars. But if it should be said that things delectable and beautiful are violent, for they compel us to act, being external, if this should be said, all things will thus be violent, for all men do everything for the sake of these, and those indeed who act from violence and unwillingly act painfully, but those who are influenced by the delectable act with pleasure. It is therefore ridiculous for a man to accuse external things, and not himself, when he is easily captivated by things of this kind and to consider himself as the cause of beautiful actions but delectable things as the causes of his base actions hence the violent appears to be that the principle of which is external and to which the thing compelled contributes nothing everything however which is done from ignorance is not voluntary but that is involuntary which is attended with pain and repentance for he who does anything from ignorance, and is not at all indignant with the action, does not indeed perform it willingly, because he acts from ignorance. Nor yet again does he perform it unwillingly, in consequence of feeling no pain from the action. Of those, therefore, who act from ignorance, he who repents of what he has done appears to have acted unwillingly, but he who does not repent, since he is a different character from the other, may be said to have acted not willingly for since he is a different character it is better that he should have a proper name to act from ignorance likewise appears to be a different thing from acting ignorantly for he who is intoxicated or enraged does not appear to act from ignorance but from some one of the above-mentioned circumstances yet not knowingly but ignorantly every depraved man therefore is ignorant what ought to be done and from what actions he should abstain and from error of this kind men become unjust and in short bad but an action ought to be called involuntary not if he who does it is ignorant of what is advantageous for ignorance in the deliberate choice of a thing is not the cause of involuntary conduct but of depravity nor is the ignorance of universal the cause of it for men are blamed on this account but it arises from the ignorance of particulars in which and about which every action is conversant for in these there is pity and pardon since he who is ignorant of any one of these acts involuntarily perhaps however it will not be amiss to define what and how many the particular circumstances are which render an action involuntary they are therefore the circumstance of the principal agent the circumstance of the instrumental agent the circumstance of the end and the circumstances of the action itself no one therefore will be ignorant of all these unless he is insane but it is evident that neither will he who acts be ignorant of them for how can he be ignorant of himself a man however may be ignorant of what he does as is the case with those who say that they have spoken unawares or that they did not know what they said was arcane as aeschylus with respect to the mysteries or as when someone throws a catapulta not knowing what he throws a person also may fancy like merope that a son is an enemy and that a spear which has a sharp point is blunt like a ball or that a stone is a pumice a man likewise striking another with a view to his safety may kill him and wishing to show the mode of exercise in wrestling he may strike him whom he wished to instruct as there is ignorance therefore in all these particulars in which there is action he who is ignorant of some one of them appears to have acted involuntarily and especially in those things which are of principal importance but those appear to be of principal importance in which there is action and that for the sake of which action is undertaken 
since the involuntary therefore is denominated from an ignorance of this kind it is besides this necessary that the action should be painful and attended with repentance but as the involuntary is that which is done from violence and through ignorance the voluntary will appear to be that of which the principle is in the agent who knows the particulars in which the action consists for perhaps it is not well said that actions which are produced through anger or desire are involuntary for in the first place indeed if this were admitted no other animal would act voluntarily nor would children and in the next place whether are any of the actions which we perform through the influence of desire or anger done by us voluntarily or shall we say that worthy actions are performed by us voluntarily but base actions involuntarily or would not this be ridiculous since there is one cause of both of these perhaps too it is absurd to call those things involuntary after which it is requisite to aspire but it is necessary to be angry with certain things and to desire others such as health and discipline it appears however that things involuntary are painful but that those which are the objects of desire are delectable again what difference is there between the errors which are caused by reason or by anger with respect to their being involuntary for both are to be avoided the irrational passions also do not appear to be less human but the actions of man proceed both from anger and desire it would be absurd therefore to consider these as involuntary chapter two having therefore defined the voluntary and involuntary it follows that we should discuss pre-election or deliberate choice for deliberate choice appears to be most aligned to virtue and by this as a rule a judgment may be formed of manners more than by actions deliberate choice therefore appears indeed to be a voluntary thing yet it is not the same with what is voluntary but the voluntary is more extended for of the voluntary children and other animals partake but they do not partake of deliberate choice and we say indeed the things which we do suddenly are done voluntarily but not according to deliberate choice but those who call it desire or anger or will or a certain opinion do not appear to speak rightly for deliberate choice is not common to us and irrational animals but desire and anger are and the incontinent man indeed acts from the influence of desire but not from deliberate choice on the contrary the continent man acts from deliberate choice and not from the impulse of desire and desire indeed is contrary to deliberate choice but desire is not contrary to desire desire likewise is conversant both with that which is delectable and that which is painful but deliberate choice is neither conversant with the painful nor the delectable much less is deliberate choice anger for in the smallest degree do things which are affected through anger appear to be affected by deliberate choice nor yet is it will the will appears to be near to it for deliberate choice indeed is not among the number of things impossible and if any one should say that he deliberately chooses impossibilities he would appear to be stupid the will however is directed to things which are impossible as for instance to immortality and the will indeed is also conversant with things which can by no means be accomplished by him who wills as that a certain player or person engaged in athletic contests may be victorious no one however deliberately chooses things of this kind but only such as he thinks can be effected through himself farther still the will indeed is more directed to the end but deliberate choice to things pertaining to the end thus we wish to be well but we deliberately choose those things through which we become well and we wish indeed to be happy and we say that this is our wish but it is not fit to say that we deliberately choose to be happy for in short deliberate choice appears to be conversant with the things that are in our power neither therefore will deliberate choice be opinion for opinion indeed appears to be conversant with all things and no less with things eternal and impossible than with things in our power opinion likewise is divided into the false and the true and not into good and evil but deliberate choice is rather divided into the latter than into the former 
In short, therefore, perhaps no one will say that deliberate choice is either the same with opinion in general or with some particular opinion. For by deliberately choosing good or evil, we become affected with a certain quality, but this does not happen to us through forming an opinion. And we deliberately choose indeed to obtain or avoid or to do something of the like kind, but we form an opinion of what it is or to what it is advantageous or in what manner and we do not very much opine to obtain or avoid it and deliberate choice indeed is praised because it pertains to that of which it is necessary to partake more abundantly or with rectitude but opinion is praised for its truth we likewise deliberately choose those things which we especially know to be good but we form an opinion of things which are not very much known to us and the same persons do not appear to deliberately choose and opine the most excellent things but some indeed opine that which is better but from vice choose those things which ought not to be the objects of choice it is however of no consequence whether opinion precedes or follows deliberate choice for our attention is not directed to this but to the consideration whether deliberate choice is the same with a certain opinion what then or what kind of a thing is deliberate choice since it is no one of the above mentioned particulars it appears therefore to be a voluntary thing not everything however which is voluntary is the object of deliberate choice but that which has been the subject of previous deliberation for deliberate choice is accompanied with reason and the discursive energy of reason and this the name appears to signify the object of deliberate choice being that which is eligible in preference to other things chapter three but whether do men but which is an object of consultation to a man endued with intellect concerning eternal things however no one consults such as concerning the world or the diagonal and side of a square because they are incommensurable nor does any one consult about things which are in motion but which are always passing into existence after the same manner whether from necessity or naturally or from some other cause such as conversions and risings nor does any one consult about things which subsist differently at different times such as about drought and rain nor about fortuitous events such as the discovery of a treasure nor yet about all human concerns for no lacedaemonian consults how the polity of the scythians may be governed in the best manner since none of these things can be effected by us but we consult about things which can be performed by us and these are the rest of things which we have not mentioned for nature necessity and fortune appear to be causes and besides these intellect and everything which energizes through man the individuals however of the human species consult about things which may be performed by them and indeed in those sciences which are accurate and sufficient to themselves there is no consultation as for instance there is no consultation about letters for there is no contention how we should write but such things as are affected by us yet not always after the same manner about these we consult as about things pertaining to medicine and the art of procuring money and about the art of the pilot more than about the gymnastic art because the former is much less accurate than the latter in a similar manner also we consult about the rest but we consult more in the arts than in the sciences for we dissent more about them consultation however takes place in things which have a frequency of subsistence but of which the event is immanifest and in things in which there is the indefinite in things also which are of great importance we employ counsellors distrusting our own judgment as not sufficient we consult however not about ends but about things pertaining to ends for neither does a physician consult whether he shall heal the sick nor a rhetorician whether he shall persuade nor the politician whether he shall establish equitable legislation nor does any one of the remaining characters consult about the end but proposing a certain end they consider how and by what means it may be obtained 
if also it appears that this end is to be obtained through many media they consider through which of them it may be obtained in the easiest and best manner but if through one medium they consider how it may be accomplished through this and through what likewise this may be obtained until they arrive at the first cause which is discovered in the last place for he who consults appears to investigate and analyze in the above-mentioned manner as if he were investigating and analyzing a diagram it appears however that not every investigation is a consultation for mathematical inquiries are not consultations but every consultation is an investigation and that which is last in analysis is first in generation and if indeed in consulting we meet with an impossibility we desist from consultation as if there should be occasion for money and this cannot be procured but if that about which we consult appears to be possible then we endeavour to obtain it those things however are possible which may be accomplished through ourselves for things which are accomplished through our friends are in a certain respect effected through ourselves since the principle is in us but at one time instruments are explored and at another time the use of them and in a similar manner in other things at one time indeed that being investigated through which the end may be obtained and at another time the manner man therefore as we have said appears to be the principle of actions but consultation is about things which may be performed by man and actions are for the sake of other things hence the end will not be the object of consultation but things which pertain to ends neither therefore will particulars be the objects of consultation as whether this thing is bred or is well baked or is made as it ought to be for these things pertain to sense but if a man always consults there will be a procession to infinity the object of consultation however and the pre-eligible or object of deliberate choice are the same except that the object of pre-election or deliberate choice is something which is now definite for the pre-eligible is that which is preferred from consultation for every one ceases to investigate how he shall act when he has reduced the principle to himself and to that part of himself which ranks as the leader since this part is that which he deliberately chooses but this also is evident from the ancient polities which homer has imitated for the kings of these polities announced to the people what they had deliberately chosen to do since however that which is pre-eligible is an object of consultation appetible of things which are in our power pre-election also or deliberate choice will be an appetite of or tendency to things in our power accompanied with consultation for forming a judgment in consequence of having consulted we desire conformably to consultation we have therefore adumbrated what pre-election is and what the things are with which it is conversant and have shown that it belongs to things which have reference to ends chapter four that will however pertains to the end we have shown but this end to some persons appears to be the good and to others apparent good but it happens to those who say that the object of the will is the good that what he wills who does not choose rightly is not an object of will for if it were an object of will it would also be good it may however happen to be bad and it happens to those who say that the object of the will is apparent good that the object of the will has not a natural subsistence but is what appears to any one to be eligible a different thing however appears to be eligible to a different person and if it should so happen contraries appear to be eligible if therefore these things are not approved we must say that simply and in reality the good is indeed the object of the will but that apparent good is the object of the will to every one to the worthy man therefore real good is the object of the will but to the bad man casual good just as in bodies to such as are well disposed those things are salubrious which are in reality so but other things to such as are diseased and the like takes place in things that are bitter sweet hot heavy and each of the rest for the worthy man judges of every thing rightly and in every thing the truth presents itself to his view for according to every habit there are things beautiful and delectable 
which are peculiar to that habit and perhaps the worthy man very much excels others in this that he sees the truth in everything being as it were the rule and measure of things but with the multitude deception is present on account of pleasure for pleasure though not good appears to be so the multitude therefore choose the delectable as good but fly from pain as an evil chapter five since the end therefore is the object of the will but things pertaining to the end are the objects of consultation and deliberate choice the actions which are conversant with these will be actions of deliberate choice and voluntary but with these the energies of the virtues are conversant virtue therefore also is in our power and in a similar manner vice for in those things in which to act is in our power not to act is also in our power and in those things in which we have the power not to act we have likewise the power to act hence if to act worthily is in our power not to act basely will likewise be in our power and if we have the power of not acting worthily we have also the power of acting basely but if to act and in a similar manner not to act worthily and basely are in our power and this is to be good or bad it will be in our power to be worthy or depraved characters and to say with a certain tragic poet that quote, no one is willingly depraved nor unwillingly blessed close quote. seems to be partly false and partly true for no one is unwillingly blessed but depravity is voluntary or unless this is admitted what we have just now asserted must be controverted and it must not be said that man is the principal and generator of actions in the same manner as he is of children but if these things are admitted and we cannot refer them to any other principles than those which are in our power it follows that those things are in our power and are voluntary of which also the principles are in our power the truth of this appears to be attested both privately by individuals and publicly by legislators themselves for they castigate and punish those who act depravely if they do not act from compulsion or from ignorance of which they were not the causes but they honour those who act well in order that they may excite these and impede those no one however exhorts others to the performance of such actions as are neither in our power nor are voluntary because no advantage can be derived from persuading us not to be hot or be in pain or be hungry or anything else of the like kind for notwithstanding the persuasion we shall no less suffer these things for legislators also punish a man for his ignorance if he appears to be the cause of his ignorance thus double punishments are ordained for those that are intoxicated for the principle is in themselves because they have the power of not becoming intoxicated and this i e intoxication is the cause of their ignorance they likewise punish those who are ignorant of anything which is legally established which ought to be known and which it is not difficult to know and in a similar manner in other things which men appear to be ignorant of from negligence and of which it is in their power not to be ignorant for it is in our power to pay attention to what ought to be known perhaps however it may be said that a man is a person of such a character that he cannot pay attention but such persons are themselves the causes of their characteristic qualities in consequence of living negligently the causes likewise of men being unjust or intemperate are in themselves in consequence of the former acting wickedly and of the latter spending their time in drinking and things of the like kind for energies in everything render those who employ them similar to such energies this however is evident from those who exercise themselves in any contest or action for they persevere in energizing to be ignorant therefore that in everything from energizing about the thing habits are produced is the province of a very insensate man again it is absurd to suppose that he who acts unjustly is unwilling to be unjust or that he who acts intemperately is unwilling to be intemperate 
but if any one does those things from which he will be unjust not ignorantly he will be unjust willingly nevertheless though he should wish he will not cease to be unjust and become just for neither does he who is diseased become well by wishing to be so even though it should happen that he is voluntarily diseased by living intemperately and disobeying his physicians prior therefore to his living intemperately it was in his power not to be diseased but after having abandoned himself to intemperance it was no longer possible as neither is it possible for him who has thrown a stone to resume it at the same time it was in his power to emit from his hand and hurl the stone for he contained the principle of action in himself thus also to the unjust and intemperate man it was possible from the beginning not to be unjust and intemperate on which account they are voluntarily so but when they are become such characters it is no longer possible for them not to be so not only however the vices of the soul are voluntary but in some persons also the vices of the body which likewise we reprehended for no one reprehends those who are naturally deformed but we blame those who are so through the want of exercise and from negligence the like also takes place in imbecility and mutilation for no one would reproach a man who is blind from nature or disease or a blow but would rather pity him but every one would reprove him who is blind from drinking wine to excess or from any other species of intemperance of the vices therefore pertaining to the body those indeed that are in our power are blamed but those which are not are not reprehended but if this be the case in other things also the vices which are reprehended will be in our power if however some one should say that all men aspire after apparent good but that we have no authority over the phantasy and that such as every one is such also does the end appear to him to be if indeed every one is to himself in a certain respect the cause of habit he will also be in a certain respect the cause to himself of the phantasy i e of the conception which he forms of a thing in his imagination but if no one is the cause to himself of bad conduct but he acts evilly from an ignorance of the end fancying that by so acting he shall obtain the greatest good and if the desire of the end is not spontaneous but it is requisite that every one should be born endued as it were with sight by which he may judge rightly and may choose real good and if also he is naturally of a good disposition in whom this is well implanted by nature for that which is greatest and most beautiful and which can neither be obtained nor learnt from another person but which such as a man is naturally such he possesses and to be naturally inclined to this well and beautifully will be a perfect and true natural goodness of disposition if these things are true why will virtue more than vice be voluntary for the end appears and is similarly posited both to the good and the bad man either by nature or in some other way but referring other things to this they act in any manner whatever whether therefore the end whatever it may be is not apparent to every one from nature but there is also something with him who acts or whether the end is natural yet because a worthy man performs other things voluntarily and therefore virtue is voluntary vice also will be no less voluntary for in a bad as well as in a good man there is similarly a power of acting from himself in what he does though the intention of the end is not in our power if therefore as we have said the virtues are voluntary for we ourselves in a certain respect are the concauses of habits and in consequence of being disposed in a certain way we propose to ourselves a certain end if this be the case the vices also will be voluntary for a similar reason we have therefore spoken in common concerning the virtues have adumbrated the genus of them and have shown that they are media and habits we have likewise unfolded what the things are from which they are produced and have shown that they are caused by energies and are the principles of energies similar to those by which they are generated that they are likewise in our power and are voluntary things and this in such a way as right reason shall ordain actions however and habits are not similarly voluntary 
for of actions we are the lords from the beginning to the end since we have a knowledge of particulars but of habits we are only lords of the principle the accession however of particulars is not known as it is in diseases but because it is in our power thus to use or not to use particulars on this account our habits are voluntary resuming therefore the discussion of each of the virtues let us show what they are what the quality of the things is with which they are conversant and how they subsist but at the same time it will be manifest how many there are and in the first place let us consider fortitude chapter six that fortitude therefore is indeed a medium which is conversant with fear and audacity has been already observed by us but we evidently fear things of a terrible nature and these are in short evils hence also fear is defined to be the expectation of evil we fear therefore all things that are evil such as infamy poverty disease the want of friends and death the brave man however does not appear to be conversant with all evils for it is necessary and beautiful to be afraid of some things and not to be afraid of them is base as for instance not to be afraid of infamy for he who is afraid of this is a worthy and modest man but he who is not afraid of it is impudent he is however metaphorically called by some a brave man for he has something similar to the brave man since the brave man also is fearless but perhaps it is not proper to fear poverty or disease or in short such things as neither proceed from vice nor from ourselves yet neither is he who is fearless with respect to these a brave man we denominate him however brave from similitude for some men who in the dangers of war are timid are liberal and possess a proper confidence in the loss of money neither therefore is he timid who dreads insolent conduct towards his children and wife or envy or anything of the like kind nor is he a brave man if he is confident when he is about to be whipped with what kind of but neither does the brave man appear to be conversant with every kind of death as for instance death in the sea or from disease with what kinds of death therefore is he conversant shall we not say with those that are most beautiful but these are the deaths which happen in war for such a death is attended with the greatest and most beautiful danger and the truth of this is confirmed by the honours which cities and monarchs confer on those who conduct themselves bravely in war he therefore may properly be called a brave man who is intrepid with respect to a beautiful death and such things as are the causes of death when they are near but things of this kind are especially such as happen in war nevertheless in the sea and in diseases the brave man is intrepid yet not in the same manner as sailors are for brave men when they despair of their safety indignantly bear a death of this kind but sailors have good hope of escaping from their experience at the same time brave men act with fortitude in those things in which strength of mind is requisite or it is beautiful to die but neither of these exists in such like destructions as we have mentioned chapter seven the same thing however is not terrible to all men but we say that there is also something which is above man this therefore is indeed terrible to every one endued with intellect but the terrible things which do not exceed the endurance of human nature differ in magnitude and in the more and the less and the like takes place in things pertaining to confidence the brave man however is unterrified as a man he will therefore indeed dread things of this kind yet in such a manner as is proper and as reason prescribes for the sake of the beautiful in conduct for this is the end of virtue but it is possible to be terrified at these in a greater and less degree and it is also possible to dread things which are not dreadful as if they were so of the errors however in the endurance of things terrible one consists in dreading what it is not proper to dread 
another in dreading not as is proper but another in not dreading when it is proper or something of this kind and in a similar manner in what pertains to confidence he therefore who endures and fears things which it is requisite to endure and fear and for the sake of that for which it is requisite and in such a way as and when it is requisite and in a similar manner he who thus confides is a brave man for the brave man suffers and acts according to the importance of the thing and conformably to reason but the end of every energy is the end according to habit i e the beautiful in conduct and to the brave man fortitude is beautiful the end also is a thing of this kind for everything is defined by the end for the sake of the beautiful in conduct therefore the brave man endures and performs all that pertains to fortitude of the characters however which exceed he indeed who exceeds in fearlessness is anonymous but it has been before observed by us that many things are anonymous he however who fears nothing neither earthquakes nor inundations as it is said of the celtae will be an insane person or one who has no sense of pain but he who exceeds in confidence respecting things of a terrible nature will be audacious the audacious man also appears to be arrogant and a pretender to fortitude such therefore as the brave man is with respect to things of a terrible nature such does the audacious man wish to appear and hence in those things in which he is able he imitates him on this account also many audacious persons have timidity united with audacity for in consequence of their audacity when danger is not imminent they do not endure things of a dreadful nature when they occur but he who exceeds in fearing is timid for he fears what he ought not and in such a manner as he ought not to fear and all such things are consequent to him but he is deficient in confiding as he exceeds however in pains he is more apparent the timid man therefore is hopeless for he fears all things but the brave man is the contrary for confidence is the province of the man who hopes for the best the timid the audacious and the brave man therefore are conversant with the same things but they are differently affected towards them for the timid and the audacious man exceed and are deficient but the brave man is disposed towards things dreadful in the middle way and in such a manner as is proper and audacious men indeed are precipitate and wish to encounter dangers before they arrive but when they arrive they are deficient in fortitude brave men however are ardent in encountering danger and before it arrives they are quiet as we have said therefore fortitude is a medium conversant with those things of a dreadful nature and such as pertain to confidence which we have mentioned and it chooses and endures them because it is beautiful to do so or not to do so is base but to die in order to avoid poverty or on account of love or something painful is not the province of a brave but rather of a timid man for it is effeminate to fly from things laborious and such do not endure death because it is beautiful to endure it but in order to fly from evil fortitude therefore is a certain thing of this kind chapter eight other kinds of fortitude also are denominated according to four modes and in the first place indeed political fortitude since this most resembles fortitude truly so called for citizens appear to endure dangers on account of the punishments and disgrace inflicted by the laws and also on account of the honours they confer hence the most brave men appear to be found among those with whom the timid are disgraced and the brave are honoured homer likewise introduces such persons as for instance diomede and hector Quote, shall proud polydamus before the gate proclaim his counsels are obeyed too late which timely followed but the former night what numbers had been saved by hector's flight Close quote and diomede quote, but ah what grief should haughty hector boast i fled inglorious to the guarded coast Close quote. this species of fortitude however is especially similar to the before mentioned because it is produced from virtue for it is generated through shame and a desire of the beautiful in conduct for it is through a desire of honour and a flight from disgrace which is dishonourable 
those also may be ranked among brave men who are compelled to be brave by their rulers but they are inferior to the former i e the politically brave because their conduct is not produced through shame but through fear and is not the consequence of flying from what is base but from what is painful for they are compelled by their masters thus hector quote, on rushed bold hector gloomy as the night forbids to plunder animates the fight points to the fleet for by the gods who flies who dares but linger by this hand he dies no weeping sister his cold eye shall close no friendly hand his funeral pile compose who stops to plunder at this signal hour the birds shall tear him and the dogs devour Close quote. and the generals scourge the soldiers if they desert their ranks the same thing also is done by those who dispose their troops before fosses and adopt other methods of the like kind for all these employ force it is necessary however not to be brave from necessity but because it is beautiful to be so but experience about particulars appears to be a certain fortitude whence also socrates thought that fortitude was a science and indeed there are other such persons in other things but soldiers are such in warlike affairs for it seems that there are many vain terrors in war of which soldiers are especially aware soldiers therefore appear to be brave because other persons do not understand the nature of these alarms in the next place they are especially able from their experience to attack their enemies without receiving any injury themselves they also know how to guard against and strike their enemies in consequence of being able to use their arms and having armor of such a kind as is most excellent for the purpose of attacking without being injured by their adversaries they fight therefore like armed with unarmed men and like athletes with those that are unskilled in athletic exercises for in such like contests not the most brave are the most adapted to fight but those who are most strong and those whose bodies are in the most excellent condition but soldiers become timid when the danger is excessive and they are deficient in numbers and warlike apparatus for the merely skilful are the first that fly but those who act bravely according to political circumstances die remaining at their post as it happened at the hermaeus since to citizens flight is base and death is more eligible than such a preservation but the soldiers in this battle at hermaeus encountered the danger at first as thinking themselves superior to their enemies but when they saw the full extent of the danger they fled dreading death more than disgrace the brave man however is not a person of this description anger also is referred to fortitude for men likewise appear to be brave on account of anger just as wild beasts rush on those that wound them because brave men also are irascible whence homer says quote, strength be to anger added and his ardour and his wrath he roused and pungent fury from his nostrils flowed and his blood boiled Close quote. for everything of this kind appears to signify the energy and impulse of anger brave men therefore act on account of the beautiful in conduct but anger cooperates with them and savage animals act through the influence of pain for they act because they are wounded or terrified since if they are in a wood or in a marsh they do not attack any one hence those persons are not brave who are impelled to danger by pain and anger foreseeing nothing that is dreadful since thus asses also would be brave when they are hungry for they cannot even by blows be driven from their pasture adulterers likewise perform many audacious deeds through their lustful desire those therefore are not brave or impelled to danger through pain or anger the fortitude however appears to be most natural which subsists on account of anger and which assumes deliberate choice and that for the sake of which a thing is done or the final cause men also when they are angry are pained but are delighted when they take vengeance on the authors of their anger 
those however who act under the influence of these causes are indeed pugnacious but not brave for they do not act with a view to the beautiful in conduct nor from the dictates of reason but from the influence of passion but they possess something similar to fortitude nor yet are those who are full of good hope brave for in consequence of having frequently conquered and conquered many they are confident in dangers but they are similar to brave men because both these characters are confident brave men however are indeed confident for the reasons we have already assigned but these because they fancy they are superior to others and that they shall suffer no evil from their opponents those also that are intoxicated act after this manner for they become full of good hope but when they are frustrated of their expectations they fly from danger it is however the province of a brave man to endure things which are and appear to be dreadful to men because it is beautiful to do so and base not to endure them hence also it appears to be the part of a more brave man to be fearless and without perturbation in sudden terrors rather than in such as were foreseen for this rather proceeds from habit and in a less degree from preparation for things indeed which were foreseen may be chosen from deliberation and reason but in things which suddenly happen a man can only conduct himself fearlessly from the habit of fortitude those persons likewise appear to be brave who are ignorant of danger and they are not very remote from those who are full of good hope they are however inferior to them because they have no preconceived opinion of vanquishing the evil but the former have hence the fortitude of those who are full of good hope continues for a certain time but the fortitude of those who are ignorant of danger ceases as soon as the deception is apparent as was the case with the argives when they met with the lacedaemonians and thought them to be Sicyonians. and thus we have shown what kind of men the brave are and those who appear to be brave chapter nine since however fortitude is conversant with confidence and fear yet it is not similarly conversant with both but in a greater degree with things of a terrible nature for he who is without perturbation in these and who conducts himself in them as he ought is more brave than he who does so in things pertaining to confidence brave men therefore as we have before observed are called brave from enduring things of a painful nature hence also fortitude is unaccompanied with pain and is justly praised for it is more difficult to endure pain than to abstain from pleasure nevertheless the end according to fortitude may appear to be pleasant but to be obscured and obliterated by surrounding circumstances just as it happens in gymnastic contests for to pugilists indeed the end for the sake of which they contend is pleasing viz a crown and honours but to be beat since this pertains to the flesh is painful as is likewise every labour because however the circumstances which produce pain are many and that for the sake of which they contend is small it appears to possess nothing delectable if therefore a thing of this kind also pertains to fortitude death indeed and wounds will be painful to a brave man and to one who is unwilling to endure them the brave man however endures them because it is beautiful so to do or because it is base not to endure them and by how much the more he possesses every virtue and is more happy by so much the more will he be pained by death for such a man most eminently deserves to live and he is knowingly deprived by death of the greatest goods but this is painful he is however no less brave and perhaps he is more brave because he chooses that conduct in battle which is beautiful in preference to these goods to energize therefore delectably does not pertain to all the virtues except so far as they come into contact with the end but perhaps nothing prevents not only those from being most excellent soldiers who are most brave but also those who are less brave and possess no other good for these are prepared for danger and to lose their life for small gain and thus much concerning fortitude and it is not difficult from what has been said to adumbrate what it is chapter ten 
in the next place let us speak concerning temperance for these i e fortitude and temperance appear to be the virtues of the irrational parts the temperance therefore is a medium conversant with pleasures has been already observed by us for it is conversant in a less degree and not similarly with pains but about pleasures and pains intemperance also is employed what the pleasures therefore are with which temperance is conversant we must now explain let pleasures however be divided into those pertaining to the soul and those pertaining to the body thus for instance the pleasures pertaining to the soul are ambition and the love of learning for each of these is delighted with that which is the object of its desire the body not being at all affected but rather the rational part and those who are conversant with such like pleasures are neither denominated temperate nor intemperate thus too with respect to such other pleasures as are not corporeal for we call those who are lovers of fables and narrations and who consume the day in such casual circumstances as present themselves triflers but not intemperate nor do we call those intemperate who are pained by the loss of riches or friends temperance however will be conversant with corporeal pleasures yet neither will it be conversant with all such pleasures for those persons are not called either temperate or intemperate who are delighted with objects of sight such as colours and figures and pictures though it would seem that there is also a proper manner of being delighted with these and that it is possible to be pleased with them according to excess and defect thus too in things pertaining to the hearing for no one calls those intemperate who are excessively delighted with melodies or players nor are those temperate who are delighted with them in a proper manner nor are those denominated temperate or intemperate who are delighted with odours except from accident for we do not call those persons intemperate who are delighted with the smell of apples or roses or odoriferous fumigations but we rather denominate those persons so who are delighted with the smell of ointments and food for intemperate persons are pleased with these because through these the recollection of the objects of their desires is produced others also may be seen who when they are hungry are delighted with the smell of food but to be delighted with things of this kind is the province of an intemperate man for to such a one these things are objects of desire nor do other animals receive pleasure from these senses except by accidents for neither are dogs delighted with the smell but with the eating of hares the smell producing the sense i e causing them to perceive food present nor is the lion delighted with the voice of the ox but with eating him but he perceives through the voice of the ox that he is near and is seen to be delighted with this perception in like manner neither is the lion delighted with seeing or finding a stag or a wild goat but he is pleased on seeing that from which he shall obtain food temperance and intemperance therefore are conversant with pleasures of this kind of which also irrational animals partake hence these pleasures appear to be servile and savage and they are the pleasures pertaining to the touch and the taste temperance and intemperance however appear to use the taste but in a small degree or not at all for the judgment of sapers is the province of the taste which those persons employ who make trial of wines and seasoned food the intemperate however are not very much delighted with these sapers but with the enjoyment of the food the whole of which is effected through the touch in meats and drinks and in what are called venereal concerns hence a certain person named philoxenus the son of eryx who was most voracious in eating wished that he had a neck longer than that of a crane as being one who was delighted with the touch the touch therefore with which intemperance is conversant is the most common of all the senses and will appear to be justly disgraceful because it exists in us not so far as we are men but so far as we are animals to be delighted therefore with and especially enamoured of such pleasures is beastly for the most liberal of the pleasures which are perceived through the touch are not to be numerated with these such for instance as the pleasures in gymnastic exercises produced through friction and heat since the touch of the intemperate man does not pertain to the whole body but to certain parts of it chapter eleven 
of desires however some appear to be common but others peculiar and advantageous thus for instance the desire of food is indeed natural for every one when in want desires either dry or moist nutriment and sometimes both and as homer says both the young man and he who is in the vigour of his age desire the joys of love but every one does not desire this or that food nor the same food hence this desire appears to be properly ours and it possesses also something natural for different things are pleasing to different persons and the same thing is more agreeable to some persons than to others few therefore err in natural desires and they err in these in one way viz in excess for to eat or drink what casually presents itself till an excessive fulness is produced is to surpass in multitude what is conformable to nature since natural desire is the replenishing of indigence hence such persons are called gluttons as replenishing the indigence of nature beyond what is becoming and those who are very servile become men of this description but in those pleasures which are peculiar or proper many persons err and in many ways for they are denominated lovers of things of this kind either from being delighted with things which are not proper or being pleased with them more than is proper as is the case with the multitude or not in such a way as is proper or not in that respect in which it is proper the intemperate however exceed in all things for they are delighted with some things with which it is not proper to be delighted since they are odious and if it is requisite to be delighted with some of such things they are delighted with them more than is proper and after the manner of the multitude that excess therefore in pleasures is intemperate and that it is blamable is evident in pains however a man is not said to be temperate by enduring them as in fortitude nor intemperate by not enduring them but he indeed is intemperate who is pained more than is requisite because he does not partake of pleasures so that the pleasure gives him pain in consequence of being desired by him above measure and he is said to be a temperate man who is not pained by the absence of pleasure and by abstaining from it the intemperate man therefore desires all pleasant things or those which are most eminently pleasant and is led by desire so as to choose what is most pleasant in preference to other things hence also he is pained both when he is frustrated of pleasure and when he desires it for desire is accompanied with pain though it seems to be absurd that a man should be pained on account of pleasure those however who are deficient in pleasures and are delighted with them less than is proper are not very frequent for an insensibility of this kind is not human since other animals also distinguish food and are delighted with some kinds of it and not with others but he to whom nothing is delectable and with whom one thing does not differ from another is very remote from human nature such a one also is without a name because he does not very frequently exist the temperate man however with respect to these things subsists in a middle condition for neither is he delighted with those things with which the intemperate man is especially delighted but he is rather indignant with them nor in short does he rejoice in things in which he ought not nor is he very much delighted with anything of this kind nor is he pained if it is absent nor does he desire it except moderately nor more than is proper nor at a time when he ought not nor in short anything of this kind but such things as being delectable contribute to health or to a good habit of body these he desires moderately and in such a way as is proper he also desires other delectable things which are not an impediment to these or which are not adverse to the beautiful in conduct or above his income for he who is thus affected loves such pleasures beyond their desert the temperate man however is not a person of this description but is one who acts conformably to right reason chapter twelve intemperance however appears to be more similar to the voluntary than timidity for the former subsists on account of pleasure but the latter on account of pain of which the one indeed is eligible but the other is to be avoided and pain indeed astounds and disturbs the nature of its possessor but pleasure produces nothing of this kind it is therefore more voluntary 
and on this account also it is more disgraceful for it is more easy to be accustomed to these things since there are many such in life and the being accustomed to them is unattended with danger but the contrary takes place in things of a dreadful nature timidity likewise may appear not to be similarly voluntary with particulars for timidity indeed is without pain but particulars so astound men through pain that they throw away their arms and act in other things indecorously and on this account they appear to be violent the contrary however takes place with the intemperate man for particulars with him are voluntary since he desires them and his appetite is directed to them but the whole of an intemperate life is less voluntary for no one desires to be intemperate we transfer also the name of intemperance to puerile errors for they possess a certain similitude but which of these is denominated from the other is of no consequence to the present discussion it is however evident that the latter is denominated from the former nor does the transition appear to be badly made for that which desires what is base is to be punished and which has an abundant increase but desires in a child are especially a thing of this kind for children live according to desire and in these the appetite of the delectable especially flourishes if therefore this appetite is not obedient and subject to the governor reason it increases abundantly for the appetite of the delectable is insatiable and in the stupid man is every way diffused and the energy of desire increases that which is allied to it so that if the desires are great and vehement they expel the reasoning power hence it is necessary that they should be moderate and few and in no respect adverse to reason but we call a thing of this kind obedient and reformed by correction for as it is necessary that a child should live conformably to the mandate of his preceptor thus also it is requisite that the part of the soul which energizes according to desire should live conformably to reason hence it is necessary that this part of the soul in the temperate man should accord with reason for the end proposed by both i e by a reason and desire in the temperate man is the beautiful in conduct and the temperate man desires those things which it is proper to desire and as and when it is proper but reason likewise thus ordains and thus much concerning temperance end of book three recording in memory of mitchell edwards book four of the nicomachean ethics this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by geoffrey edwards the nicomachean ethics by aristotle translated by thomas taylor book four chapter one in the next place let us speak concerning liberality but it appears to be a medium about riches for the liberal man is praised not in warlike concerns nor in those things in which the temperate man is praised nor again in judicial affairs but in the giving and receiving of riches and more in the giving than in the receiving we call however riches everything the worth of which is measured by money but prodigality and illiberality are excesses and defects about riches and we always indeed ascribe illiberality to those who pay more attention to riches than is proper but combining we sometimes attribute prodigality to the intemperate for we call both the incontinent and those who consume their property in intemperance prodigals hence men of this description appear to be most depraved for at one and the same time they have many vices they are not however appropriately denominated for he is a prodigal who has one certain vice viz the consumption of his property for he is a prodigal who is destroyed through himself since the consumption of his property appears to be a certain destruction of himself as through this the means of living are obtained 
In this way, therefore, we consider prodigality. With respect to those things, however, of which there is a certain use, it is possible to use them well or ill. But wealth is among the number of things useful, and he uses everything in the best manner who possesses the virtue pertaining to each thing. He, therefore, will use wealth in the best manner who has the virtue pertaining to riches, and he is the liberal man. The use, however, of riches appears to be expense and donation, but the accepting and preservation of riches is rather possession. Hence, it is more the province of a liberal man to give to those to whom it is proper, than to receive whence it is proper, and not to receive whence it is not proper. For it is more the province of virtue to benefit than to be benefited, and to perform things which are beautiful, than not to perform things which are base. It is not, however, immanifest that to giving, to benefit, and to act beautifully are consequent, but to receiving, to be benefited, or not to act basely. Thanks also are presented to the giver, but not to the receiver, and praise is rather bestowed on the former than the latter. It is, likewise, more easy not to receive than to give, for men are less willing to bestow what is their own than not to receive what belongs to another. Those also who bestow are called liberal, but those who do not receive are not praised for liberality, but are no less praised for justice. Those, however, who receive are not very much praised. But of all those who are loved on account of virtue, the liberal are nearly beloved the most, for they benefit others, and this consists in giving. The actions, however, according to virtue are beautiful, and are for the sake of the beautiful. The liberal man, therefore, gives for the sake of the beautiful, and gives rightly, for he gives to those to whom it is proper, and such things as are proper, and when it is proper, and whatever other particulars are consequent to giving rightly, and this he does either delectably or without pain. For that which is conformable to virtue is delectable, or without pain, but is in the smallest degree painful. But he who gives to those to whom it is not proper, or not for the sake of the beautiful, but from some other cause, is not liberal, but must be called by some other name. Nor is he liberal who gives with pain, for such a one would prefer riches to a beautiful action. But this is not the province of a liberal man. Nor does the liberal man receive from whence it is not proper to receive, for neither is such a kind of receiving the province of one who does not honor riches. Neither will the liberal man be readily disposed to ask a favor, for it is not the province of him who benefits to be benefited easily. But he will take whence it is proper, as, for instance, from his own possessions, not as a thing beautiful, but as necessary, in order that he may have the means of giving. Nor will he neglect his own affairs, because he wishes, through these, to supply the wants of certain persons. Nor will he give to any casual persons, in order that he may have to give to those to whom it is proper, and when it is proper, and where it is beautiful to give. It is, likewise, very much the province of a liberal man, so to exceed in giving, as to leave but little for himself. For it is the property of a liberal man not to consider himself, but liberality is denominated according to the property which is possessed. For the liberal does not consist in the multitude of gifts, but in the habit of the giver, and this habit gives according to the means of giving. Nothing, however, hinders but that he may be a more liberal man who gives fewer things, if he gives them from less means. But those persons appear to be more liberal who have not acquired property themselves, but have received it from others, for they have had no experience of want, and all men are more attached to their own works, as is evident in parents and poets. It is not, however, easy for the liberal man to be rich, since he is neither anxious to receive nor preserve wealth, but is more disposed to give, and does not honor riches on their own account, but for the sake of giving. Hence also fortune is accused, because those who most deserve to be are in the smallest degree wealthy. This, however, does not happen unreasonably, 
for it is not possible that he should be rich who pays no attention to the means of obtaining wealth as is also the case in other things nevertheless the liberal man will not give to those to whom he ought not nor when he ought not and other things of the like kind for if he did he would no longer act conformably to liberality and by thus consuming his wealth improperly he would not have the means of giving to those to whom he ought to give for as we have said he is a liberal man who spends according to his property and on things on which he ought to spend but he who exceeds his means in spending is a prodigal hence we do not call tyrants prodigals for it does not seem to be easy by gifts and expenses to exceed the abundance of their possessions since therefore liberality is a medium which is conversant about giving and receiving riches the liberal man will give and spend on things on which he ought and as much as he ought as well in small things as in great and he will thus act willingly and with pleasure he will likewise receive whence it is proper and such things as he ought to receive for since this virtue is a medium about giving and receiving he will do both these in such a way as is proper since a receiving of this kind is consequent to giving equitably but a receiving which is not of this kind is the contrary things therefore which are consequent may subsist together in the same thing but it is evident that contraries cannot but if it should happen to the liberal man that he should spend beyond what he ought and beyond what is becoming he will be pained yet moderately and in such a manner as is proper for it is the province of virtue to be pleased and pained with those things with which it is proper to be so and in such a way as is proper the liberal man also is very pliable in pecuniary contracts for he may be injured since he does not honour riches and he is more indignant if he has not spent what he ought than pained if he has spent what he ought not for he does not assent to simonides but the prodigal errs also in these things for he is neither pleased nor pained with things with which he ought nor as he ought but this will be more evident as we proceed it has however been observed by us that prodigality and illiberality are excesses and defects and in two things viz in giving and receiving for we place expense in the same class with giving prodigality therefore exceeds in giving and not receiving but it fails in receiving and illiberality fails indeed in giving but exceeds in receiving except in small things the peculiarities therefore of prodigality cannot be very much conjoined for it is not easy for him who receives nothing to give to every one since the property of those private individuals rapidly fails who also appear to be prodigals for a man of this description does seem to be better though not much than the illiberal man for he is easily cured by age and by want and may arrive at the medium for he has the properties of the liberal man since he gives and does not receive yet neither as he ought nor in a becoming manner if therefore he should happen to be accustomed to this or in some other way should be changed he would become liberal for he would give to those to whom it is proper and would not receive whence it is not proper hence the prodigal does not appear to be depraved in his manners for it is not the property of a bad or ignoble but of a stupid man to exceed in giving and not receiving but he who is prodigal after this manner appears to be much better than the illiberal man for the above-mentioned reasons and also because the one benefits many but the other no one and not even himself the multitude of prodigals however as we have said receive whence they ought not and according to this are illiberal but they become prompt to receive because through being willing to spend they are unable to do this with facility for the means of spending rapidly fail them hence they are compelled to procure money elsewhere but at the same time because they pay no attention to the beautiful in conduct they receive negligently and from every one indiscriminately for they desire to give but it is of no consequence to them how or whence they give on this account neither are their gifts liberal for they are not beautiful nor for the sake of this very thing the beautiful in conduct nor are they bestowed as they ought to be 
but sometimes they cause those to be rich who ought to be poor and give nothing to men whose manners are moderate but bestow much on flatterers or those who are the means of procuring them any other pleasures hence also most of them are intemperate for they spend their money easily and likewise spend profusely on things of an intemperate nature and because they do not live with a view to the beautiful in conduct they incline to pleasures the prodigal therefore unless he is corrected falls into these vices but by care and diligence he may arrive at the medium and to what is becoming in conduct illiberality however is incurable for old age and every infirmity appear to render men illiberal and it is more congenial to them than prodigality for the multitude are more desirous of gain than disposed to give illiberality likewise extends widely and is multiform since there appears to be many modes of it for consisting in two things a deficiency in giving and excess in receiving it is not wholly and entirely present with all illiberal men but sometimes it is divided and some indeed exceed in receiving but others are deficient in giving for all those to whom such appellations apply as niggardly tenacious and sordid are deficient in giving but they do not desire the property of others nor do they wish to receive some indeed through a certain probity and an avoidance of base conduct for some of them seem to take care of their own property or at least say that they do so in order that they may not at any time be compelled to do anything base of these characters however the skin flint and every one of the like kind is so denominated from giving to no one in excess but others of these abstain from property which is not their own through fear because it is not easy for him who takes what belongs to others to preserve his own property unviolated hence they are disposed neither to receive nor give others again exceed in receiving in consequence of receiving on all sides and everything such as those who perform illiberal works together with panders usurers gamesters sharpers and other depredators and those who for the sake of a little subject themselves to great infamy for all these receive whence they ought not and what they ought not the acquisition however of base gain appears to be common to these for all of them endure disgrace for the sake of gain and this small for we do not call those illiberal who receive great things whence they ought not and such as they ought not as for instance tyrants the subverters of cities and the plunderers of temples but we rather call them depraved and impious and unjust the gamester indeed the highwayman and the sharper are among the number of illiberal characters for they are addicted to base gain since for the sake of gain they devote themselves to these employments and endure disgraces and some indeed expose themselves to the greatest dangers for the sake of what they may get but others gain something from their friends to whom they ought to give both these therefore since they wish to enrich themselves whence they ought not are addicted to base gain and all such receivings are illiberal reasonably also is illiberality said to be contrary to liberality for it is a greater evil than prodigality and men err more in this than in prodigality of which we have spoken above and thus much concerning liberality and the opposite vices chapter two it would seem to follow that we should in the next place discuss magnificence for it also appears to be a certain virtue which is conversant with riches it does not however in the same manner as liberality extend to all pecuniary actions but only to those that are sumptuous for in these it surpasses liberality in magnitude for as its name signifies it is a becoming costliness in great things magnitude however is a relative for the same expense does not become the commander of a three-ranked galley and the president of a public spectacle the becoming therefore subsists with reference to him who spends and to the things on which he spends his money and the money which is spent he however who spends with decorum in small or in moderate things is not called magnificent such as quote, to vagrant mendicants i oft have given 
but he who spends appropriately in great things for the magnificent is a liberal man but the liberal man is not because liberal magnificent of a habit however of this kind the deficiency indeed is called parsimony but the excess vulgar ostentation and ignorance of what is elegant and such other appellations as belong to habits which do not exceed in magnitude about things in which great expense is becoming but exhibit a splendid profusion in things in which such profusion is not proper concerning these however we shall speak hereafter but the magnificent resembles the scientific man for he is able to survey what is decorous and can spend largely with elegance for as we said in the beginning habit is defined by energies and by those things of which it is the habit but the expenses of the magnificent man are great and becoming and such also are his deeds for thus the expenses will be great and adapted to the deed hence it is necessary that the deed should be worthy the expense and the expense worthy the deed or even surpassing it the magnificent man therefore spends after this manner for the sake of the beautiful in conduct for this is common to the virtues and he also spends with pleasure and largely because an accurate attention to expense is the province of a parsimonious man the magnificent man likewise will rather consider how he may accomplish the most beautiful and becoming work than the money it will cost and how it may be accomplished with the least expense it is necessary therefore that the magnificent should also be a liberal man for the liberal man spends what he ought and as he ought but in these things whatever is great pertains to the magnificent man magnificence being as it were a certain magnitude of liberality since however liberality is conversant with the same things as magnificence the magnificent man will produce a more magnificent work from an equal expense for there is not the same virtue of possession and a work since the virtue of a possession is to be of great worth and most precious as gold but the virtue of a work is to be great and beautiful for the survey of a thing of this kind is admirable but the magnificent is admirable and the virtue of a work is magnificence in magnitude among expenses however which we call honourable are such as pertain to the worship of the gods gifts dedicated to divinity the building of temples and sacrifices and in a similar manner such things as pertain to every demoniacal nature and such as are bestowed on the community at large from a laudable ambition thus the expenses of the magnificent man will be of this kind if he should think it requisite to furnish public spectacles splendidly or three rank galleys or to feast the city but in all things as we have said it must be considered who the agent is and what the means are which he possesses for the expense ought to be such as is worthy of the means and not only adapted to the work but also to him by whom it is effected hence a poor cannot be a magnificent man for he has not the means of spending much in a becoming manner the poor man therefore who endeavours to do so is stupid for such an endeavour is repugnant to his means and to the becoming but that which is done rightly is done according to virtue such expense however becomes those who possess hereditary wealth or have procured it themselves or have derived it from their ancestors or by legacy and it likewise becomes those who are noble and renowned and other persons of the like kind for all these have magnitude and dignity the magnificent man therefore is especially a person of this description and magnificence as we have said consists in such like expenses for they are the greatest and the most honourable with respect to private expenses however those pertain to the magnificent man which are incurred but once such as marriage and whatever also there may be of the like kind and that about which the whole city is earnestly occupied or those who are in the dignified situation also such expenses as pertain to the receiving and dismissing of strangers together with gifts and remunerations for the magnificent man does not spend sumptuously on himself but on the public but gifts have something similar to things consecrated to the gods 
it is also the province of a magnificent man to build a house in a manner adapted to wealth for this also is a certain ornament and to bestow more upon those works which are more lasting for these are most beautiful it is likewise his province in each of these to observe the becoming for the same things are not adapted to gods and men either in building a temple or a sepulchre and every essence indeed is great in its own kind and that is most magnificent which is great in a great thing but that is so in the second place which is great in these things for there is a difference between magnitude in a work and magnitude in expense since a ball indeed or a most beautiful jug possesses the magnificence of a childish gift but the price of these is small and illiberal on this account it is the province of a magnificent man to do magnificently whatever he may do in every genus of things for a thing of this kind cannot easily be transcended and the magnitude of the expense is appropriate such therefore is the magnificent man but he who exceeds and is vulgarly ostentatious exceeds by spending as we have before observed beyond what is becoming for in small things and which require but small expense he consumes much money and is discordantly splendid thus for instance he will prepare a wedding dinner through ostentation and give money to players who are present at the entertainment as if it were for the public advantage and in plays he will introduce a purple curtain before the scenes as is done by the megarensians he will likewise do everything of this kind not for the sake of the beautiful in conduct but that he may display his wealth and fancies that on account of these things he shall be admired in things likewise where much expense is required he spends but little but where little expense is required he spends largely the parsimonious man however is deficient in everything and when he has incurred a great expense then looking to the completion of the work by a too accurate investigation he leaves it imperfect through too little expense everything also which he does is accompanied with delay and consideration and on this account he laments and fancies that he does everything on a larger scale than he ought these habits therefore are vices yet they do not bring with them disgrace because they are neither injurious to others nor base in the extreme chapter three but magnanimity is conversant with great things as is evident from the very name what the quality of the things is however with which it is conversant we must in the first place consider but it makes no difference whether we survey the habit or him who subsists according to the habit he however appears to be magnanimous who deserving great things thinks that he deserves them for he who thinks thus of himself undeservedly is stupid but no one who is endued with virtue is either stupid or a fool the above-mentioned character therefore is magnanimous for he who deserves small things and thinks that he deserves them is a modest but not a magnanimous man since magnanimity consists in magnitude just as beauty consists in a large body for small men are elegant and have symmetry of form but are not beautiful he however who thinks that he deserves great things but thus thinks undeservedly is proud though not every one is proud who deserving many things thinks he deserves more but he who estimates himself less than he deserves is pusillanimous if deserving things of a moderate or small nature he thinks himself to deserve still less than these and he will especially appear to be a character of this kind who deserving great things has this humiliating opinion of himself for what would he do if he were not deserving of such things the magnanimous man therefore is in magnitude the summit but in that which is requisite the middle for he thinks himself deserving of that which he does deserve but the other characters exceed and are deficient hence if deserving great things he thinks that he deserves them and especially if he deserves the greatest things he will principally be conversant with one thing what this is therefore must be assumed from desert and desert is denominated with reference to external goods we must however consider that as the greatest of external goods which we attribute to the gods after which those who are in a dignified situation especially aspire and which is the reward of the most beautiful deeds 
but honor is a thing of this kind for this is the greatest of external goods the magnanimous man therefore is conversant with honor and dishonor in such a manner as is proper and indeed without any reasoning process the magnanimous appears to be conversant with honor for great men especially think themselves deserving of honor but they think so deservedly the pusillanimous man however is deficient both with respect to himself and the desert of the magnanimous man but the proud man exceeds indeed with respect to himself yet not with respect to the magnanimous man the magnanimous man however if he is deserving of the greatest things will be the best of men for a better character always deserves something greater and the best of characters deserves the greatest of things hence it is necessary that the truly magnanimous man should be a good man and that which is great in every virtue will appear to belong to the magnanimous man nor does it by any means accord with the character of the magnanimous man to fly agitated with fear or to injure any one for on what account will he act basely to whom nothing is great but from a survey of particulars the magnanimous man will appear to be ridiculous if he is not a good man nor indeed will he be worthy of honour if he is a bad man for honour is the reward of virtue and is conferred on good men magnanimity therefore appears to be as it were a certain ornament of the virtues for it causes them to be greater and does not exist without them on this account it is truly difficult to be magnanimous for it is not possible to be so without integrity and worth the magnanimous man therefore is especially conversant with honour and dishonour and with great honours indeed and those which are conferred by worthy men he is moderately pleased as being things familiar and adapted to him or rather less than he deserves for there can be no honour equal to the desert of all perfect virtue nevertheless he will admit these honours because they have not anything greater to confer upon him but he will entirely despise the honour which is paid him by casual persons and for things of a trifling nature for these do not accord with his desert and in a similar manner he will despise dishonour for it will not justly befall him the magnanimous man therefore as we have said is especially conversant with honour nevertheless with respect to wealth also and power and all prosperous and adverse fortune he will conduct himself in these moderately in whatever manner they may take place and neither in prosperity will he be very much elated nor in adversity very much dejected for neither is he affected with respect to honour as if it were the greatest of things since dominion and wealth are eligible on account of honour those therefore who possess these wish through them to be honoured to him however to whom honour is a small thing other things also will be small hence likewise magnanimous men appear to be supercilious prosperity however seems to contribute to magnanimity for those that are nobly born are thought worthy of honour and also men in authority and those that are rich for they surpass others but everything which excels in good is more honourable hence also things of this kind cause men to be more magnanimous for they are honoured by certain persons on account of them in reality however the good man alone is to be honoured but he who possesses both these i e good fortune and virtue is reckoned more deserving of honour those however who possess such like goods without virtue neither justly think themselves worthy of great things nor are rightly called magnanimous men for magnanimity cannot exist without all perfect virtue but those who possess things of this kind become supercilious and insolent and bad men for without virtue it is not easy to bear prosperity elegantly but not being able to bear prosperity and fancying that they surpass other men they despise them and act in a casual manner for they imitate the magnanimous man without resembling him and they do this in those things in which they are able they do not therefore act conformably to virtue but they despise other men the magnanimous man however justly despises others for he forms a true opinion of men and things but the opinion of the multitude is casually formed the magnanimous man also neither exposes himself to small dangers nor is a lover of danger 
because there are but few things which he considers to be of great importance but he exposes himself to great dangers and when he is in danger is not sparing of his life because he does not consider life as a thing of great importance he is likewise disposed to benefit others but is ashamed to be benefited for the former is the province of one who surpasses but the latter of one who is surpassed and the benefit which he returns exceeds what he received for thus it will come to pass that he who first bestowed the benefit will be his debtor and will be benefited by him magnanimous men also appear to remember those whom they have benefited but not those from whom they have derived any advantage for he who receives is inferior to him who confers the benefit but the magnanimous man wishes to excel hence neither does thetis mention the benefits she had conferred on jupiter nor the lacedaemonians those which they had conferred on the athenians but those which they had received from them it is likewise the property of a magnanimous man to ask nothing of any one or scarcely to do so but to administer readily to the wants of others and towards those indeed who are in a dignified situation and in prosperous circumstances to be great in his behaviour but moderate towards those who are in a middle condition for to surpass the former is difficult and venerable but it is easy to excel the latter and to conduct himself with dignity among the former is not ignoble but among the lower class of men it is arrogant in the same manner as it would be for a man to display his strength among the infirm it is also the property of the magnanimous man not to betake himself to things which are held in honourable estimation or where others possess the principal place likewise to be at leisure and given to delay except where great honour is to be obtained or some great work is to be accomplished and to perform a few things indeed but these great and celebrated it is also necessary that he should openly hate and openly love for to conceal love or hatred is the province of one who is afraid it is likewise the property of the magnanimous man to regard truth more than opinion and also to speak and act openly for this is the province of the man who despises others hence he uses the greatest freedom of speech for this pertains to him who speaks freely hence too he is a despiser of others and a lover of truth unless when he speaks ironically but his language is ironical to the vulgar the magnanimous man likewise is unable to live with any other person than a friend for it is servile hence all flatterers are mercenary and all humble men are flatterers nor is he given to admiration for to him nothing is great in human affairs nor is he mindful of injuries for it is not the province of a magnanimous man to be mindful and especially of evils but rather to overlook them nor does he speak about men for neither does he speak about himself nor about another person for he is not concerned either that he himself may be praised or that others may be blamed nor again is he addicted to praise hence neither does he defame any one not even his enemies unless in order to remove contumely from himself and in necessary or small affairs he is by no means querulous and suppliant for to be so is the province of a man who considers such affairs as of great consequence he is likewise so disposed as to prefer the possession of things beautiful and unattended with advantage to such as are advantageous and useful for this is more the province of one who is sufficient to himself the motion also of the magnanimous man is slow his voice is grave and his diction stable for he who is earnestly attentive to but few things is not prone to be hasty nor is he vehemently strenuous who considers nothing in human affairs as great but acuteness of voice and rapidity of motion are produced from vehemence and considering human affairs as important such therefore is the magnanimous man he however who is deficient in magnanimity is pusillanimous but he who exceeds is proud and arrogant neither however do these characters appear to be bad for they are not malevolent but wander from the medium for the pusillanimous man indeed deserving good things deprives himself of what he deserves and appears to have something depraved in consequence of not thinking himself to deserve what is good he also is ignorant of himself 
for if he were not he would aspire after things of which he is worthy such things being good such men however do not appear to be stupid but rather to be sluggish but an opinion of this kind seems to render them worse for every one desires what is adapted to his desert they likewise withdraw themselves from beautiful actions and pursuits as if they were unworthy of them and in a similar manner from external goods but the proud and arrogant are stupid and ignorant of themselves and this obviously for they endeavour to obtain honourable things as if they deserved them and afterwards are reprobated by others for doing so they also study the ornaments of dress and graceful deportment and the like and they wish that their prosperity may be apparent and they speak of themselves as if they were to be honoured on account of these things pusillanimity however is more opposed to magnanimity than pride and arrogance for it more frequently occurs and is a worse evil magnanimity therefore is as we have said conversant with great honour chapter four it seems however that a certain virtue is conversant with honour as we have before observed which would appear to have a similar relation to magnanimity that liberality has to magnificence for both these virtues are remote from magnitude but dispose us in such a way as is proper with respect to things moderate and small but as in the receiving and giving of money there are a medium excess and defect thus also in the appetition of honour there are the more and the less than is proper and whence it is proper and as it is proper for we blame the ambitious man as aspiring after honour more than is proper and whence it is not proper to obtain it and we blame the unambitious man as not deliberately choosing to be honoured even for actions that are beautiful sometimes however we praise the ambitious man as virile and a lover of beautiful conduct but the unambitious man as modest and temperate as we have before observed but it is evident that since the lover of a certain thing is said to be so multifariously we do not always refer the lover of honour to the same thing but when we praise him it is because he desires honour more than the vulgar desire it and when we blame him it is because he desires it more than is proper since however the medium is anonymous the extremes appear to contend for it as for a solitary place but in those things in which there are excess and defect there is also a medium men also aspire after honour more or less than is proper and therefore they also aspire after it in such a way as is proper hence this habit is praised which is an anonymous medium about honour it appears however with reference to ambition to be a privation of ambition and to be ambition with reference to a privation of ambition and to be in a certain respect both with reference to both this also appears to be the case in the other virtues here however the extremes are seen to be opposed to each other because the middle is without a name chapter five but mildness is indeed a medium conversant with anger since however the virtue which conducts itself moderately with respect to anger is anonymous and this is also nearly the case with the extremes we refer mildness to the medium though it appears to incline rather to the deficiency in anger which deficiency is anonymous but the excess may be called a certain angriness for the passion is anger but the causes of it are many and various he therefore who is angry from causes and with persons with which it is proper to be angry and farther still in such a manner as is proper and when and as long as it is proper is praised hence he will be a mild man since mildness is praised for the mild man wishes to be without perturbation and not to be led by passions but to be angry as reason may ordain in these things and for as long a time as it prescribes he appears however rather to err in the deficiency with respect to anger for the mild man is not given to revenge but is rather inclined to pardon but the deficiency whether it be a certain lenity or whatever it may be is blamed for those who are not angry from causes for which it is proper to be angry appear to be stupid and this is also the case with those who are not angry as it is proper 
nor when it is proper, nor with those persons with whom it is proper, since they appear to be without sensation, and to be void of pain. And also, since they are not angry, they are not inclined to revenge, for it is servile for a man to endure the insolent behavior of others towards himself and his own relations. Excess, however, in anger has a manifold subsistence, for it is possible to be angry with persons and from causes with which it is not proper, and also more and less, and for a longer time than is proper. All these excesses, however, are not inherent in the same person, for it is not possible that they should be, for evil destroys itself, and if it is perfect and entire, is intolerable. Those, therefore, who are irascible, rapidly become angry, and with things and from causes with which they ought not to be angry, and also more than is proper. But they quickly cease to be angry, which is a most excellent thing. But this happens to them because they do not restrain their anger, but return an injury as soon as they have received it. Hence, their anger on account of its celerity is manifest, but afterwards they cease to be angry. The extremely irascible, however, are excessively rapid in their anger, and are angry with everything, and on every occasion, whence also they derive their appellation. But the bitterly angry are with difficulty liberated from anger, and are angry for a long time, for they detain their anger from bursting forth. They cease, however, to be angry when they have taken vengeance on those that angered them, for vengeance appeases anger, producing pleasure instead of pain. But if vengeance does not take place, they are oppressed with a heavy burden, for because the manner in which they are affected is not apparent, neither does any one persuade them to be appeased. Time, however, is requisite for them to concoct their anger. But men of this description are most troublesome to themselves and to those who are especially their friends. We likewise call those men severe in their anger, who are angry from causes for which they ought not, and in a greater degree, and for a longer time than is proper, and who cannot be appeased without revenge or punishment. To mildness, however, we rather oppose the excess than the defect, for it is more frequent, since it is more human to revenge an injury. Severe men, also, are worse for the purpose of association, but that which we before observed is also manifest from what we now say, for it is not easy to define how, and with what persons, and from what causes, and for how long a time a man should be angry, and also to what extent he may be so rightly, or erroneously. For he who transgresses in a small degree is not blamed, whether he inclines to the more or to the less, since we sometimes praise those that are deficient, and call them mild, and sometimes we call those who are severely angry virile as being men who are able to govern others. It is not, therefore, easy to explain in words the quantity and mode of transgression which is blamable, for the judgment of this is situated in particulars, and in sense. Thus much, however, is evident, that the middle habit indeed is laudable, according to which we are angry with those persons, and from those causes, that it is proper to be so, and in such a manner as is proper and everything else of the like kind. But the excesses and defects are blamable, and these, indeed, if they deviate but a little from the medium, are blamable in a small degree, if more, in a greater degree, and if much, they are very blamable. It is evident, therefore, that the middle habit must be retained, and thus we have discussed the habits pertaining to anger. Chapter 6 In the associations, however, of men with each other, and in the communication of words and deeds, some persons appear to be placid and obsequious, who praise everything with a view to pleasure of those with whom they associate, and are not their opponents in anything, in consequence of fancying that they ought not by any means to offend them. Others, on the contrary, are adverse to their associates in everything, and are not at all concerned about whom they may offend, and these are called morose and litigious. That the above-mentioned habits, therefore, are blamable, is not immanifest, and, also, that the medium between these is laudable, according to which a man admits what he ought, and as he ought, and is in a similar manner indignant. No name, however, is given to this medium, but it seems especially to resemble friendship, 
For he who subsists according to the middle habit is such a one as we wish a worthy friend to be, if he also assumes, in conjunction with it, a love resembling filial love. But it differs from friendship, because it is without passion, and a love resembling filial love towards those upon whom it is exercised. For it does not admit everything in such a manner as is fit, in consequence of loving or hating, but from a habit of approving or of reprehending properly. For he who possesses this habit will be similarly affable to those whom he does not, and to those whom he does know, to his associates, and to those with whom he does not associate, except that to each of these his affability will be appropriate. For it is not fit similarly to pay attention or give pain to familiars and strangers. We have, therefore, universally shown that he will conduct himself in his associations in such a manner as is proper, but referring his actions to the beautiful in conduct and the useful, his aim will be neither to give pain to nor delight others by obsequiousness. For this virtue appears to be conversant with the pains and pleasures which take place in associations. But when the possessor of this virtue cannot delight his associates worthily or without injuring them, he is indignant and deliberately chooses to give them pain rather than to injure them by obsequiousness. He, also, will not permit another person to be obsequious to him in those things which are attended with no small disgrace or injury, and the contrary to which produces but little pain, but he will rather be indignant. He will, likewise, associate differently with those who are in a dignified situation, and any casual persons, and with those who are more or less known to him. In a similar manner, also, in other differences, he will attribute to every one what it is fit for each person to receive, and he will, indeed, choose to give delight to others, as a thing of itself eligible, but will cautiously avoid giving them pain. And, with respect to events, if they are greater, he will follow them, I mean, he will follow the beautiful in conduct, and the advantageous, and, for the sake of great pleasure afterwards, he will give pain in a small degree. Such, therefore, is the middle character, but he is without a name. With respect, however, to those who delight others, he who aims at pleasing, and nothing else, may be called accommodating. But he who does this in order that he may derive some pecuniary advantage, or such things as are procured through money, is a flatterer. And he who is indignant with everything, we have already said, is morose and litigious. The extremes, however, appear to be opposed to each other, because the medium is anonymous. Chapter 7 the medium of arrogance also is nearly conversant with the same things but this medium likewise is anonymous it will not however be foreign from the purpose to discuss such like habits for by discussing each particular we shall know more of what pertains to manners and shall be persuaded that the virtues are media when we understand what takes place in all of them with respect therefore to the associations of men with each other we have already spoken concerning those who associate with a view to pleasure and pain. But let us now consider those who are men of veracity or falsehood, alike in words and deeds, and dissimulation. The arrogant man, therefore, appears to be one who pretends to things of a splendid nature which he does not possess, or to such as are more splendid than he possesses. The dissembler, on the contrary, denies what he possesses, or makes it to be less than it is. But the middle character, forming a just opinion of himself, is a man of veracity in his life, and in his words, acknowledging that he possesses what he does possess, and neither more nor less. Each of these, however, may be done for the sake of something, or for the sake of nothing, but such as a man is, such also will be his words and actions, and such also will be his life, unless he acts for the sake of something. Of itself, however, Falsehood is bad and blamable, but truth is beautiful and laudable. Hence, the man of veracity, indeed, being a middle character, is laudable. But of the two characters who want veracity, both indeed are blamable, but the arrogant man more than the other. We shall, however, speak concerning each of these, and in the first place concerning the man of veracity. For we do not speak of the man who has veracity in compacts, and in things which pertain to injustice or justice, for this will belong to another virtue, 
but we speak of him who though nothing of this kind should occur is a man of veracity both in words and in his life because he is such from habit but such a one will appear to be a worthy man for he who is a lover of truth and who speaks the truth in things in which it is of no consequence whether he does or not will in a still greater degree speak the truth of things in which it is of consequence for he will avoid what is false as base and which also he will of itself avoid but such a man is worthy of praise he will however if it should be requisite to deviate from the medium rather incline to what is less than the truth for this appears to be more elegant because excesses are troublesome and invidious but he who pretends that he possesses things of greater consequence than he really does and this for the sake of nothing else resembles indeed the depraved man for otherwise he would not be delighted with falsehood yet he seems to be rather a vain than a bad man if however he does this for the sake of something such as glory or honour he is not very blamable as the arrogant man is but if he does it for the sake of money or for things which pertain to money he is more base but the arrogant man is not characterized by capacity or power but by deliberate choice for he is arrogant according to habit and because he is such a character thus also with respect to the man who is without veracity one delights in falsehood itself but another delights in it in consequence of aspiring after glory or gain those therefore who are arrogant for the sake of glory pretend to the possession of those things for which men are praised or proclaimed to be happy but those who are arrogant for the sake of gain pretend to be those characters with which others are delighted and of which the non-possession may be latent such as to be a physician or a prophet or a wise man on this account most men pretend and arrogate to themselves things of this kind for they possess the above-mentioned qualities the assemblers or the ironical however who speak less than the truth appear indeed to be more elegant in their manners for they do not seem to speak for the sake of gain but in consequence of avoiding fastidiousness but these persons especially deny that they possess things of an illustrious nature as also socrates did those however who pretend that they do not possess small things and which are obvious are called crafty or delicate deceivers and are very contemptible men sometimes also this species of dissimulation appears to be arrogance such for instance as the garments of the lacedaemonians for excess and very great deficiency alike pertain to arrogance but those who moderately use irony and are ironical in things which are not very much known and obvious appear to be elegant men the arrogant man however seems to be opposed to the man of veracity for he is a worse character chapter eight since however there is a certain relaxation in life and rest from labour and since this remission is accompanied with jesting it appears that here also there is a certain elegant method of conversation in which such things are said as are proper and are delivered in a proper manner and similarly with respect to hearing what it is proper to hear and hearing it in such a way as is fit but there is a difference in speaking to some persons rather than to others and in hearing some things rather than others it is evident however that in these things also there is an excess and deficiency with respect to the medium those therefore who exceed in the ridiculous appear to be scurrilous and troublesome for they entirely affect the ridiculous and aim more at exciting laughter than at speaking in a becoming manner and not giving pain to the object of their ridicule but those who do not say themselves anything ridiculous and are indignant with those who do appear to be rustic and rigorous those however who jest elegantly are called facetious and versatile as being of a flexible genius for of manners there appear to be such like motions but as a judgment is formed of bodies from motions so likewise of manners since however there is a redundancy of the ridiculous and most men delight in jests and cavilling more than is proper the scurrilous also are called versatile as being polite and pleasant but that they differ and in no small degree is evident from what has been said to the middle habit also dexterity is appropriate but it is the province of a dexterous man to say and hear such things as are adapted to a worthy and liberal man 
for there are certain things which it becomes such a one to say and hear in jest and the jesting of a liberal differs from that of a servile man and again the jesting of an erudite differs from that of an inerudite man but the truth of this may be seen both from ancient and modern comedies for in the former the ridiculous consisted in obscenity but in the latter the suspicion of obscenity rather excited laughter these things however differ in no small degree with respect to the decorous and elegant whether therefore is he who ridicules well to be defined by this that he says what it becomes a liberal man to say or by this that he does not pain or that he delights the hearer or shall we say that a thing of this kind is indefinite for a different thing is odious and pleasing to a different person he will also hear things of this kind viz things that are adapted to a worthy and liberal man for such things as a man endures to hear such also he appears to do he will not therefore do or say everything for cavilling is a certain invective legislators however forbid certain invectives and perhaps it would be proper that they should also forbid cavilling the elegant and liberal man therefore will so conduct himself as if he were a law to himself hence the middle character is a man of this description whether he is to be denominated dexterous or versatile but the scurrilous man is vanquished by the ridiculous and neither spares himself nor others if he can excite laughter he likewise says such things as the elegant man would never say and some things that he says the elegant man would not even endure to hear the rustic man however is useless with respect to such conversations for contributing nothing he is indignant with all of them but relaxation and jesting appear to be necessary to the life of man there are therefore the above mentioned three media in life but all of them are conversant with the communion of certain words and actions they differ however because one of them is conversant with truth but the others are conversant with the delectable but of the media which pertain to pleasure one indeed is conversant with jests but the other with the associations which belong to the rest of life chapter nine with respect to shame it is not fit to speak of it as of a certain virtue for it resembles passion more than habit it is defined therefore to be a certain dread of infamy and similar to fear it is exercised about dreadful things for those who are under the influence of shame become red or blush but those who have the fear of death upon them are pale hence both these appear to be in a certain respect corporeal which seems rather to belong to passion than to habit this passion however is not adapted to every age but to youth for we think it requisite that young persons should be bashful because they commit many errors in consequence of living from passion but are restrained from the commission of them by shame and we praise indeed bashful young men but no one praises a bashful old man for we think that he ought not to do anything for which he should be ashamed for neither does shame pertain to a worthy man since it is produced by bad conduct for the things which cause shame are not to be done but it makes no difference whether some things are in reality base but others only base according to opinion for neither of these are to be done so that shame is not to be admitted a thing of this kind also viz to do something base is the province of a bad man but for a man to be so disposed as to be ashamed if he should do anything that is base and to fancy himself on this account to be a worthy character is absurd for shame pertains to voluntary actions but a worthy man never voluntarily acts basely shame however from hypothesis may seem to be good for if a worthy man should act basely he would be ashamed but this does not pertain to the virtues nor if impudence is a bad thing and not to be ashamed when acting basely will it be at all a more worthy thing to be ashamed when performing base deeds neither is continence a virtue but a certain mixed thing this however we shall discuss hereafter but let us now speak concerning justice end of book four recording in memory of mitchell edwards
Book five of the Nicomachean Ethics. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jeffrey Edwards. The Nicomachean Ethics by Aristotle. Translated by Thomas Taylor. Book five now therefore let us direct our attention to justice and injustice and consider with what kind of actions they are conversant what kind of medium justice is and of what things the just is the medium but let our survey be made according to the same method as the preceding discussions we see therefore that all men are willing to call that kind of habit justice through which we practise just things or are inclined to the works of justice, and through which we act justly, and wish what is just. And, after the same manner, injustice is that habit through which men act unjustly, and wish what is unjust. Hence, these things must first be adumbrated by us, since there is not the same mode of subsistence in the sciences, in powers, and in habits. For there is the same power, indeed, and the same science of contraries but there is not the same habit of contraries thus for instance contrary operations are not performed by health but those only which are salubrious for we say that a man walks in a healthy manner when he walks in such a way as a healthy man walks frequently therefore a contrary habit is known from a contrary habit but frequently habits are known from their subjects for if a good habit of body is apparent a bad habit of body will also be apparent and from things which produce a good habit of body this good habit will be known and from this good habit its producing causes will be known for if a good habit of body is a density of the flesh a bad habit of body will necessarily be a rarity of the flesh and that which produces a good habit of body will be productive of density in the flesh it follows however for the most part that if one contrary is predicated multifariously the other also will be multifariously predicated as if the just so likewise the unjust but justice and injustice are predicated multifariously though through the proximity of their homonymy this is latent nor is it more apparent as is the case in those things which are remote for the difference according to idea or form is great thus for instance clavis is predicated homonymously for it signifies both that part which is under the neck of animals and that by which gates are shut viz a key we must consider therefore in how many ways an unjust man is denominated but it appears that he is an unjust man who acts illegally and he who takes to himself more of external goods than he ought or who is avaricious and also he who is unequal i e who takes to himself less of evils than is equitable so that it is evident that he will be a just man who acts legally and he who is equal or equitable the just therefore will be both the legal and the equal but the unjust will be the illegal and the unequal since however the unjust man is avaricious he will be conversant with good yet not with every kind of good but with that in which there is prosperous and adverse fortune and which is indeed simply always good but to a certain person not always but men pray for and pursue this good though they ought not for they should pray indeed that things which are simply good such as riches may also be good to them but they should choose such things as are good to their possessor such as virtue and wisdom the unjust man however does not always choose that which is more but in things which are simply evil he chooses the less but because a less evil appears in a certain respect to be good and of what is good there is a desire of possessing more of it than is equitable on this account the unjust man appears to be avaricious he is also unequal and acts illegally for this very thing the acting illegally or in equality comprehends all injustice and is common to all injustice since however he who acts illegally is unjust
men or to those in authority and this either according to virtue or some other mode hence after one manner we call those things just which are capable of producing and preserving felicity and the parts of it by political communion the law however ordains that the works of the brave man should be done such as that a soldier shall not leave his rank nor fly from the enemy nor throw away his arms and likewise that the works of the temperate man shall be done such as not to commit adultery nor behave with insolent wantonness and also those of the mild man such as not to strike another person nor defame any one and the law ordains similarly with respect to the other virtues and vices partly commanding and partly forbidding the law indeed doing this rightly which is rightly framed but that which is rashly framed erroneously this justice therefore i e legal justice is indeed a perfect virtue yet not simply but with reference to another thing and on this account justice frequently appears to be the best of the virtues nor is either the evening or the morning star so admirable we likewise say proverbially every virtue is comprehended in justice and legal justice is especially a perfect virtue because it is the use of perfect virtue but it is perfect because he who possesses it is also able to employ virtue towards another person and not only towards himself for many persons are indeed able to employ virtue in their own affairs but not in the affairs of others and on this account it appears to have been well said by bias that dominion shows the man for he who governs has relation to another person and is now conversant with the communion of life for the very same reason also justice alone of all the virtues appears to be a foreign good because it has reference to another person since it performs what is advantageous to another viz either to a ruler or to the community at large he therefore is the worst of characters who acts depravedly both towards himself and towards his friends but he is the best of men not who acts virtuously towards himself but towards another person for this is a difficult work this justice therefore is not a part of virtue but is universal virtue nor is the injustice which is contrary to it a part of vice but universal vice what the difference however is between virtue and this justice is evident from what has already been said for it is indeed the same with it but not essentially for so far indeed as it has reference to another person it is justice but so far as it is habit of a certain description it is simply virtue chapter two we investigate however that justice which is a part of virtue for there is as we say such a justice and in a similar manner we investigate the injustice which is a part of vice but that there is such a justice is indicated by this that he who energizes according to other depravities acts unjustly indeed but does not assume to himself more of external good than he ought such for instance as the man who throws away his shield through timidity or he who speaks ill of another from asperity or who does not give pecuniary assistance to another through illiberality but when he assumes to himself more than he ought he frequently is not vicious according to any one of such vices nor yet according to all the vices but according to a certain depravity for we blame him and for injustice there is therefore a certain other injustice as being a certain part of universal injustice and a certain something unjust which is a part of the whole of the unjust that is contrary to law farther still if one person indeed should commit adultery for the sake of gain and should receive money for so doing but another should give money and sustain an injury in his property by doing it in consequence of being under the influence of strong desire the latter indeed will rather appear to be intemperate than one who assumes to himself more than he ought but the former will be unjust but not intemperate and it is evident that he will not because he acts with a view to gain again in all other unjust deeds there is always a reference to a certain depravity thus if a man commits adultery the reference is to intemperance if he abandons his post in battle the reference is to timidity but if he strikes another person 
to anger. If, however, he obtains money by it, the reference is to no other depravity than to injustice. Hence, it is evident that there is a certain other injustice which ranks as a part, besides universal injustice, and which is synonymous with it, because the definition of each is in the same genus, for both possess their power in a reference to another person. But the injustice which ranks as a part is conversant with honor, or riches, or safety, or, if all these could be comprehended in one name, it is conversant with them, and this on account of the pleasure which results from gain. Universal injustice, however, is conversant with all such things, as a worthy man is conversant with in the exercise of justice. That there are many kinds of justice, therefore, and that there is a certain justice which is different from universal virtue, is evident. What it is, however, and what kind of thing it is, must be explained. The unjust, therefore, has been distinguished by us into the illegal and the unequal, and the just into the legal and the equal. But the prior injustice of which we have spoken subsists according to the illegal. Since, however, the illegal and the unequal are not the same, but different, as a part with reference to a whole, for everything unequal is illegal, but not everything which is illegal is unequal, hence the unjust and injustice are not the same with these, but different from them, in the same manner as parts and wholes. For this injustice is a part of the whole of injustice, and in a similar manner this justice is a part of the whole of justice. We must, therefore, speak concerning the justice and injustice which ranks as parts, and after the same manner concerning the partially just and unjust. The justice, therefore, and injustice, which are arranged according to universal virtue, and of which the former is the use of the whole of virtue, and the latter of the whole of vice, with reference to another person, we shall omit. It is, likewise, evident how the just and the unjust, which are arranged conformably to these, are to be distinguished. For nearly most of those things which are legal are ordained from universal virtue. For the law orders men to live conformably to every virtue, and forbids them from acting conformably to any one of the vices. But the efficient causes of the whole of virtue are those legal actions which are established by the laws for the purposes of public discipline. Concerning the discipline, however, of an individual, according to which he is simply a good man, whether it pertains to the political or another science will be determined hereafter. For perhaps it is not the same thing to be a good man and a good citizen, but there is one species of the justice which subsists according to a part, and of the just pertaining to it, and which consists in the distributions either of honor, or riches, or such other things as may be divided among those who partake of the same polity. For in these it is possible that one person may share unequally, and equally with another. But another species of justice is that which possesses a corrective power in contracts. Of this, however, there are two parts. For of contracts, some are voluntary, but others are involuntary. The voluntary, indeed, are buying, selling, putting out money at interest, certiship, lending anything on hire, pledging and hiring a slave or an artificer. But these contracts are said to be voluntary, because the principle of them is voluntary. And of involuntary contracts, some are clandestine, such as theft, adultery, witchcraft, prostitution, deceiving the slave of another person, insidious murder, and bearing false witness. But the violent are, such as blows, bonds, death, plunder, mutilation, slander, and contumely. Chapter 3. Since, however, the unjust man is unequal, and also the unjust belongs to the unequal, it is evident that there is a certain medium of the unequal, but this is the equal. For in whatever action there is, the more and the less, there is also the equal. If, therefore, the unjust is unequal, the just will be equal, which, indeed, without any reasoning process, is manifest to all men. But since the equal is a medium, the just will be a certain medium. The equal, however, is in two things at least. It is necessary, therefore, that the just, which is a medium and equal, should be referred to a certain thing, and to certain things. And so far, indeed, as it is a medium, it is referred to certain things, but these are the more and the less. 
and so far as it is equal it is referred to two things but so far as it is the just it is referred to certain things hence it is necessary that the just should be in four things at least for the persons to whom the just pertains are two and the things in which it consists are two and there will be the same equality between the persons to whom justice pertains and the things in which it consists for as is the relation of the former to each other such also is that of the latter for if the persons are not equal they will not have equal things battles however and accusations hence originate when either equal persons do not obtain equal things or those that are not equal have an equal distribution of things this also is evident from distribution according to desert for all men acknowledge that the just in distribution should be made according to a certain desert all men however do not say that there is the same desert but democratic men indeed say that desert is liberty and of the oligarchists some say that it is wealth but others that it is nobility but the aristocrats say that it is virtue the just therefore is something analogous for the analogous is not only the peculiarity of monadic number or number consisting of units but of number universally for analogy or proportion is equality of ratio and consists in four things at least that disjunct proportion therefore consists in four terms is evident and this is also the case with continued proportion for this uses one thing as two things as for instance as a is to b so is b to c hence b is twice assumed so that if b is placed twice the analogous things will be four but the just also consists in four things at least and the reason is the same for the persons to whom justice is distributed and the things which are distributed are similarly divided as the term a therefore is to b so will c b to d and therefore alternately as a is to c so is b to d hence the whole will be compared with the whole which the distribution conjoins and if they are thus compounded they will be justly conjoined the conjunction therefore of the term a with c and of b with d forms the justice which is in distribution and the just is the medium of that which is foreign from the analogous for the analogous is a medium and the just is analogous mathematicians however call such an analogy or proportion as this geometrical for in geometrical proportion it happens that the whole is to the whole as all the parts to all but this proportion is not continued for the same thing is not assumed as the person to whom a distribution is made and as the thing distributed evil for a less evil has the relation of good with respect to a greater evil for a less is more eligible than a greater evil but the eligible is good and that which is more eligible is a greater good this therefore is one species of the just chapter four the other remaining species of justice is corrective which is conversant both with voluntary and involuntary contracts but the form of this justice is different from the former for the justice which is distributive of common things or things of a public nature always subsists according to the above-mentioned proportion for if the distribution is made from common property it will be according to the same ratio as the things introduced have to each other and the unjust which is opposed to this justice is foreign from proportion the just however which is in contracts is indeed a certain equality and the unjust is inequality yet not according to geometrical but arithmetical proportion for it makes no difference whether a worthy deprives a bad man of his property or a bad a worthy man nor whether a worthy or a bad man commits adultery but the law only looks to the difference of the injury and uses the persons as if they were equal though the one indeed 
should injure but the other should be injured and though the one should do but the other should suffer harm hence this injustice since it is unequal the judge endeavours to equalize for when one man indeed inflicts a blow but another is struck or one man kills but another is killed the suffering and the action are divided into unequal parts but the judge by the punishment which he inflicts endeavours to produce an equality by detracting from the game for in things of this kind in short though to some things the name will not be appropriate the injury is denominated gain and the endurance of the injury loss but when the suffering is measured the one is called loss but the other gain hence of the more and the less the equal is the medium with respect to loss and gain however the one is more but the other less contrarily for the more of good but the less of evil is gain and the contrary is loss of which the equal is the medium which we say is the just hence the justice which is corrective will be the medium of loss and gain hence too when men contend with each other about legal affairs they fly to the judge but to go to a judge is to go to justice for a judge is nothing else than as it were animated justice they also search for a judge who is a medium and some persons call judges mediators as if they should obtain justice if they obtain to the medium the just therefore is a certain medium since the judge is also but the judge equalizes and as if a line were cut into unequal parts he takes away from the greater section that by which it exceeds the half and adds it to the less section when however the whole is divided into two equal parts then men say they have what is their own when they obtain the equal but the equal is the middle of the greater and the less according to arithmetical proportion hence also the just bracket decayan close bracket is denominated because it is divided into two equal parts bracket odi dicha esten close bracket just as if it should be said to be dicean and the judge is called dicastes as if he were dicastes or one who divides a thing into two equal parts for if when two things are equal that which is taken from the one is added to the other the latter will exceed what the former then becomes by two such parts for if what is taken away from one of the equal things were not added to the other the one would exceed the other by one such part only the thing therefore to which something is added exceeds the medium by one part and the medium also exceeds by one part that from which something is taken away by this therefore we may know what ought to be taken away from him who has more and what ought to be added to him who has less for it is necessary to add to him who has less that by which the medium exceeds but to take away from the greatest that by which the medium is exceeded let there be three lines a a b b c c equal to each other from a a let a e be taken and added to c c and let that part be c d hence the whole line d c c will exceed the line a e by the line c d and the line f c and therefore it will exceed the line b b by the line c d this also takes place in other arts for they would be subverted unless that which suffers suffers the same in quantity and quality as that which acts but these appellations loss and gain are derived from voluntary contracts for when a man obtains more than his own he is said to gain but when he has less than what he had at first he is said to have lost as in buying and selling and such other things as the law permits when however men have neither more nor less but give as much as they receive they are said to have their own and neither to lose nor gain hence the just is the medium of a certain gain and loss in things which are not voluntary so that each of those who form a contract may have as much afterwards as before chapter five to some persons however retaliation appears to be simply just and this also was the opinion of the pythagoreans for they define the just to be simply retaliation but retaliation is neither adapted to distributive 
nor to corrective justice though radamanthus in aeschylus appears to assert that justice is this quote, and that the punishment will be equitable when a man suffers the same thing as he has done Close quote. for retaliation is frequently discordant thus for instance if a magistrate should strike a man it is not proper that the man should strike him in return and if any one strikes a magistrate he ought not only to be struck but to be punished more severely again there is a great difference between the voluntary and the involuntary but commercial intercourse is preserved by a justice of this kind if the retaliation is made according to proportion and not according to equality for by analogous retaliation the union of a city becomes permanent for men either endeavour to return evil for evil for it appears to be slavery if they cannot retaliate or they wish when they benefit others to be themselves benefited in return since if this does not take place there is no compensation by which the permanent union of society is effected hence the temple of the graces is built in a conspicuous part of the city for the purpose of producing remuneration for this is the peculiarity of grace or favour for it is requisite to return a favour to him who has conferred one and he again should begin to confer a favour but a conjunction according to a diameter produces the retribution which is according to analogy thus for instance let the builder of a house be a a shoemaker b the house c and the shoe d it is necessary therefore that the builder of the house should receive from the shoemaker his work and give his work to him in return hence if the first equality is that which is according to analogy and afterwards a retaliation is made it will be that which we have mentioned but if not there will neither be equality nor will the bond of society remain for nothing hinders but that the work of the one may be more excellent than the work of the other it is necessary therefore that these should be equalized but this also takes place in the other arts for they would be subverted unless that which is passive suffered the same in quantity and quality as the agent effects for the communion of society is not produced from two physicians but from a physician and a husbandman and in short from different and not from equal characters but it is necessary that these should be equalized hence it is requisite that all things should be capable of being compared with each other of which there is an exchange and for this purpose money was adopted and becomes in a certain respect a measure for it measures all things so that it likewise measures excess and defect and therefore determines how many shoes are equal to a house or to nutriment it is necessary therefore that such as the ratio is of the builder of a house to a shoemaker such should be the ratio of the number of shoes to a house or to nutriment for if this does not take place there will neither be exchange nor communion and it will not take place unless the things compared are in a certain respect equal hence it is necessary as has been before observed that all things should be measured by one certain thing and this is in reality indigence which connects all things for if mankind were not in want of anything or if they were not similarly in want either there would be no exchange or not the same but money was adopted by compact as a subsidiary exchange for indigence and on this account money was called bracket nomisma close bracket because it is not established by nature but by law and it is in our power to change it and render it useless retaliation therefore will then take place when there is an equalization hence as the husbandman is to the shoemaker so is the work of the shoemaker to the work of the husbandman but it is necessary to bring them to the form of proportion when an exchange takes place for without this one of the extremes will have both the excesses when however each person has his own they will thus be equal and communicate with each other because this equality can be produced among them let the husbandman be a the nutriment c and the work of the shoemaker equal to the nutriment b d but without this retaliation there would be no communion of society that indigence however connects as being one certain thing is evident because when men are not in want of each other either both or one of them no exchange takes place as it does when one is in want of what the other possesses as for instance wine for which an exportation of corn is granted it is necessary therefore that this should be equalized 
in order to future exchange however if nothing should at present be wanted that it may be obtained when it is wanted money becomes as it were asserted to us for it is requisite that he who brings money should take what he wants in exchange for it money therefore also suffers this very same thing for it does not always possess an equal power but at the same time it is more permanent hence it is necessary that all things should be estimated for thus there will always be an exchange and if there is an exchange there will be a communion money therefore as a measure having made things commensurate equalizes them for there would be no communion without exchange nor exchange without equality nor equality without commensuration in reality therefore it is impossible that things which so much differ should become commensurate but for the purposes of indigence this is sufficiently possible hence it is necessary that there should be one certain thing as a measure and this from assumption hence it is called money for this causes all things to be commensurate since all things are measured by money let a house be a ten mina b and a bed c a therefore will be the half of b if the house is worth five mina or is equal to the value of five mina but let the bed c be the tenth part of b it is evident therefore how many beds are equal in value to the house viz five that such however was the exchange before there was money is manifest for it makes no difference whether five beds or as much as the worth of five beds are given for the house thus therefore we have shown what the unjust and also what the just is but these things being determined it is evident that a just action is a medium between doing and receiving an injury for the former is to have more but the latter less than is just justice however is a medium not after the same manner with the former virtues but because it pertains to a medium between the more and the less but injustice pertains to extremes and justice indeed is that according to which a just man is said to act justly from deliberate choice and to distribute justice both to himself in making a compact with another person and to another who makes a compact with another yet not so as to attribute more of what is eligible to himself and less to his neighbour and the contrary of that which is hurtful but so as to distribute the equal to himself and others according to analogy and he adopts the same mode of conduct towards another person who forms a compact with another injustice on the contrary is that according to which an unjust man is said to act unjustly from deliberate choice and to distribute injustice both to himself and others but this is the excess and deficiency of that which is beneficial or hurtful contrary to the analogous hence injustice is excess and deficiency because it pertains to excess and deficiency to the unjust man himself indeed it is an excess of that which is simply beneficial but a deficiency of that which is hurtful but to others it distributes in a manner wholly similar and in whatever way the distribution may happen to be made it is contrary to the analogous of an unjust action however the less extreme is to be injured and the greater to injure after this manner therefore we have discussed justice and injustice and have shown what is the nature of each and similarly we have discussed universally the just and the unjust chapter six since however it is possible that he who acts unjustly may not yet be unjust for what kind of iniquitous deeds will a man be unjust according to each species of injustice for instance will it be as a thief or as an adulterer or as a robber or thus indeed will the difficulty still remain for a man may have connection with a woman knowing who she is yet not from a principle of deliberate choice but from passion hence in this case he acts unjustly but is not unjust as neither is a thief though he may have committed theft nor an adulterer though he may have committed adultery and in a similar manner in other things in what manner therefore retaliation subsists with reference to justice has been shown by us before it is necessary however not to be ignorant that what we at present investigate is the simply just and the politically just but this justice takes place among men connected together in society and these liberal and equal men either according to analogy or according to number with a view to a sufficiency of the necessaries of life hence 
those among whom this is not found have no political justice towards each other but a certain justice and which subsists according to a similitude to political justice for there is justice among those with whom there is also law but there is law among those with whom there is injustice for justice is the judgment of the just and the unjust but with those with whom there is injustice there is also acting unjustly but with all those with whom there is acting unjustly there is not injustice but injustice consists in a man distributing to himself more of what is simply good and less of what is simply evil than he ought hence we do not suffer a man to govern but to reason because he does this to himself i e distributes to himself more of what is good and less of what is evil and becomes a tyrant he however who governs is the guardian of justice but if of justice he is also the guardian of the equal but since if he is a just man it does not appear that he possesses more of external good than others for he does not distribute more of what is simply good to himself unless it belongs to him by analogy hence he distributes the simply good to another and on this account it is said that justice is a foreign good as we have before observed a certain reward therefore must be given to him but this is honour and a gift those persons however to whom these are not sufficient become tyrants but despotic and paternal justice or the justice of a master towards his servants and of a father towards his children are not the same with this but similar to it for there is no injustice simply of a man towards his own property but a possession or a slave and a child while he is little and not yet separated from his parents are as it were a part of the man and no one deliberately chooses to injure himself hence there is no injustice of a man towards himself and consequently neither is there injustice nor political justice for justice is conformable to law and subsists among those with whom law is naturally adapted to exist but these are persons with whom there is an equality of governing and being governed hence there is more of political justice between a man and his wife than between a father and his children or a master and his servants for this latter is economical justice but this is different from political justice chapter seven with respect however to political justice one kind is natural but the other legal and the natural indeed is that which has everywhere the same power and this is not because it appears or does not appear to be justice but the legal is that respecting which from the first it is of no consequence whether it is established in this or in that way but when it is established is of consequence such for instance as that captives shall be redeemed for a mina or that a goat shall be sacrificed and not two sheep and farther still such laws as are promulgated about particulars such as that sacrifices shall be offered to brasidus and whatever is established by public decrees to some persons however all political justice appears to be of this kind because that which has a natural subsistence is not mutable and everywhere possesses the same power just as fire burns both here and in persia but just things are seen to be mutable this however is not entirely but only partially the case though perhaps with the gods it is by no means to be admitted that justice is mutable but with us there is something which is naturally mutable though not everything but at the same time justice is partly from nature and partly not what however the justice is which is from nature is evident from contingencies and things which have a various subsistence and also what the justice is which is not from nature but is legal and established by compact since both are similarly mutable the same distinction likewise will be adapted to other things for the right hand is naturally more excellent i e is more adapted to motion than the left though it is possible that some persons may be ambidexter the justice however which is from compact and utility resembles measures for the measures of wine and corn are not everywhere equal but with those who buy wine and corn they are greater and with those who sell them less in a similar manner justice which is not natural but human is not everywhere the same since neither are polities but everywhere one polity alone is conformable to nature viz that which is the most excellent everything just however and everything legal are as universals to particulars for actions are many but each of them is one thing for it is a universal 
but an unjust action and the unjust differ and also a just action and the just for the unjust subsists either by nature or by order but the very same thing which when done is an unjust action is not so before it is done but is unjust and in a similar manner with respect to a just action but that which is common is rather called a deed justly done but the correction of an unjust deed a just deed with respect to each of these however what the quality and number of their species are and what the particulars are with which they are conversant we shall hereafter consider chapter eight since therefore things just and unjust are those which we have enumerated a man then indeed does an injury or acts justly when he thus acts voluntarily but when involuntarily he neither does an injury nor acts justly except from accident for it happens that the things which he does are either just or unjust but a deed unjustly done and a just action are defined by the voluntary and the involuntary for when an action is voluntary it is blamed but at the same time it is then a deed unjustly done hence there will be something unjust which is not yet a deed unjustly done unless the voluntary is added to it but i call a voluntary indeed as has been before observed that which a man does of things which it is in his power to do knowingly and not ignorantly viz not being ignorant of the circumstances of the action as for instance who it is he strikes and with what he strikes and on what account and when he does this neither from accident nor by compulsion as would be the case if some one taking his hand should strike another person with it for he would then not strike willingly because it was not in his power to avoid giving the blow it may happen however that he who is struck is a father but he who strikes him may merely know that he is a man or some one of those who are present but may be ignorant that it is his father a similar distinction also must be made in that for the sake of which a thing is done and concerning the whole action hence that which is not known or which is known indeed but is not in the power of him who acts or which he is compelled to do is done involuntarily for we both do and suffer many things which have a natural subsistence knowingly no one of which is either voluntary or involuntary such as to grow old or to die that which is accidental however similarly takes place in things unjust and just for if a man returns a deposit unwillingly and from fear he cannot be said either to perform a just deed or to act justly except from accident in a similar manner he who from compulsion and unwillingly does not return a deposit must be said to be unjust and to do an unjust deed from accident but of voluntary actions some indeed we perform with previous choice and others without previous choice with previous choice such as have been the subjects of previous deliberation but without it such as have not been deliberated on previously since therefore there are three kinds of harm in social communion those which are accompanied with ignorance are errors when a man neither apprehends who the person that is injured is nor the mode nor the instrument nor that for the sake of which the harm is done for in this case he will think either that he has not struck the person or not with this instrument or not this person or not on this account but something else happened different from what he expected thus one man may strike another not for the purpose of wounding but of stimulating him and in so doing may accidentally wound him or he may not strike the person whom he intended to strike or not in the way he intended when therefore harm is done unintentionally it is a misfortune but when it is done not unintentionally yet without vice it is an error for a man then errs when the principle of the cause is in himself but he is unfortunate when the principle is external to him when however harm is done knowingly but without previous deliberation it is a deed unjustly done as for instance whatever happens to men through anger or other passions which are necessary or natural for those who injure others and err through the influence of these passions act indeed unjustly and their deeds are unjustly done nevertheless they are not yet unjust on account of these actions nor depraved 
for the harm which they did was not through depravity but when a man injures another from deliberate choice he is unjust and depraved hence those deeds which are the effect of anger are well judged not to be the result of previous design for the principle of action is not in him who is angry but in him who excited his anger again when one man hurts another from anger there is no controversy about the deed as to its having been done but about the justice of it for anger is excited on account of apparent injustice for here there is no controversy about the existence of the thing as there is in contracts in which it is necessary that one of the contractors should be a depraved character unless his conduct is the effect of oblivion but acknowledging the fact they controvert the justice of it he however who hurts another person deliberately is not ignorant of the deed hence the one of these thinks he is injured but the other thinks he is not but he who does harm to another person from deliberate choice acts unjustly and he who injures another according to those deeds which are done unjustly is unjust when he acts contrary to proportion or to the equal in a similar manner also he is just when he acts justly from previous choice but he acts justly if he only acts willingly of involuntary actions however some deserve to be pardoned but others do not for such involuntary errors as are not only committed ignorantly but also through ignorance deserve to be pardoned but such as are not committed through ignorance but ignorantly yet from passion neither natural nor human do not deserve to be pardoned chapter nine it may however be doubted whether a distinction has been sufficiently made by us between being injured and injuring in the first place indeed if the thing is as euripides asserts it to be when he absurdly says quote, to speak briefly i may kill my mother both of us being willing or i being unwilling and she willing Close quote. for is it true or not that a person can be willingly injured or is every one unwillingly injured in the same manner as every one who does an injury does it willingly or do some persons suffer an injury voluntarily and others involuntarily and a similar inquiry may also be made with respect to obtaining justice for to act justly is wholly a voluntary thing hence the being injured and obtaining justice are deservedly opposed in a similar manner to each other so that they are either voluntary or involuntary it may however appear to be absurd that in obtaining justice the whole should be voluntary for some persons obtain justice unwillingly and this also may be doubted whether every one who suffers something unjust is injured or whether as it is in acting so it is in suffering for it is possible in both these to obtain what is just from accident and it is evident that the like also may take place in things unjust for it is not the same thing to do unjust things and to do an injury nor is it the same thing to suffer unjust things and to be injured the like also takes place in acting justly and obtaining justice for it is impossible to be injured unless there is some one who does the injury or to obtain justice unless there is some one who acts justly but if to do an injury is simply to hurt some one willingly and to hurt willingly is to do so knowing the person who is hurt and the instrument and the manner in which he is hurt but the intemperate man willingly hurts himself if this be the case he will be voluntarily injured and it will be possible for a man to injure himself this however is also one of the things which are dubious whether it is possible for a man to injure himself farther still a man may voluntarily through intemperance be injured by another person so that it will be possible for a man to be injured voluntarily or shall we say that the definition which we have given of doing an injury viz that it is to hurt some one voluntarily is not right but we must add the words to hurt knowing the person who is hurt and the instrument and the manner in which he is hurt contrary to his will a man therefore may be hurt and suffer unjust things willingly but no one is willingly injured for no one wishes to be injured not even the intemperate man but he acts contrary to his will for neither does any one wish for that which he does not fancy to be good but the intemperate man does that which he does not think ought to be done 
but he who gives what is his own, as Homer says, Glaucus gave to Diomede, quote, For Diomede's brass arms of mean device, for which nine oxen paid a vulgar price, he gave his own of gold divinely wrought, a hundred beeves the shining purchase bought. Close quote. Is not injured, for it is in his power to give, or not to give, but to be injured is not in his power, but it is necessary that the person should exist by whom the injury is done. Concerning the being injured, therefore, it is evident that it is not voluntary. Of those things, however, which we propose to discuss, two particulars remain to be explained. Whether he does an injury, who distributes to another person more than he deserves, or the person who receives the distribution. For, if what we before observed is possible, and he who distributes, but not he who possesses more, does the injury, if any one distributes to another more than to himself, knowingly and willingly, he will himself injure himself, which modest men appear to do. For a worthy man distributes less to himself than to others. Or shall we say that neither is this thing simple? For he who distributes less to himself than to others of certain good things will vindicate to himself more of some other good, if it should so happen, as, for instance, of renown, or of that which is simply beautiful in conduct. Again, the doubt is also dissolved from the definition of doing an injury. For he who does it suffers nothing contrary to his will. Hence he is not, on this account, injured, but, even admitting that he is, he is only hurt. It is also evident that he who distributes more than the receiver deserves does an injury, but not the receiver. For it is not the person in whom injustice is inherent who does the injury, but he to whom to do this is voluntary. But this is the man from whom the principle of the action proceeds, which is in the distributor, but not in the receiver. Farther still, since to act is predicated multifariously, and things inanimate in a certain respect kill, the band, as well as the servant by the command of his master, these indeed do not act injuriously, but they do unjust things. Again, if a man being indeed ignorant judges, he does not do an injury according to the legally just, nor is his judgment unjust, yet in a certain respect it is unjust. For the legally just differs from the first justice, or that which has a natural subsistence. But if he should judge unjustly, knowingly, he will vindicate to himself more either a favor or a vengeance. As, therefore, if some one should partake of a deed unjustly done, thus also he who on account of these things judges unjustly will possess more. For in those things, he who adjudges a field to another person receives in return not a field but money. Men, however, are of opinion that it is in their power to do an injury, and that on this account it is easy to be just. But it is not so. For to have connection with the wife of a neighbor, to strike another person, and to give money with the hand, are things easy, and in the power of those who do them. But to do these things with a certain disposition of mind is neither easy nor in the power of those who do them. In a similar manner, also, the multitude fancy that there is no portion of wisdom in knowing what is just and what is unjust, because it is not difficult to understand those things about which the laws speak. These things, however, are not just, except from accident, but they are then just when they are performed after a certain manner, and distributed after a certain manner. But this is a greater work than to know things that are salubrious. For there, indeed, it is easy to know honey and wine, and hellebore, and burning and cutting. But how it is necessary to distribute these, in order to produce health, and to whom, and when they are to be distributed, is as great a work as to be a physician. On this very account the multitude fancy that it is no less the province of a just man, than of an unjust man, to do an injury, because the just man is no less, but is even more able to do each of these, than the unjust man. For, according to them, a just man may have connection with the wife of another man, and may strike another person, and a brave man may throw away his shield, and, betaking himself to flight, may run where he pleases. To act cowardly, however, and to do an injury, is not merely to do these things, except from accident, but it consists in doing them with a certain disposition of mind, i.e., with promptitude and delight, just as to perform the office of a physician, 
and to restore to health does not merely consist in cutting or not cutting in giving or not giving medicine but in doing these after a certain manner but just things subsist among those with whom there is a participation of things which are simply good and in these there is also excess and defect for to some beings as perhaps to the gods justice is not a good because in them there is no excess or deficiency but to others as to men incurable and vicious no part of things simply good is beneficial but all of them are noxious and to others they are useful to a certain extent and on this account justice is a human good chapter ten it now follows that we should speak concerning equity and the equitable and show how equity indeed subsists with reference to justice and the equitable with reference to the just for to those who consider rightly the equitable appears to be neither simply the same nor yet different in genus from the just and at one time indeed we praise the equitable and the man of equity so that also transferring this name to other things we praise a man by calling him a more equitable instead of a good man manifesting by this that it is a better appellation but at another time to those who follow reason it appears to be absurd that the equitable if it is something different from the just should be laudable for either the just is not a worthy thing or the equitable is not just if it is different from the just or if they are both worthy things both are the same the doubt therefore concerning the equitable nearly happens through these particulars all these however are after a certain manner right and there is nothing in them which is contrary and adverse to itself for the equitable being something that is just is a better just thing and is not better than the just as if it were some other genus the just therefore and the equitable are the same thing and both of them being worthy things the equitable is the more excellent of the two a doubt however still remains that though the equitable is indeed just yet it is not the legally just but is a correction of it but the cause of this is that every law indeed is universal but it cannot speak universally with rectitude about certain particulars in those things therefore in which it is necessary to speak universally but in which this cannot be done rightly the law assumes that which happens for the most part not being ignorant of the fault which has been committed and in thus doing it acts no less rightly for the fault is not in the law nor in the legislator but in the nature of the thing for such directly is the matter of the thing which pertains to action when the law therefore speaks universally and something after this should happen besides then it is right to correct what the legislator has omitted and the error which he has committed in speaking simply since the legislator himself would adopt such correction if he were present and would have legally established this if he had known it hence the equitable is just and is better than a certain justice it is not however better than what is simply just but it is better than the justice which errs through speaking simply and generally and this is the nature of the equitable that it is a correction of law where law is deficient on account of speaking universally for this is the cause why all things are not according to law that concerning certain things it is impossible to establish a law hence a decree is necessary for of the indefinite the rule also is indefinite just as of a lesbian building the rule is leaden since the rule is bent conformable to the figure of the stone and does not remain the same thus also a decree is adapted to things themselves it is evident therefore what the equitable and the just are and what the justice is which the equitable excels it is likewise manifest from this who is an equitable man for he who deliberately chooses and practises things of this kind and who is not an accurate distributor of justice in the rigid sense of the word but remits something of the rigour of the law though the law is favourable to such rigour is an equitable man and the habit itself is equity being a certain justice and not a different habit chapter eleven from what has been said also it is evident whether it is possible for a man to injure himself or not for there are some just things established by law which pertain to the whole of virtue thus for instance the law does not order a man to destroy himself and it forbids what it does not command again when one man hurts another contrary to law who has not hurt him he does an injury willingly 
but he does an injury willingly who does it knowing the person whom he injures and the instrument and the manner in which he does it but he who destroys himself through anger does this willingly contrary to right reason which the law does not permit hence he does an injury but to whom is it not to the city but not to himself for he voluntarily suffers but no one is voluntarily injured hence also the city punishes him and a certain disgrace is attached to him who destroys himself as one who injures the city farther still it is not possible for a man to injure himself in that way in which he is unjust who only acts unjustly and is not entirely depraved for this character is different from him for the unjust man is in a certain respect so depraved as the timid man is but not as possessing the whole of depravity hence neither according to this improbity does he do himself an injury for if he did the same thing might be taken away and added at the same time to the same thing but this is impossible it is however necessary that the just and the unjust should always exist in more than one person again he who does an injury does it voluntarily and from deliberate choice and with a precedency in time for he who injures another because he has been injured by him does not appear to act unjustly but he who injures himself suffers and does the same things at the same time farther still a man would be injured willingly to which may be added that no one does an injury without a particular species of injustice but no one commits adultery with his own wife nor does any one dig through his own wall nor commit a theft on his own property in short the impossibility that a man should injure himself is evident from the conclusions made by us respecting the being voluntarily injured it is likewise evident that both to be injured and to injure are bad things for the one is to have less but the other more than the medium in the same manner as the salubrious in medicine and that which contributes to a good habit of body in the gymnastic art at the same time however it is worse to injure than to be injured for to do an injury is accompanied with vice and is blamable and with vice which is either perfect and simply vice or nearly so for not everything which is voluntary is accompanied with injustice but to be injured is without vice and injustice essentially therefore it is less bad to be injured than to do an injury but from accident nothing prevents it from being a greater evil art however pays no attention to this but it says that the pleurisy is a greater disease than a lame foot though it may happen that the latter may be a greater evil than the former if a man in consequence of being lame should fall and thus be taken by enemies and put to death metaphorically speaking however and from similitude the whole man is not just to the whole of himself but one part of him towards another part yet not according to every kind of justice but according to the despotic or economic for in these discussions it must be admitted that the rational differs from the irrational part of the soul and if we look to these it appears that there is a certain injustice of a man towards himself because it is possible in these parts for a man to suffer something adverse to his own appetites as therefore between a governor and him who is governed there is a certain justice towards each other this is also the case between these parts of the soul after this manner therefore we have discussed justice and the other ethical virtues End of Book 5 Recording in memory of Mitchell Edwards Book 6 of the Nicomachean Ethics This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Geoffrey Edwards. The Nicomachean Ethics by Aristotle. Translated by Thomas Taylor. Book 6. Chapter 1. Since, however, we have before observed that it is necessary the medium in conduct should be chosen, and neither excess nor deficiency, but the medium is to act as right reason prescribes, let us now consider what right reason is. For, in all the above-mentioned habits, as in other things, there is a certain scope, to which he who possesses reason, 
looking acts with intention and remission and there is a certain boundary of media which we say are situated between excess and defect and which exist conformably to right reason thus to speak however is indeed true but is not at all clear for in other pursuits also with which science is conversant it is indeed true to say that it is not proper to labour either more or less nor to be indolent but to labour moderately and as right reason prescribes he however who alone knows this will know nothing more as if on inquiring what kind of things are to be administered to the body it should be said they are such as medicine and he who possesses the medical art prescribe hence it is necessary with respect to the habits of the soul that this should not only be truly said but that it should also be definitely shown what right reason is and what is the definition of it but we have distributed the virtues of the soul and have said that some of them are ethical and others dianoetical or belonging to the discursive power of the soul with respect to the ethical virtues therefore we have indeed discussed them but with respect to the remaining virtues these we shall discuss after we have first spoken concerning the soul it has therefore been before observed by us that there are two parts of the soul that which possesses reason and that which is irrational but now we shall make a division after the same manner of the part which possesses reason and it must be admitted that there are two parts possessing reason one indeed by which we survey those kinds of beings the principles of which cannot subsist otherwise than they do and the other by which we survey things of a contingent nature for since the objects of knowledge are specifically different it follows that there are also different species of knowledge for it is necessary that knowledge should be similar to the thing known and that the knowledge of that which is necessary should be necessary but contingent of that which is contingent for all knowledge subsists according to similitude and affinity since it is a certain adaptation and contact of that which is known and that which knows but of these parts of the soul the one is called scientific but the other ratiocinative for to consult and reason are the same thing no one however consults about things which cannot subsist otherwise than they do so that the ratiocinative power is one certain part of the rational part of the soul it must therefore be shown what is the best habit of each of these for this is the virtue of each but virtue is referred to its proper work chapter two there are however three things in the soul which have dominion over action and truth viz sense intellect and appetite but of these sense is the principle of no one action which is evident from this that brutes have indeed sense but have no communion with action so as to have dominion over it what however affirmation and negation are in the discursive energy of the rational part that pursuit and avoidance are in appetite hence since ethical virtue is a habit accompanied with deliberate choice but deliberate choice is an appetite adapted to consultation hence it is necessary that reason should be true and the appetite right if the deliberate choice is good and that the one should assert and the other pursue the same things this discursive energy of the soul therefore by which we judge that something is to be desired is practical reason and practical truth but of the discursive energy of reason which is contemplative and neither practical nor effective the good and the evil are truth and falsehood for this is the work of the whole of the discursive power the work however of the practical and at the same time discursive energy of reason is truth subsisting in concord with right appetite the principle therefore of action whence motion is derived is deliberate choice though this principle is not the final cause of action but appetite and that reason which is for the sake of something or which is directed to the final cause are the principles of deliberate choice hence deliberate choice is not without intellect and the discursive energy of reason nor is it without the ethical habit for good conduct and the contrary to it in action are not without the discursive energy of reason and manners 
the discourse of energy however of reason itself does not move anything except that which is for the sake of something and is practical since this has dominion over that which is effective for every one who affects anything does it for the sake of something and that which is effected is not simply the end but is a relative and pertains to something though this is not the case with that which is practicable for good conduct is the end of action but appetite is directed to the end hence deliberate choice is either orectic intellect or appetite possessing a discourse of energy and man is a principle of this kind nothing however that has been done is an object of deliberate choice thus for instance no one deliberately chooses to subvert troy for neither does any one deliberate about what is past but about that which is future and contingent but it is not possible that what has been done should not be done hence agatho says rightly quote, all things to god are possible but one that to undo which is already done Close quote. of both the intellective parts therefore the work is truth hence those habits according to which each of these parts enunciates the truth are the virtues of both chapter three assuming therefore a more elevated exordium let us again speak concerning these virtues let therefore the habits by which the soul enunciates truth in affirming or denying be five in number but these are art science prudence wisdom and intellect for it is possible that both hypolepsis and opinion may assert what is false what science therefore is will be from hence evident if it is necessary to investigate accurately and not to follow similitudes for all of us are of opinion that it is not possible for that which we know scientifically to subsist otherwise than it does but with respect to things which may subsist otherwise of these when they are out of our view we are ignorant whether they exist or not the object of scientific knowledge therefore is from necessity hence it is eternal for all beings which are simply from necessity are eternal but things eternal are without generation and incorruptible again all science appears to be capable of being taught and the object of scientific knowledge may be obtained by discipline but all doctrine is produced from things previously known as we have said in the analytics for it partly subsists through induction and partly from syllogism induction therefore is indeed a principle and the principle of universal but syllogism is from universal the principles therefore from which syllogism consists are things of which there is no syllogism hence they are obtained by induction science therefore is indeed a demonstrative habit and such other things as we have added to the definition of it in the analytics for when a man believes that a thing is after a certain manner and the principles of it are known to him he has a scientific knowledge of that thing for if the principles are not more known to him than the conclusion he will have a scientific knowledge from accident let these things therefore be admitted concerning science chapter four of that however which may subsist otherwise than it does or which has a various subsistence and is contingent there is something which is effective and something which is practicable but production and action differ credibility however may be obtained concerning these things from exoteric discussions so that the practic habit in conjunction with reason is different from the effective or productive habit in conjunction with reason and neither are they contained by each other for neither is action affection nor is affection action but since the building art is a habit effective in conjunction with reason and neither is there any art which is not a habit effective in conjunction with reason nor any such habit which is not art art and habit effective in conjunction with true reason will be the same all art however is conversant with generation and machinates and contemplates in order that something may be produced which is capable either of existing or not existing and of which the principle is in the maker but not in the thing made 
for art neither belongs to things which necessarily are or are necessarily generated nor to things which have a natural subsistence for these contain in themselves the principle since however production and action are different it is necessary that art should pertain to production but not to action and after a certain manner fortune and art are conversant with the same things as also agatho says quote, art fortune loves and fortune art Close quote. art therefore as we have said is a certain habit effective in conjunction with true reason but the privation of art on the contrary or the inartificial habit is a habit effective in conjunction with false reason about that which may have a various subsistence chapter five with respect to prudence we shall apprehend what it is if we survey who those are whom we denominate prudent persons it appears therefore to be the province of a prudent man to be able to consult well about things which are good and advantageous to him not partially as about what contributes to health or strength but about what universally contributes to a happy life but this is indicated by our calling men prudent about anything when they reason well with a view to some worthy end in things in which there is no art so that in short he who is adapted to consultation will be a prudent man no one however consults about things which cannot subsist otherwise than they do nor about things which it is impossible for him to perform hence if science indeed subsists in conjunction with demonstration but of those things of which the principles may have a various subsistence of these there is no demonstration for all these are contingent and if it is not possible to consult about things which subsist from necessity prudence will neither be science nor art it will not be science because that which is practicable may have a various subsistence and it will not be art because the genus of action is different from the genus of production it remains therefore that it is a true habit in conjunction with reason practical about human good and evil for the end of production indeed is different from the production but the end of action is not always different from action hence we are of opinion that pericles and such like persons are prudent men because they are able to survey what is good for themselves and for mankind and we also think that economists and politicians are persons of this description hence also we call temperance by this name as preserving prudence but it preserves an opinion of this kind for the delectable and the painful do not corrupt or distort every opinion such as that a triangle has or has not angles equal to two right but those opinions which pertain to what is practicable for the principles indeed of practicable things are those things for the sake of which they are performed but to him who is corrupted through pleasure or pain the principle is not immediately apparent nor does he perceive that for the sake of this and through this it is necessary to choose and perform all things for vice is destructive of the principle hence it is necessary that prudence should be a habit in conjunction with true reason practical about human good moreover of art indeed there is a virtue but of prudence there is not and in art indeed he who voluntarily errs is to be preferred to him who errs involuntarily but in prudence he who voluntarily errs is a subordinate character in the same manner as in the virtues it is evident therefore that prudence is a certain virtue and not art but since there are two parts of the rational soul prudence will be the virtue of the doxastic part or that part which forms opinions of things for both opinion and prudence are conversant with that which may have a various subsistence nor yet is prudence a habit alone in conjunction with reason of which this is an indication that there may be an oblivion of such a habit i e it may be lost through oblivion but there cannot be of prudence chapter six since however science is an assent to universals and things which have a necessary subsistence but there are principles of things demonstrable and of every science for science is accompanied with reason this being the case there will neither be science nor art 
nor prudence of the principle of the object of science for the object of science is demonstrable but art and prudence are conversant with things which may have a various subsistence neither therefore will wisdom be that through which this principle is known for it is the province of a wise man to have demonstration about certain things hence if the habits by which we enunciate the truth and are never deceived about things which cannot or which can have a various subsistence are science and prudence wisdom and intellect but no one of these three can be the habit by which we know principles but by the three i mean prudence wisdom and science it remains that intellect is the habit by which principles are known chapter seven we attribute however wisdom in the arts to those who are most accurately skilled in the arts thus we say that phidias was a wise sculptor and polycletus a wise statuary here therefore we signify nothing else by wisdom than that it is the virtue of art but in short we think that certain persons are wise not partially and that they are not anything else than wise men as homer says in his margites quote, the gods nor minor him nor ploughman made nor wise in anything beside Close quote. so that it is evident that wisdom will be the most accurate of the sciences hence it is necessary that the wise man should not only know those things which are inferred from principles or the conclusions of scientific reasoning but that he should also perceive and enunciate the truth about principles themselves wisdom therefore will be intellect and science and will possess as a head or summit the science of the most honourable things i e of divine natures for it would be absurd for any one to fancy that the political science or prudence is a thing of all others the most excellent unless man is the best of everything the world contains if however what is salubrious and good is to man one thing and another to fishes but that which is white and that which is straight are always the same all men will acknowledge that a wise man is the same but the prudent man is a mutable character for they will say that the being is prudent who surveys what is excellent in particulars according to the nature of each and to him they will commit these particulars hence also they say that some brutes are prudent viz such as appear to have a providential power about what pertains to their life it is evident however that the political science and wisdom are not the same for if it should be said that wisdom is that which is conversant with what is useful to mankind there will be many kinds of wisdom since there is not one science which is conversant with the good of all animals but a different science is conversant with a different good unless indeed there is one medical science which extends to all beings nor is it of any consequence if it should be said that man is the most excellent of all other animals for there are many animals naturally more divine than man such as those most apparent beings from which the world is composed from what has been said therefore it is evident that wisdom is the science and intellect of things most honourable by nature hence the multitude say that anaxagoras and thales and such like persons were indeed wise but not prudent men in consequence of perceiving that they were ignorant of what was advantageous to them with respect to a corporeal life and they say that they knew indeed things superfluous and admirable difficult and divine but which are useless because they did not investigate human good prudence however is conversant with human affairs and with those things which are the subjects of consultation for we say that this is especially the work of a prudent man to consult well but no one consults about things which cannot subsist otherwise than they do nor about things of which there is not a certain end and this practical good he however simply consults well who conjectures by a reasoning process what is best to man among practicable things nor is prudence only directed to universals but it is also necessary that it should know particulars for it is practical but action is conversant with particulars hence also some persons who have only experimental knowledge without science are more adapted for practical affairs than those who possess a scientific knowledge without experience for he who knows that light flesh is easily concocted but is ignorant what flesh is light will not produce health 
but he will rather produce it who knows that the flesh of birds is light and salubrious prudence however is practical so that it is necessary to possess both viz a knowledge of what is to be done universally and in particular circumstances or rather the latter than the former but prudence here also i e among the practical powers will be a certain architectonic power or a power belonging to a master art chapter eight the political science however and prudence are indeed the same habit though they have not the same essence but of the science pertaining to a city the one part which is legislative is as it were architectonic prudence but the other in the same manner as particulars is denominated by a common name the political science this however is practical and occupied in consultation for a decree is a thing practicable as the extreme hence those alone who possess the political science are said to act in a political capacity for they alone act in the same manner as manual artificers that also appears to be especially prudence which a man employs about himself and about one thing and this is called by a common name prudence but of these species of prudence the one is economy another legislation and another the political science and of this last one part pertains to consultation but another is judicial for a man therefore to know his own concerns will be one species of knowledge nevertheless it possesses a great difference and he who knows things pertaining to himself and is conversant with them appears to be a prudent man but those who apply themselves to the management of public affairs are busily employed in a multitude of concerns hence also euripides says quote, how can the name of wise to me belong who might have mingled in the martial throng and vexed with business and exempt from care taking of spoils my honourable share yet chose by over anxious thought to move the direful hate of all commanding jove Close quote. for these men explore what is good for themselves and are of opinion that it is necessary to do this from this opinion therefore it comes to pass that these men are prudent though perhaps it is not possible for a man to know his own concerns without economic and political prudence again how a man ought to manage his own affairs is a thing immanifest and requires consideration but as an indication of the truth of what has been said a youth may become a geometrician and a mathematician and may be skilled in things of this kind but it does not appear that he will be prudent the cause however of this is that prudence pertains to particulars which become known from experience but youth is without experience which is produced by length of time since this also deserves to be considered why a boy may become a mathematician but cannot be wise or a physiologist shall we say it is because mathematical objects subsist by an ablation from matter but the principles of the objects of wisdom and physiology are derived from experience and with respect to metaphysical principles indeed youth do not believe in but admit them but with respect to mathematical principles it is not immanifest what they are farther still error in consultation either pertains to universals or particulars for in order that a man may not drink heavy and therefore bad water it is requisite that he should know either that all heavy water is bad or that this particular water is heavy but it is evident that prudence is not science for it pertains to the extreme as we have before observed since that which is practicable is a thing of this kind it is therefore indeed opposed to intellect for intellect is conversant with terms i e universals which are the extremes upward and above which there are no other principles but prudence is conversant with the extremes downward which are particulars of which there is no science but only a sensible perception and this is not a sensible perception of peculiarities but such as that by which we perceive in mathematics that a triangle is the extreme for we stop there it is therefore rather this sense which is prudence but of that there is another species chapter nine to investigate however and to consult differ 
for to consult is to investigate something but it is necessary to discuss good consultation and show what it is whether it is a certain science or opinion or good conjecture or some other genus it is not therefore science for men do not investigate about things which they know but good consultation is a certain consultation and he who consults investigates and reasons neither is it good conjecture for good conjecture is without reasoning and is something which is accomplished with celerity but men consult for a long time and say that the objects of consultation ought to be performed rapidly but that consultation should be done slowly again sagacity and good consultation also differ from each other but sagacity is a certain good conjecture neither therefore is any good consultation opinion but since he who consults badly errs but he who consults well consults rightly it is evident that good consultation is a certain rectitude nor is good consultation either science or opinion for of science indeed there is no rectitude because there is no error but truth is the rectitude of opinion and at the same time everything of which there is an opinion is definite and determined nevertheless good consultation is not without reasoning it falls short therefore of dianoia or the discursive energy of reason for this is not yet enunciation since opinion is not investigation but is now a certain enunciation he however who consults whether he consults well or ill investigates something and reasons but good consultation is a certain rectitude of consultation on which account it must in the first place be inquired what consultation is and with what it is conversant since however rectitude is multifariously predicated it is evident that not every rectitude is good consultation for the incontinent and the bad man obtain from reasoning that which they propose to see so that they will have consulted rightly but have procured for themselves a great evil but to have consulted well appears to be a certain good for such a rectitude of consultation as becomes the mean of obtaining good is good consultation good however may be obtained by false reasoning and a man indeed may obtain that which ought to be done yet not through a proper medium but the middle term may be false hence neither will that be good consultation according to which that is obtained which ought to be obtained yet not through a proper medium further still it is possible that one man may obtain the object of his wishes by consulting for a long time but another by consulting rapidly hence neither is that yet good consultation but the rectitude which subsists according to utility and to what is proper and as and when it is proper again it is possible simply to consult well and also with a view to a certain end good consultation therefore simply is that which proceeds with rectitude to an end simply but a certain good consultation is that which proceeds with rectitude to a certain end hence if to consult well is the province of prudent men good consultation will be a rectitude according to utility with a view to a certain end of which prudence is the true hypothesis chapter ten intelligence however and the privation of intelligence according to which we denominate men intelligent or unintelligent is neither wholly the same with science or opinion for if it were all men would be intelligent nor is intelligence some one of the particular sciences such as medicine for it would be conversant with health or geometry for it would be conversant with magnitudes for neither is intelligence conversant with things which always are and are immovable nor with things which are passing into existence but with those which may be the subject of doubt and consultation hence it is conversant with the same things as prudence yet intelligence and prudence are not the same for prudence indeed is of a commanding nature for the end of it is what ought or what ought not to be done but intelligence is alone of a judiciary nature for intelligence is the same as right intelligence since intelligent men are also rightly intelligent intelligence however is neither the possession nor the acquisition of prudence but as he who learns is said to understand what he learns when he uses science the like also takes place in the use of opinion in forming a judgment of those things with which prudence is conversant 
and judging of them well, when another person is speaking. For what is well is the same with what is beautifully done, and hence the name intelligence was derived, according to which men are said to be rightly intelligent, viz. from intelligence in learning. For we frequently use the verb to learn as equivalent to the verb to understand. Chapter 11. But what is called upright decision, according to which we say that men decide rightly, is the right judgment of the equitable man. As an indication of this, however, we say that the equitable man is especially inclined to pardon others, and that it is equitable to pardon certain things. But pardon is an upright judiciary decision of the equitable man, and the decision is upright which is made by a man observant of truth. All these habits, however, reasonably tend to the same thing. For we speak of upright decision, intelligence, prudence, and intellect with reference to the same persons, when we say that they are men of upright decision, are endued with intellect, are prudent and intelligent. For all these powers pertain to the extremes downward, and to particulars. And an intelligent man, and one who decides rightly, or a man disposed to pardon, will be one who possesses a judiciary power about things with which the prudent man is conversant. For things of an equitable nature are common to all good men, in their intercourse with others. Everything, however, of a practicable nature pertains to particulars, and the downward extremes. For it is necessary that a prudent man should have a knowledge of these, and intelligence and equitable decision are conversant with things of a practicable nature, but these are extremes, and intellect pertains both to the upward and downward extremes. For intellect, and not the discourse of energy of reason, is conversant with both first and last terms, i.e. with universal principles. The one indeed, i.e. the intellect, which is the principle of the demonstrative sciences, is conversant with immutable and first terms. But the intellect, which is occupied in practical affairs, or which is the principle of prudence, is conversant with the extreme, and with that which is contingent, and the other proposition. For these are the principles of that for the sake of which a thing is done, or the final cause. For universal is from particulars. Of these, therefore, it is necessary to have a sensible perception, but this is the practical intellect. Hence, these habits appear to be natural, and no one indeed is wise by nature, but every one possesses naturally the power of deciding rightly, together with intelligence and intellect. But, as an indication of this, we are of opinion that these habits are attendants on the ages of the life of men, and we say that this age, i.e., old age, possesses intellect and upright decision, as if nature were the cause of this. Hence, also, intellect is both the principle and the end. For from these demonstrations are framed, and with these they are conversant. Hence, in practical affairs, it is no less necessary to attend to the undemonstrated assertions and opinions of elderly or prudent men, than to demonstrations. For, in consequence of possessing an eye from experience, they perceive the principles of things of a practicable nature. And thus we have shown what wisdom and prudence are, and with what particulars each is conversant, and that each is the virtue of a different part of the soul. Chapter 12. Some one, however, may doubt concerning these, in what their utility consists. For wisdom, indeed, contemplates none of those things from which men will obtain felicity, since it is not conversant with anything which is in generation, or which is becoming to be, or passing into existence. But prudence, indeed, does consider those things from which human felicity is derived. Yet on what account is it necessary that it should, since prudence is conversant with just and beautiful things, and which are good to man? We do not, however, become at all more practically virtuous by knowing these things, since the virtues are habits, as neither are things said to be salubrious, or to conduce to a good habit of body, because they have an active power, but because they proceed from habit. For we are not at all more practical from possessing the medical or gymnastic art. But if a man is not to be considered as prudent for the sake of these things, but for the sake of becoming worthy, they will not be at all useful to those who are worthy. Again, neither will prudence be useful to those who are not worthy, 
for it is of no consequence whether they are prudent or are persuaded by others that are since this will be sufficient in the same manner as in what pertains to health for when we wish to be well we do not at the same time learn the medical art to which we may add that it will appear to be absurd that prudence which is subordinate to wisdom should possess a greater authority for that which is effective governs and presides in everything these things therefore must be discussed for now the doubt is concerning them alone in the first place therefore we say that these virtues wisdom and prudence are necessarily eligible per se since they are the virtues of each part of the soul though neither of them should affect anything in the next place they do indeed affect something yet not in the same manner as medicine produces health but as health produces the energies of a good habit of body thus also wisdom produces felicity for being a part of the whole of virtue by the possession and the energy of it it renders a man happy farther still the work is accomplished by prudence and ethical virtue for virtue renders the scope proposed by the agent right but prudence gives rectitude to things which tend to the scope a virtue however of this kind does not belong to the fourth or nutritive part of the soul because its energies are not in our power nor are rational either essentially or by participation but with respect to our not being at all more adapted to the practice of things beautiful and just through prudence in answer to this objection we must begin a little higher assuming the following principle for as we say that certain persons who perform just things are not yet just such as those who do what is ordered by the laws either unwillingly or from ignorance or from some other cause and not on account of the things themselves though they do those things which ought to be done and such as a worthy man ought to do thus also as it seems it is possible to do everything with a certain disposition of mind so as to be a good man i mean for instance that it is possible to do everything with which virtue is concerned from deliberate choice and for the sake of the things which are done virtue therefore produces a right deliberate choice but it is not the business of virtue but of some other power to render the deliberate choice disposed to embrace what truly contributes to the end it is requisite however to speak more clearly on this subject there is therefore a certain power which is called skill but this is a power of such a kind that by its assistance those things may be performed and obtained which contribute to the proposed scope and if indeed the scope is beautiful this power is laudable but if the scope is bad this power becomes craft on which account also we say that prudent men are skilful and not crafty prudence however is not this power yet does not subsist without it but habit is not acquired by this eye of the soul without virtue as we have said and is evident for the syllogisms of practical affairs rank as a principle since the end is a thing of this kind and that which is best whatever it may be let the end for instance be something casual but this is not apparent except to a good man for depravity distorts the judgment and produces deception about the practical principles hence it is evident that it is impossible for any one to be a prudent unless he is a good man chapter thirteen again therefore let us direct our attention to virtue for as prudence is not the same indeed but is similar to sagacity thus also natural virtue subsists similarly with reference to that which is properly so called for the several manners appear to all men to subsist in a certain respect naturally since we are just and temperate and brave and possess the other virtues immediately from our birth at the same time however we investigate something else as that which is properly good and are of opinion that such like virtues are inherent after another manner for the physical habits are inherent in children and brutes but they are seen to be noxious without intellect thus much indeed is apparent that as it happens that a strong body which is moved without sight very much errs in its motions in consequence of being deprived of sight this likewise is the case here with respect to the physical virtues but if the possessor of these virtues obtains intellect also he will excel in his actions the habit however being similar will then be properly virtue hence as in the doxastic part of the soul 
or that part which is characterized by opinion, there are two species, skill and prudence. Thus also, in the ethical part there are two species, one of which is physical virtue, but the other is virtue properly so called. And of these, virtue properly so called is not without prudence. Hence it is said that all the virtues are prudence. And Socrates, indeed, investigated partly with rectitude and partly with error. For, because he thought that all the virtues are prudences, he erred. But it is well said by him that the virtues are not without prudence. But, as an indication of this, all men now, when they define virtue, add to the definition habit, and that they energize according to right reason. And right reason is that which subsists according to prudence. All men, therefore, appear in a certain respect to prophesy that a habit of this kind, which subsists according to prudence, is virtue. It is necessary, however, to change in a small degree the definition, for not only a habit according to right reason, but also a habit in conjunction with right reason, is virtue. But prudence is right reason, energizing about things of this kind. Socrates, therefore, thought that the virtues indeed were reasons, because all of them are sciences, but we think that they subsist in conjunction with reason. Hence it is evident from what has been said that it is not possible to be a good man properly without prudence, nor a prudent man without ethical virtue. After this manner also the reasoning may be dissolved, by which some one may contend that the virtues are separated from each other, for the same person is not naturally well adapted to all the virtues. Hence, he has now obtained this, but not yet that virtue. For this may, indeed, happen according to the physical virtues, but is not possible in those virtues, according to which a man is said to be simply a good man. For all the virtues are present, at the same time that prudence, which is one virtue, is present. But it is evident that though prudence were not a practical thing, it would be necessary, because it is the virtue of a part of the soul, and because deliberate choice will not be right without prudence, nor without virtue, for one of these is the end, but the other causes us to do things which contribute to the end. Prudence, however, neither has dominion over wisdom, nor over the better part of the soul, as neither has the medical science dominion over health, for it does not use health, but considers how it may be obtained. It prescribes, therefore, for the sake of health, but has no dominion over it, Again, to say that prudence rules over wisdom is just as if some one should say that the political science rules over the gods because it orders everything which is done in the city. End of Book 6 Recording in memory of Mitchell Edwards Book 7 of the Nicomachean Ethics. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Nicomachean Ethics by Aristotle. Translated by Thomas Taylor. Chapter 1. After these things, making another beginning, it must be observed by us that there are three species of things which are to be avoided in manners, viz. vice, incontinence, and brutality. But the contraries to two of these are indeed evident. For we call one of the contraries virtue, and the other continence. To brutality, however, it will be most appropriate to say that the virtue is opposed, which is a certain heroical and divine virtue, as Homer represents Priam saying of Hector that he was a very good man. Quote, Wretch that I am, my bravest offspring slain, you, the disgrace of Priam's house, remain. Mestor the brave, renowned in ranks of war, with Troilus, dreadful in his rushing car. And last, great Hector, more than man divine, for sure he seemed not of terrestrial line. Close quote. Hence, if, as it is said, men from being men become gods through excess of virtue the habit which is opposed to a brutal habit will indeed be such as this for as there is neither the vice nor virtue of a brute so neither is there of a god but the one habit indeed is more honourable than virtue 
and the other is of a different genus from vice since however the existence of a divine man is rare bracket just as the lacedaemonians when they very much admire a man are accustomed to say o oh, divine man Close bracket. thus also the brutal nature is rare among men but when it does exist it is principally found among the barbarians some men however become brutalized through diseases and mutilations of the body and we thus denominate by a defamatory appellation those who surpass other men in vice but of such a disposition of the soul as this we shall hereafter make mention and we have before spoken concerning vice let us now therefore speak concerning incontinence and effeminacy and luxury and concerning their opposites continence and endurance for each of these must not be considered as if they were the same habits with virtue and vice nor yet as if they were of a genus different from them it is necessary however as we have done in other things having first premised what is apparent i e what is commonly admitted as true and proposed doubts in the next place to show everything which is especially probable about these passions but if not everything at least the greater part and the principle for if such doubts as are difficult are dissolved and those things which are probable are left we shall have sufficiently accomplished our purpose continence therefore and endurance appear to be among the number of worthy and laudable things but incontinence and effeminacy among the number of things bad and blamable and the continent man and he who abides in the decision of reason are the same person and the incontinent man is the same with him who departs from the decision of reason and the incontinent man indeed knowing that the things are bad does them through passion but the continent man knowing that desires are bad does not follow them in consequence of being obedient to reason and all men indeed admit that the temperate man is continent and possesses the virtue of endurance but with respect to a man of this description some say that he is in every respect temperate but others say that he is not and some confusedly say that the intemperate man is incontinent and the incontinent man is intemperate but others say that they differ from each other but with respect to the prudent man sometimes they say that he cannot be incontinent and sometimes that certain persons who are prudent and skilful are incontinent and farther still men are said to be incontinent of anger of honour and of gain such therefore are the assertions concerning continence and incontinence chapter two it may however be doubted how he who thinks rightly can act incontinently some say therefore that it is impossible for a man to act incontinently who knows that he ought not for it would be a dreadful thing when science is inherent as socrates thought that anything else should have dominion and draw the man about like a slave for socrates in short opposed reason by this opinion as if there were no such thing as incontinence since he said that no one acted contrary to what he apprehended it was best to do except from ignorance of what was best this assertion therefore is adverse to those things which are clearly apparent and it is requisite to inquire concerning the passion if any one acts incontinently through ignorance what the mode of this ignorance is for it is evident that he who acts incontinently does not think he ought so to act till he is under the influence of the passion there are however certain persons who admit some of these things but not others for they grant indeed that nothing is better than science but they do not admit that no one acts contrary to what appears to him to be better and on this account they say that the incontinent man not having science but opinion is vanquished by pleasures if however it is opinion and neither science nor a strong but a weak hypolepsis which resists as it is in those who are dubious pardon is to be granted to him who yields to strong desires 
but improbity is not to be pardoned nor anything else which is blamable the incontinent man therefore is vanquished by desire prudence at the same time resisting for this is most strong but this is absurd for the same person will be at the same time prudent and incontinent no one however will say that it is the province of a prudent man to perform voluntarily the most base actions to which may be added what we have before shown that the prudent is a practical man for he is conversant with particulars and possesses the other virtues again if the continent man consists in having strong and base desires the temperate man will not be a continent man nor the continent a temperate man for it is not the province of the temperate man to have too much desire or to have base desires but it would be requisite that he should if this were admitted for if indeed the desires are good the habit which prevents a man from following them is bad so that not all continents will be good if however the desires are weak but not bad there is nothing venerable in continence and if they are bad and weak there is nothing great in it farther still if continence gives permanency to every opinion and even to false opinion it is a bad thing and if incontinence produces a departure from every opinion there will be a certain incontinence which is good such as that of neoptolemus in the philoctetes of sophocles for he is to be praised for not persevering in what he was persuaded to do by ulysses because it was painful to him to lie again that reasoning of the sophists which is denominated lying or dissembling is perplexed with doubt for with these men in consequence of wishing to produce an assent to paradoxes in order that when they obtain their end they may appear to be skilful persons the syllogism formed by their reasoning becomes very dubious for the discursive energy of reason is bound when the person whose assent they wish to procure is unwilling to persist because the conclusion does not please him but is unable to proceed because he cannot dissolve the argument from a certain reason however it may happen that imprudence together with incontinence is a virtue for a man through incontinence may do the contrary to what he apprehends ought to be done but he apprehends that good things are evil and that they ought not to be done hence he will do what is good and not what is evil again he who performs and pursues what is delectable in consequence of being persuaded and deliberately choosing so to do will appear to be a better character than the man who does so not from reasoning but from incontinence for he may be more easily cured because he may be induced to change his opinion but the incontinent man is obnoxious to the proverb in which we say quote, when water suffocates what occasion is there to drink Close quote. for if indeed he were persuaded to do what he did if he had been induced to change his opinion he would have desisted but now not being persuaded he nevertheless acts in this manner farther still if incontinence and continence are conversant with all things who is the man that is simply incontinent for no one has every species of incontinence and we say that some persons are simply incontinent such therefore are the doubts which happen on this subject but of these it is necessary to take away some and to leave others for the solution of a doubt is the discovery of what is investigated chapter three in the first place therefore it must be considered whether the incontinent act knowingly or not and in what manner they act knowingly in the next place with what kind of things the incontinent and the continent man are conversant i mean whether they are conversant with all pleasure and pain or with certain definite pleasures and pains and whether the continent and the enduring man are the same or different characters and in a similar manner we must consider such other things as are allied to this theory the beginning however 
of the speculation is whether the continent and incontinent man differ in the things with which they are conversant or in the mode in which they are conversant with them my meaning is this whether the incontinent man is alone incontinent or not because he is conversant with these particular things or whether it is because he is thus affected or not or whether it is from both of these in the next place whether incontinence and continence are conversant with all things or not for he who is simply incontinent is not conversant with all things but with those things with which the intemperate man is conversant nor is he denominated incontinent from being simply affected towards these for if he were incontinence would be the same with intemperance but from being affected towards them in this particular manner for the intemperate man indeed is led by his desires from deliberate choice thinking that it is always necessary to pursue the present delight but the incontinent man does not think this is necessary yet pursues it with respect therefore to the assertion that it is true opinion and not science through which men act incontinently it is of no consequence to the present discussion for some of those who form opinions of things entertain no doubt of their truth but think that they know accurately if therefore those who form an opinion act in a greater degree contrary to their opinion than those who have a scientific knowledge because they believe negligently science will in no respect differ from opinion for some persons believe no less firmly in things of which they form an opinion than others in things which they know scientifically but this is evident from heraclitus since however we say that a man knows scientifically in a twofold respect for both he who possesses science indeed but does not use it and he who uses it are said to have scientific knowledge it makes a difference whether a man possessing science but not contemplating does what he ought not to do or whether possessing science and contemplating he acts improperly for this appears to be absurd but it is not if he does not contemplate again since there are two modes of propositions i e universal and particular propositions nothing hinders but that he who possesses both these may act contrary to science using indeed the universal proposition but not the particular one for particulars are practicable there is a difference also as to the universal for one difference indeed is in the man himself but the other is in the thing thus for instance a man may know that dry food is beneficial to every man and that this person is a man or that a thing of such a kind is dry food but whether this is a thing of such a kind he either does not know or he does not energize as if he did know there is an immense difference therefore according to these modes so that no absurdity follows for a man thus to know but for him to know in any other way it would be wonderful farther still science may be inherent in men in a way different from that which we have just now mentioned for we see that habit differs in possessing indeed but not using science so that a man possesses in a certain respect and does not possess science as is the case with him who is asleep or insane or intoxicated but in this way men are disposed who are under the influence of the passions for anger and the desire of venereal pleasures and certain other things of this kind evidently produce a change in the body and in some persons also they produce insanity it is manifest therefore that the incontinent man must be said to be affected similarly to these persons nor is it any indication of the contrary if such persons utter sentences which are the progeny of science for those who are under the influence of these passions will recite demonstrations and the verses of empedocles and those who first learn a science connect indeed the words but do not yet know their meaning for it is necessary that science should increase with advancing age but this requires time 
hence it must be admitted that the incontinent speak after the manner of players i e without attending to the meaning of what they say again the cause of this may also be physically surveyed as follows opinion indeed is either universal or particular of which latter sense is now the mistress but when one reason is produced from both these it is necessary that so far as pertains to theory the soul should enunciate the conclusion but so far as pertains to practice should immediately act thus for instance if every sweet thing ought to be tasted but this thing is sweet as being some one of particulars it necessarily follows that he who is able and is not impeded must at the same time that he says this act i e taste the sweet thing when therefore the universal proposition is indeed inherent which prohibits a thing from being tasted but another proposition says that everything which is sweet is delectable and another that this particular thing is sweet and this causes the man to energize and when also desire happens to be inherent then the universal proposition indeed says this thing is to be avoided but desire leads to the fruition of it for each of the parts of the soul is able to move or excite hence it happens that a man acts incontinently both from reason in a certain respect and opinion though opinion is not essentially but from accident contrary to reason for desire but not opinion is contrary to right reason hence on this account also brutes are not incontinent because they have not a perception of universal but an imagination and memory of particulars with respect to the manner however in which ignorance is dissolved and the incontinent man again becomes in possession of scientific knowledge the reasoning is the same as concerning him who is intoxicated or asleep and is not peculiar to this passion but the explanation of it must be obtained from physiologists because however the last proposition is the opinion of the sensible object and is the mistress of actions he who is under the influence of passion either has not this proposition or he has it in such a way that from possessing he has not a scientific knowledge of it but merely enunciates it just as he who is intoxicated recites the verses of empedocles and likewise because the last proposition is not universal and does not appear to be similarly scientific with the proposition which is universal that also which socrates investigated appears in this case to happen for the passion is not produced when that which is science properly so called is seen to be present nor is this science drawn about so as to cooperate with passion but this must be asserted of the sensitive power and thus much concerning the knowledge and ignorance of the incontinent man and how he may act incontinently accompanied with knowledge chapter four but whether any one is simply incontinent or all that are incontinent are partially so and if there is any one who is simply incontinent what the things are with which he is conversant must in the next place be shown by us that the continent therefore and men of endurance and the incontinent and effeminate are conversant with pleasures and pains is evident of those things however which produce pleasure some indeed are necessary but others though they are eligible of themselves yet have excess but necessaries indeed are things which have reference to the body i mean such things as pertain to food and the use of venereal pleasures and such like corporeal concerns about which we place intemperance and temperance other things however are not indeed necessary yet are eligible of themselves i mean such as victory honour wealth and such like good and delectable things those therefore who exceed in these contrary to the right reason which is in them we do not indeed denominate simply incontinent but 
with an addition we call them incontinent of riches of gain of honour and of anger but we do not call them simply incontinent as being different from those that are so and denominated from similitude just as the name of a certain person who was victorious in the olympic games was anthropos i e man for he had as a proper the common name of man and yet at the same time he was different from man universal or the species man as being an individual as an indication of this incontinence indeed is blamed not only as an error but also as a certain vice either simply or partially but no one blames those who are incontinent of honour or gain etc as simply bad with respect however to those who are conversant with corporeal enjoyments with which we say the temperate and intemperate man are conversant he who without deliberate choice pursues the excesses of delectable and avoids the excesses of painful things viz hunger and thirst heat and cold and everything pertaining to the touch and the taste yet contrary to deliberate choice and the reasoning power is called incontinent not with an addition of this or that thing as of anger but he is only simply called incontinent but as an indication of this those who are conversant with the one are called effeminate but not those who are conversant with the other hence we arrange the incontinent and intemperate and also the continent and temperate man in the same class but not those who are incontinent of honour or gain etc because they are in a certain respect conversant with the same pleasures and pains though however they are conversant with the same things yet not after the same manner for the intemperate indeed pursue depraved pleasures from deliberate choice but the incontinent do not hence we rather call him intemperate who either not at all desiring or desiring slightly pursues excessive pleasures and avoids moderate pains than him who pursues the one and avoids the other in consequence of being influenced by vehement desire for what would the former character do if he were impelled by robust desire and suffered violent pain from the want of necessary things since however of desires and pleasures some rank in the genus of things beautiful and worthy for of things delectable some are naturally eligible others are contrary to these and others have an intermediate subsistence agreeably to the division we have before made and these last are such as riches gain victory and honour in all these therefore and things of the like kind and in those that have an intermediate subsistence men are not blamed for being merely influenced by the passions and for desiring and loving but for the manner in which they are influenced by them and for indulging them to excess hence with respect to those who are vanquished by the passions or pursue anything naturally beautiful and good contrary to reason such as those who pursue honour more than is proper or are irrationally attached to their parents and children for these also rank among the number of things that are good and those who pay attention to these are praised yet there is at the same time a certain excess even in these things if any one like niobe contends about them even with the gods or like satyrus who for his attachment to his father was called philopator for he appeared through this attachment to be very infatuated there is therefore no depravity indeed in these things for the reason already assigned because each of these things is naturally eligible of itself but the excesses of them are bad and are to be avoided this however is not the case with incontinence for incontinence is not only to be avoided but is also among the number of blamable things but from the similitude of the passion in speaking about each of these it is usual to add the term incontinence just as we say that a man is a bad physician or a bad player whom we should not simply call a bad man as therefore 
we do not here call these simply bad men, because each of these is not a vice, but similar to vice from analogy, so likewise there, viz, in the immoderate pursuit of honor, gain, etc., those things only are to be considered as incontinence and continence, which are conversant with the same things as temperance and intemperance. But with respect to incontinence and anger, we speak of it from similitude. Hence also, by making an addition, we say that a man is incontinent of anger, just as we say that he is incontinent of honor or gain. Chapter 5. Since, however, some things are naturally delectable, and of these some are simply so, but others to the genera of animals and men, but other things are not naturally delectable. But some things are pleasing in consequence of mutilations, and others are so, partly from custom, and partly from depraved natures. This being the case, similar habits may be perceived in each of these. But by savage habits, I mean such a habit as that of the woman who is said to have cut open the bellies of pregnant women, and to have devoured the fetus, or such habits as certain savage nations about Pontus are said to possess, for of these some are delighted to feed on raw, and others on human flesh, and others at banquets feast each other with their own children. Or such a habit as Phalaris is said to have possessed, for he is reported to have eaten his own son. These habits, therefore, are savage. Some of these habits, however, are produced in certain persons from disease and insanity, as was the case with him who immolated and ate his mother, and also with him who ate the liver of his fellow servant. But other savage habits either originate from disease or from custom, such as evulsions of the hairs, biting the nails, and besides these eating coals and earth, to which may be added the venereal connection of males with males. For these habits are produced in some persons by nature, but in others from custom, as being accustomed to them from childhood. No one, therefore, would call those in whom nature is the cause of these habits incontinent as neither are women called incontinent, because in the venereal connection they are not active, but passive. And, in a similar manner, those are not called incontinent, who are in a diseased condition from custom. The possession, therefore, of each of these is something beyond the boundaries of vice, in the same manner as a savage nature. But, when possessing these propensities to subdue or be subdued by them, is not simple continence or incontinence, but is only so from similitude, just as he who subsists after this manner with respect to anger is incontinent of this passion, but passion is not to be called incontinent. For every vice, folly, timidity, intemperance, and ferocity, when excessive, is either savage or the effect of disease. For he who is naturally so disposed as to be afraid of everything, even though a mouse should make a noise, is timid according to a savage timidity. But he who is afraid of a cat is timid from disease. And among the number of the stupid, those who are most irrational from nature, and live only from sense, resemble savage animals, as is the case with some nations of remote barbarians. But those who are so from disease, such as epilepsy, or insanity, these are in a morbid state. It is, however, possible that some one may sometimes possess these habits, and yet not be vanquished by them. I mean, as if, for instance, Phalaris, desiring to eat his son, should refrain from so doing, or should abstain from absurd venereal pleasure. And it is not only possible to have these propensities, but also to be vanquished by them. As, therefore, with respect to depravity, that which pertains to a man is simply said to be depravity, but that which subsists with an addition is said to be a savage or diseased depravity, but is not simple depravity, after the same manner with respect to incontinence. It is evident that one kind is savage, but another the effect of disease, while that alone is simply incontinence which subsists according to human intemperance. 
It is evident, therefore, that incontinence and continence are alone conversant with those things with which intemperance and temperance are conversant, and that another species of incontinence subsists about other things, which is denominated metaphorically, and not simply. Chapter 6. Let us, however, now consider whether the incontinence of anger is not less base than the incontinence of desires. For anger, indeed, seems to hear something of reason, but to hear it negligently, just like hasty servants who run away before they have heard the whole of what is said to them, and thus err in the performance of what they are ordered to do, or like dogs who bark at a noise alone, before they perceive whether he who makes it is a friend or not. Thus also anger, through the heat and celerity of its nature, hears indeed reason, but does not hear its mandates, in consequence of impetuously tending to vengeance. For reason, indeed, or the imagination, renders it evident that something has been done attended with insolence or contempt. But anger, as if syllogistically concluding that it is necessary to be hostile to one who has acted in this manner, is immediately enraged. Desire, however, if sense or reason corrupted by sense, only says that a thing is delectable, rushes to the enjoyment of it. Hence, anger, in a certain respect, follows reason, but desire does not. Desire, therefore, is more base than anger. For he who is incontinent of anger is, after a manner, vanquished by reason. But he who is incontinent of desire is subdued by desire, and not by reason. Again, it is more pardonable to follow the natural appetites, since such desires, as are common to all men, are more pardonable, and so far as they are common. But anger and asperity are more natural than desires which are excessive, and which are not necessary. Thus one who was accused of striking his father said, as an apology for it, that his own father, and even his grandfather, committed the same fault. And pointing to his child, he likewise said, He will strike me when he becomes a man, for this is a family failing. A certain person also, being dragged about by his son, ordered him to stop at the gates of his house, for he likewise had dragged his father as far as to that place. Farther still, those who act more insidiously are more unjust. The irascible man, therefore, is not insidious, nor is anger, but he is open in what he does. Desire, however, is fraudulent, as it is said of Venus, quote, the Cyprian goddess skilled in weaving wiles, close quote. And, as Homer says, speaking of her cestus, quote, in this was every art and every charm, to win the wisest and the coldest warm, fond love, the gentle vow, the gay desire, the kind deceit, the still reviving fire, persuasive speech, and more persuasive sighs, silence that spoke, and eloquence of eyes. Close quote. Hence, if this incontinence is more unjust, it is also more base than that which pertains to anger, and this is simply incontinence, and in a certain respect vice. Again, no one who is pained acts insolently, i.e. lasciviously, towards another person, but every one who acts from the impulse of anger acts with pain. He, however, who conducts himself insolently towards another acts with pleasure. If, therefore, those things with which it is especially just to be angry are more unjust, the incontinence also which subsists through desire is more unjust, for anger is not attended with insolence. Hence it is evident that the incontinence which is conversant with desires is more base than that which is conversant with anger, and also that continence and incontinence are conversant with corporeal pleasures. The differences, however, of these must be assumed, for, as we said in the beginning, some desires are human and natural, both in their genus and magnitude, but others are savage, and others subsist from mutilations and diseases. But with the first of these, 
temperance and intemperance are alone conversant. Hence, we neither call brutes temperate, nor intemperate, except metaphorically, though one genus of animals differs in short from another, in insolence, in salaciousness, and in veracity. For they have neither any deliberate choice, nor reasoning process, but they revolt from nature, in the same manner as insane men. Ferocity, however, is a less evil than vice, but it is more terrible, for that which is most excellent is not corrupted through this, as it is in men, but those that labor under this malady are deprived of it, i.e. of reason. It is just, therefore, as if that which is inanimate should be compared with that which is animated, in order to know which of the two is the worse. For the improbity is always more innoxious, which is without a principle, but intellect is a principle. Hence a similar thing takes place, as if injustice should be compared with an unjust man. For it is possible that the one may be worse than the other, for a bad man may be the cause of an infinitely greater number of evils than a brute. Chapter 7 With respect, however, to the pleasures and pains which subsist through the touch and the taste, and also with respect to the desires and aversions pertaining to these, about which intemperance and temperance have been before defined, it is possible, indeed, that a man may be so disposed as to be vanquished by those pleasures and pains to which the multitude are superior, and it is also possible that he may vanquish those by which the multitude are vanquished. But of these characters, he who is vanquished by pleasures is incontinent, and he who vanquishes them is continent. He also who is vanquished by pains is effeminate, but he who vanquishes them is a man of endurance. The habits, however, of most men are between these, though they rather verge to the worse habits. Since, however, of pleasures, some are necessary, but others are not, and those that are necessary are so to a certain extent. But the excesses and defects are not necessary, and the like also takes place in desires and pains. This being the case, he who pursues the excesses of pleasures, or who pursues pleasures excessively, or from deliberate choice, and on their own account, and not from anything else which may happen, is an intemperate man. For this man will necessarily not repent of his conduct, so that he is incurable. But he who is deficient in the pursuit of pleasures is opposed to this character, and he who subsists in a medium between both is the temperate man. In a similar manner also he is intemperate, who avoids corporeal pains, not because he is vanquished by them, but from deliberate choice. But of those who pursue pleasures, yet not from deliberate choice, one, indeed, is led to the pursuit through pleasure, but another through an avoidance of pain, so that they differ from each other. It will, however, be obvious to every one that he is a worse character, who, not desiring, or desiring but slightly, does anything which is base, than him who desires vehemently. And also that he who, not being angry, strikes a man, is a worse character than the man who strikes another through the impulse of anger. For what would such a one do, if he were influenced by passion? Hence the intemperate is worse than the incontinent man. Of the characters, therefore, that we have mentioned, the one has more the form of effeminacy, but the other is incontinent. But the continent is opposed to the incontinent, and the man of endurance to the effeminate man. For endurance, indeed, consists in resisting, but continence in subduing. It is one thing, however, to resist, and another to subdue, just as it is one thing not to be vanquished, and another to vanquish. Hence, continence is more eligible than endurance. But he who fails in those things in which the multitude resist, and are able to resist, is effeminate, and luxuriously delicate. For luxurious delicacy is a certain effeminacy, as when a man draws his garments on the ground, lest he should be pained by the labor of holding it up, and by his manner of living imitates one who is ill, yet does not think he is miserable, though he resembles one who is miserable. 
the like also takes place with respect to continence and incontinence for it is not wonderful if a man is vanquished by strong and transcendent pleasures or pains but he deserves to be pardoned if though vanquished he makes a resistance like the philoctetes of theoctetes when bit by a viper or the circean of carcinus in his alope or like those who endeavouring to restrain their laughter burst forth into a profuse laugh as it happened to xenophantus but he is very blamable who is vanquished by those pleasures which the multitude are able to resist and is unable to oppose them and this not through the nature of his race or from disease as is the case with the persian kings with whom effeminacy is hereditary and who on this account are as females when compared to males the jocose man also appears to be intemperate but he is effeminate for jesting is a relaxation since it is a repose from serious and laborious pursuits but the jocose man ranks among the number of those who exceed in this relaxation with respect to incontinence however one kind is precipitate but another is from imbecility for some indeed having deliberated do not persist in what they have deliberated on account of passion but others in consequence of not having deliberated are led captive by passion for some persons just as those who have previously tickled themselves are not tickled by others so these in consequence of previously perceiving and foreseeing the future perturbation and having pre-excited themselves and their reasoning power are not vanquished by passion whether it be delectable or painful but persons of acute feelings and those who are melancholy are especially incontinent according to precipitate incontinence for the former indeed through celerity and the latter through vehemence do not wait for the decision of reason because they are disposed to follow the imagination chapter eight the intemperate man however as we have before observed is not inclined to repentance for he persists in his deliberate choice but every incontinent man is inclined to repent hence the thing is not as we doubted it might be but the intemperate man indeed is incurable and the incontinent man is curable for depravity appears to resemble the diseases of the dropsy and consumption but incontinence seems to resemble the epilepsy since the former indeed is continued without interruption but the latter is not a continued improbity and in short the genus of incontinence is different from that of vice for vice indeed is latent For the man who is incontinent from imbecility resembles those who become rapidly intoxicated and from a little wine and from less than that through which most men become intoxicated that incontinence therefore is not a vice is evident but perhaps it is partially so for incontinence is contrary but vice is conformable to deliberate choice the intemperate and the incontinent man however are similar in their actions just as demodocus said of the milesians viz quote, the milesians are not indeed foolish yet they act as if they were so Close quote. thus also incontinent men are not indeed unjust yet they act unjustly since therefore the incontinent man is one who does not pursue corporeal pleasures in excess and contrary to right reason from persuasion but the intemperate man because he is intemperate is persuaded to pursue such pleasures this being the case the former is easily induced to change his opinion but the latter is not for virtue preserves the principle of right conduct but depravity corrupts it and in actions that for the sake of which or the end is the principle in the same manner as hypotheses are principles in the mathematics hence neither in the mathematics nor here are principles to be taught but virtue 
either physical or ethical, is the cause of right opinion, concerning the principle of conduct. A man of this description, therefore, is temperate, but the contrary character is an intemperate man. There is also a certain person who through passion departs from right reason, whom passion, indeed, so subdues that he does not act conformably to right reason, but yet passion does not so far subdue him as to cause him to be persuaded, that pleasures of this description ought to be largely pursued. This person is the incontinent man, who is better than the intemperate, and is not absolutely a bad man. For in him that which is best, the principle of right conduct, is saved. But there is another person contrary to this, viz. the continent man, who persists in the decision of reason, and is not diverted from it through passion. From these things, therefore, it is evident that one of these habits is worthy, but the other bad. Chapter 9 Whether, therefore, is he the continent man, who persists in any kind of reason, and in any kind of deliberate choice, or he who persists in right reason? And whether is he the incontinent man, who does not persist in any kind of deliberate choice, nor in any kind of reason, or he who persists in a false reason, and in an erroneous deliberate choice, as it was doubted by us before? Or shall we say that the continent man is one who persists from accident in any kind of reason and deliberate choice, but essentially in true reason, and right deliberate choice, but that the incontinent man does not thus persist? For if any one chooses, or pursues, that thing on account of this, he pursues indeed, and chooses this thing per se, but the former thing from accident. We speak, however, of that which is per se simply. Hence it is possible that the one may persist in any kind of opinion, but that the other may abandon any kind of opinion. But the one simply persists in true opinion, and the other does not. There are, however, some persons who are disposed to persist in an opinion, and these are those who are called pertinacious, such as the obstinate, and those who are not easily persuaded to relinquish their opinions, who have indeed something similar to the continent man, in the same manner as the prodigal has to the liberal, and the audacious to the confident man but in many things they are different. For the confident man, indeed, is not changed through passion and desire, since, when it so happens, he is easily persuaded. But the pertinacious man is not persuaded by reason, since most of this description admits desire, and are led by pleasures. Those persons, however, are pertinacious, who have certain opinions of their own, and also unlearned and rustic men. And those, indeed, who have certain opinions of their own, are pertinacious through pleasure and pain. For they rejoice when they are victorious, if they are not induced to change their opinion. And they are grieved when their opinions, as if they were decrees, are without efficacy. Hence they resemble the incontinent more than the continent man. But there are certain persons who do not persist in their opinions, yet not through incontinence such as Neoptolemus in the Philoctetes of Sophocles. Since he did not persist in his opinion, yet not on account of pleasure, but on account of the beautiful in conduct. For to him it was beautiful to speak the truth, though he was persuaded by Ulysses to lie. For not everyone who does anything on account of pleasure is intemperate, or a bad, or an incontinent man. But he is intemperate, who does it on account of base pleasure. Since, however, there is a character of such a kind as to be delighted less than is proper with corporeal pleasures, and not to abide in the decisions of reason, the continent man is a medium between this character and the incontinent man. For the incontinent man, indeed, does not abide in the decisions of reason, because he is delighted with corporeal pleasures more than is proper. But this man because he is delighted with them less than is proper. The continent man, however, abides in the decision of reason, and is not changed through anything else. It is also necessary, if continence is a good thing, 
that both the contrary habits should be bad, as it appears that they are. Because, however, one of these characters, viz., the man who is delighted less than is proper with corporeal pleasures, exists but among a few men, and is rarely seen. Hence, as temperance appears to be contrary to intemperance alone, thus also continence to incontinence. But, since many things are denominated from similitude, the continence also of the temperate man follows according to similitude. For both the continent and the temperate man do nothing contrary to reason, through the influence of corporeal pleasures. But the one, indeed, viz. the continent man, possesses, but the other does not possess depraved desires. And the one, indeed, is a man of such a description, as not to be delighted contrary to reason, but the other is delighted, indeed, it is not led by this delight. The incontinent and the intemperate man also resemble each other, though, indeed, they are different characters. Both, however, pursue corporeal delights, but the latter, indeed, thinking that it is proper, and the other not thinking that it is proper to pursue them. Chapter 10 nor is it possible that the same person can at one and the same time be prudent and incontinent. For it has been shown by us that a prudent man is at the same time a man of worthy manners. Again, a man is not only prudent from knowing what ought to be done, but also from acting properly. But the incontinent man does not act properly. Nothing, however, prevents the incontinent man from being skilful. Hence, also, sometimes, certain persons appear to be prudent, but incontinent, because skilfulness differs from prudence, in the way we have before explained. And these, so far as pertains to reason, indeed, are near to each other, but they differ according to deliberate choice. Neither, therefore, does the incontinent man possess reason, as one who knows and contemplates, but as one who is asleep, or intoxicated, and he acts, indeed, voluntarily, for, after a certain manner, he acts knowing both what he does, and for the sake of what he acts as he does. But he is not depraved, for his deliberate choice is good, so that he is half depraved, and not unjust, because he is not insidious. For one incontinent man, indeed, i.e., the man who is incontinent from debility, does not persist in what he has deliberated. And he who is of a melancholy temperament, i.e., the man who is precipitately incontinent, is not, in short, disposed to deliberate. The incontinent man, therefore, resembles a city, which decrees, indeed, everything that is proper, and has good laws, but uses none of them. As Anaxandrides revilingly said, quote, The state consults, but its own laws neglects. Close quote. But the bad man resembles a city, which uses indeed laws, but uses bad laws. Incontinence, however, and continence are conversant with that which exceeds the habit of the multitude. For the continent man persists more, but the incontinent man less, than the multitude are able to do, in the decisions of reason. The incontinence, however, of the melancholy is more easily cured than the incontinence of those who deliberate, indeed, but do not persist in doing what they have deliberated to do. Those also who are incontinent from custom may be more easily cured than those who are naturally so, for it is more easy to change custom than nature. For on this very account it is difficult to change custom, viz., because it resembles nature. As Evanus also says, quote, by long attention custom is produced, and is at length as nature to mankind. Close quote. We have shown, therefore, what continence and incontinence, and also what endurance and effeminacy are, and how these habits subsist with reference to each other. Chapter 11. The discussion, however, of pleasure and pain pertains to him who philosophizes about the political science. For he is the architect, as it were, of the end, looking to which we say that one thing is evil, but another is simply good. Again, it is likewise necessary that we should make these the objects of consideration. For 
we admit that ethical virtue and vice are conversant with pleasures and pains and most men assert that felicity is accompanied with pleasure hence also they denominate the blessed man from especially rejoicing to some therefore no pleasure appears to be good neither essentially nor from accident for good and pleasure are not the same thing but to others some pleasures appear to be good but many of them to be bad others again in the third place assert that though all pleasures were good yet at the same time that which is most excellent cannot be pleasure in short therefore they say pleasure is not good because all pleasure is a generation tending to a sensible nature as to its end but no generation is allied to ends as no act of building a house i e the energy of building is allied to the house again the temperate man avoids pleasures farther still the prudent man pursues a freedom from pain and not the delectable to which may be added that pleasures are an impediment to the energy of prudence and this in proportion to the delight which they afford as is the case with venereal pleasures for no one when engaged in this pleasure can intellectually perceive anything again pleasure is not the offspring of art though everything which is good is the work of art farther still children and brutes pursue pleasures but that all pleasures are not worthy is indicated by this that some are base and disgraceful and pernicious for some pleasures produce disease it is also evident that pleasure is not the best of things because it is not an end but generation such therefore nearly are the assertions respecting pleasure chapter twelve that it does not happen however from these arguments that pleasure is neither good nor the best of things is evident from the following considerations in the first place indeed because good is predicated in a twofold respect for one kind of good is simply and absolutely good but another is good to a certain person and natures and habits receive the same division so that this will also be the case with motions and generations with respect to these pleasures likewise which appear to be bad some indeed are simply bad but are not bad to a certain person but to him are eligible and some are not pleasures to this person except once and for a short time but they are not eligible to him and some are not pleasures but only appear to be so viz those which are attended with pain and are for the sake of a remedy such as those of the sick again since of good one kind is energy but another is habit those pleasures which restore their possessor to his natural habit are delectable in desires however there is the energy of an indigent and imperfect habit and nature there are also pleasures which are unaccompanied with pain and desire such as the energies of contemplation nature in these not being indigent but that some pleasures are delectable of themselves and others only on account of the indigence which they remove is indicated by this that men are not pleased with the same delectable thing when the indigence of nature is removed and when it is not for in the former case they are delighted with things simply and absolutely pleasant but in the latter with their contraries for they are then delighted with things sharp and bitter none of which are either naturally or absolutely delectable so that neither are they pleasures for as things delectable are to each other so likewise are the pleasures produced by these farther still it is not necessary that something else should be better than pleasure as some say the end of generation is better than generation for pleasures are not generations nor are all of them accompanied with generation but they are energies and an end nor do pleasures happen when things are passing into existence but from the use of things nor is the end of all pleasures something different from them but of those only which lead to the perfection of nature hence it is not well said that pleasure is a sensible generation but it must rather be said that it is the energy of habit according to nature and instead of saying that it is a sensible it must be said that it is an unimpeded generation 
it appears however to be a certain generation because it is properly good for they fancied that energy is generation but it is different from it to say also that pleasures are bad because some delectable things produce diseases is what may likewise be said of things salubrious for some of these are bad as to pecuniary affairs in this respect therefore both will be bad and yet they are not on this account bad for contemplation is likewise sometimes injurious to health yet the pleasure proceeding from each habit is neither an impediment to prudence nor to any habit but the pleasures which are an impediment to these are such as are foreign since the pleasures arising from contemplation and discipline produce in a greater degree contemplation and learning but it reasonably happens that no pleasure is the work of art since neither is there an art of any other energy but of power though the arts pertaining to unguents and cooking appear to be the arts of pleasure with respect to the assertions also that the temperate man avoids pleasures and that the prudent man pursues a life unattended with pain and that children and brutes pursue pleasure all these are solved after the same manner for since we have shown how all pleasures are in a certain respect simply good and how they are not good hence children and brutes pursue such pleasures as are accompanied with desire and pain and are corporeal and the prudent man pursues a freedom of pain from these for of such a kind are these pleasures viz they are accompanied with pain children and brutes also pursue the excesses of these according to which the intemperate man becomes intemperate hence the temperate man avoids these since there are also pleasures which belong to the temperate man chapter thirteen it is also admitted that pain is an evil and is to be avoided for one kind of pain indeed is simply evil but another in a certain respect because it is an impediment that however which is contrary to what is to be avoided so far as it is something to be avoided and is evil is good pleasure therefore is necessarily something good for the solution of Spusippus is not appropriate viz that pleasure is contrary to pain just as the greater is contrary to the less and the equal since no one will say that pleasure is a certain evil but nothing prevents a certain pleasure from being the best of things if certain pleasures are bad just as a certain science viz wisdom is the best of sciences though some sciences are bad perhaps too it must necessarily be the case that if of every habit there are unimpeded energies whether felicity is the energy of all habits or of some one of them this energy connect pleasure with felicity for no energy is perfect when it is impeded but felicity is among the number of perfect energies hence the happy man requires the goods pertaining to the body and external possessions and also good fortune lest the want of these should be an impediment to his felicity those however who say that a man if he is a good man may be happy though he should be tormented in a wheel and fall into the greatest calamities say nothing to the purpose whether they assert this willingly or unwillingly because however the happy man requires good fortune prosperity appears to some persons to be the same with felicity though it is not the same since prosperity when it is excessive is an impediment to felicity perhaps likewise it is no longer just to call prosperity when it is excessive good fortune for the definition of prosperity has a reference to felicity that all brutes too and all men pursue pleasure is an indication that pleasure is in a certain respect the best of things Quote, that fame which crowds of humankind extol will ne'er completely perish Close quote. because however neither the same nature nor the same habit either is 
or appears to be the best neither do all men pursue the same pleasure though pleasure is pursued by all men perhaps also they pursue not the pleasure which they fancy nor that which they say they pursue but the same pleasure for all things naturally possess something divine corporeal pleasures however obtain the inheritance of the name because men are for the most part occupied in them and all animals partake of them because therefore these pleasures alone are generally known these are the only pleasures which are fancied to have an existence it is however evident that unless pleasure is good and also energy it will not be possible for the happy man to live delectably for on what account would delight be requisite to a happy life if it is not good but it would also be possible for life to be happy though attended with pain for pain will neither be evil nor good if pleasure is not good why therefore is pain to be avoided neither therefore will the life of the worthy man be more delectable unless his energies are more delectable chapter fourteen with respect however to corporeal pleasures we must direct our attention to the assertions of those who say that some pleasures are very eligible viz such as are worthy but not corporeal pleasures with which the intemperate man is conversant why therefore are the pains contrary to these pleasures depraved for good is contrary to evil or shall we say that necessary pleasures are so far good because that which is not evil is good or that they are good to a certain extent for in those habits and motions in which there is no excess of that which is better there is no excess of pleasure but in those in which there is an excess of what is better there is also an excess of pleasure but of corporeal goods there is an excess and the bad man becomes bad by pursuing the excess of pleasure and not necessary pleasures for all depraved men are delighted with meats and wine and venery but not in such a manner as is proper and they are affected in a contrary way with respect to pain for they do not avoid the excess of pain but pain altogether for pain is not contrary to excess but to him who pursues excess since however it is not only necessary to speak the truth but also to assign the cause of a false assertion for this contributes to credibility since when the cause why a thing seems to be true though it is not appears to be reasonable it then gives greater credibility to the truth this being the case it must be shown why corporeal pleasures appear to be more eligible in the first place therefore they appear to be so because they expel pain and because excessive and in short corporeal pleasure is pursued on account of the excesses of pain as a remedy but the remedies are vehement and on this account corporeal pleasures are pursued because they become more apparent when placed by that which is contrary to them pleasure therefore does not appear to be good for these two reasons as we have before observed because some pleasures indeed are the actions of a depraved nature either from the birth of the animal as those of a brute or they originate from custom such as those of bad men but other pleasures are remedies because they are the pleasures of that which is in want and it is better to have them than for them to be passing into existence and others happen to be pleasures of that which is in a perfect condition from accident therefore they are worthy pleasures again pleasures that are vehement are pursued by those who are incapable of being delighted with other pleasures these therefore procure for themselves certain thirsts hence when pleasures are innoxious they are not to be reprehended but when they are noxious they are bad for those that pursue these pleasures have no other with which they are delighted and if neither these nor any others are present the vulgar are in pain through the indigence of nature for the animal always labours as physical arguments testify since as physiologists say to see and to hear are painful but we are now accustomed to these energies and therefore do not perceive the pain in a similar manner in youth in consequence of the augmentation which then takes place we are affected like those who are intoxicated and youth is a delectable period of human life but the melancholic naturally always require a remedy 
for their body experiences a continual molestation from its temperament through the acrimony of the bile and they are always agitated with vehement appetite pleasure however always excels pain as well the pain which is contrary to pleasure as that which is casual if the pleasure is strong and on this account the melancholic becomes intemperate and depraved but the pleasures which are without pain have no excess and these are such as are derived from things naturally delectable and which are not accidentally so i mean however by things delectable from accident remedies for because it happens that we are cured of a malady the part which is sane performing something on this account the remedies appear to be delectable but by things naturally delectable i mean those which produce the action of such a nature i e which produce an energy essentially adapted to such a nature nothing however which remains the same is always delectable because our nature is not simple but there is also something in it different according to which it is corruptible hence if the one part does anything this to the other nature is preternatural but when both the parts are equalized that which is performed neither appears to be painful nor pleasing for if there is any being the nature of which is simple to this being the same action will always be most delectable hence god always rejoices according to one simple pleasure for there is not only an energy of corporeal motion but also of immobility and pleasure exists more abundantly in rest than in motion but mutation is the sweetest of all things according to the poet through a certain depravity for as a depraved man is mutable so likewise is the nature which requires mutation for it is neither simple nor good and thus we have spoken concerning continence and incontinence pleasure and pain and have shown what each of them is and how some of them are good but others bad it now remains that we speak concerning friendship end of book seven recording in memory of mitchell edwards book eight of the nicomachean ethics this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by geoffrey edwards the nicomachean ethics by aristotle translated by thomas taylor book eight chapter one after these things it follows that we should discuss friendship for it is a certain virtue or subsists in conjunction with virtue and besides this it is most necessary to life for no one would choose to live without friends though he possessed every other good for the rich princes and magistrates appear to be especially in want of friends for what advantage is there in a prosperity of this kind if beneficence is taken away which is especially exerted towards friends and is most praised when thus exerted or how can prosperity be preserved and saved without friends for by how much the greater by so much the more insecure it is but in poverty and other misfortunes friends are considered to be the only refuge friendship also is useful to youth in preventing them from error and to elderly men by the attention which it pays to their wants and the assistance it affords to their deficiency in action arising from the imbecility of age to those likewise in the acme of life it is useful because it aids them in the performance of beautiful actions quote, when two in concord meet Close quote. for they are more able through it both to conceive and act friendship also appears to be naturally inherent in that which begets towards that which is begotten and this not only in the human race but likewise in birds in most animals in those of the same nation towards each other and especially among men and hence we praise those that are philanthropic it may also be seen in travelling how accommodating and friendly every man is to man it seems too that friendship connects cities together 
and legislators pay more attention to it than to justice for concord appears to be something similar to friendship but this legislators are especially desirous of effecting and they principally expel sedition which is hostile to concord and when the citizens indeed are friends there is no need of justice but though they are just they require friendship among just things also that which is especially just appears to be of a friendly nature nor is friendship alone necessary but it is also a beautiful thing for we praise those who are lovers of friends and an abundance of friends appears to be one among the number of beautiful things again some are of opinion that the same persons are good men and friends there is however no small controversy concerning friendship for some consider it to be a certain similitude and that similar persons are friends whence also it is said quote, like tends to like a jackdaw to a jackdaw close quote etc others on the contrary say that all such persons are potters to each other and they investigate concerning these things from a higher and more physical origin euripides indeed saying quote, earth when she's dry rejoices in the rain and venerable heaven with rain when filled on earth delights to fall Close quote. and heraclitus asserting Quote, that what is adverse is advantageous that the most beautiful harmony results from things of a different nature and that all things originate from strife Close quote. others however are of a contrary opinion respecting friendship and among these is empedocles for he says quote, that the similar aspires after the similar Close quote. such of these doubts therefore as are of a physical nature we shall omit for they are not adapted to the present speculation but we shall direct our attention to such of them as pertain to human affairs and to the manners and passions of men such as whether there is friendship among all men or it is not possible that depraved men can be friends and whether there is one or many species of friendship for those who are of opinion that there is but one species of it because it receives the more and the less do not found their opinion on a sufficient argument for things specifically different receive the more and the less but of these we have spoken before chapter two these things however will perhaps become evident when that which is the object of friendly love is known for it seems that not everything is beloved but that only which is the object of love but this is either what is good or what is delectable or what is useful that however may appear to be useful through which some good or pleasure is procured hence the good and the delectable will be objects of love as ends whether therefore do men love that which is simply good or that which is good to them for these sometimes are discordant a similar inquiry also may be made concerning the delectable it appears however that every one loves that which is good to himself and that good is that which is simply the object of love but that what is good to each person is the object of love to each each person however loves not that which is really good to him but that which appears to be so but this makes no difference for that which appears to be good will be the object of love since however there are three things through which love is produced viz the good the delectable and the useful in the love of things inanimate there is not said to be friendship for there is no reciprocal love nor a wish that any good may befall them for it would be perhaps ridiculous to wish that some good might befall wine but if a man does he wishes that it may be preserved in order that he may have it but it is said to be requisite to wish well to a friend for his own sake and 
those who entertain this wish for their friends are said to be benevolent though the same wish should not be made by them for it is said that benevolence in reciprocal regard is friendship to which perhaps it should be added if the benevolence is not latent for many persons are benevolent to those whom they never saw in consequence of believing them to be worthy or useful men and those whom they never saw may also be benevolent to them they appear therefore indeed to be benevolent to each other but how can it be said that they are friends when they are ignorant of the manner in which they are mutually affected hence it is necessary in order to their being friends that they should be benevolent to and wish well to each other on account of one of the things we have mentioned viz on account of the good the delectable or the useful chapter three these however are specifically different from each other and therefore the loves also and the friendships differ for there are three species of friendship equal in number to the objects of friendly love since in each there is a reciprocal love which is not latent but those who love each other wish well to each other so far as they love those therefore who love each other on account of utility do not mutually love for their own sake but so far as they obtain some good from each other this is also the case with those who love on account of pleasure for they do not love those who are versatile because they possess certain qualities but because they afford them pleasure and those who love on account of utility possess this friendly love on account of the good which they derive from it those likewise who love on account of pleasure love on account of that which is delectable to them and the attachment of these is not personal but is produced so far as the object of their attachment is useful or delectable these friendships therefore are accidental for the object of their attachment is not beloved so far as he is such a person as he is but so far as he administers to them some good or some pleasure such friendships therefore are easily dissolved the objects of them not remaining in a similar condition for if they are no longer delectable or useful they cease to be beloved and the useful is not permanent but at a different time becomes different hence that through which they were friends being dissolved their friendship also is dissolved in consequence of existing for the sake of it a friendship however of this kind appears especially to subsist among elderly men for those who have arrived at this period of life do not pursue the delectable but the useful nor is the delectable pursued by such young men in the acme of life as make utility the object of their pursuit but such persons do not very much live together for sometimes they are not pleasing to each other they do not therefore require an association of this kind unless they are useful for they are delectable to each other so far as they hope for some good among these friendships also viz those of utility hospitable friendship is ranked but the friendship of young men appears to subsist on account of pleasure for they live according to passion and especially pursue that which is delectable to them and that which is present in consequence of the mutation of age however other things become delectable on which account they rapidly become and cease to be friends for their friendship is changed together with that which is delectable but the mutation of such a pleasure is rapid young men also are amorous for much of the amatory propensity subsists according to passion and on account of pleasure hence they love and rapidly cease to love frequently changing in the same day they wish however to spend the day with each other and to live together for thus they obtain what friendship requires the friendship however of good men and of those who are similar in virtue is perfect for they similarly wish well to each other so far as they are good but they are good of themselves but those who wish well to their friends for their sake are especially friends 
for they are thus affected towards them on their own account i e personally and not from accident the friendship therefore of these remains as long as they are good men but virtue is stable and each of these is simply good and good to his friend for good men are simply good and are useful to each other in a similar manner also they are delectable to each other for good men are simply and mutually delectable for to each their proper actions and such like actions viz such as are similarly virtuous are attended with pleasure but the actions of good men are such as these or resemble them it reasonably follows also that such a friendship is stable for all such things subsist in it connectedly as ought to be present with friends for all friendship is on account of good or on account of pleasure either simply or to him who loves and this according to a certain similitude but in this friendship i e in the friendship founded on virtue all the above mentioned particulars are essentially inherent since in this all the rest are similar and that which is simply good is also simply delectable these things however are especially lovely and in these the most excellent love and friendship principally subsist but it is likely that such friendships are rare for persons of this description are few farther still virtuous friendship requires time and custom for according to the proverb it is not possible for men to know each other until they have eaten a peck of salt together nor is it proper for one person to become intimate with or a friend to another till he appears to be amiable to him and worthy of belief but those who rapidly perform towards each other the offices of friendship wish indeed to be friends but are not unless they are amiable and know that they are so they rapidly therefore contract the wish to be friends but they do not contract friendship hence virtuous friendship is perfect according to time as being lasting and according to other things and consists from all these each friend likewise is in this friendship similar to each which is a thing necessary to friends chapter four the friendship however which subsists on account of the delectable has a similitude to virtuous friendship for good men also are delectable to each other this is likewise the case with the friendship which subsists on account of utility for good men are also such i e useful to each other but among these viz those who are friends through the delectable friendships are especially permanent when an equality as for instance of pleasure subsists between them and not only so but likewise from the same thing as is the case with men of versatile manners and not as between the lover and the beloved person for these are not delighted with the same thing but the lover is delighted with the sight of the beloved person and he who is beloved is delighted with the attention which is paid him by the lover when the flower of age however is no more sometimes the friendship also ends for to the one the sight of his friend is no longer pleasing and to the other bland attention is no longer paid many of these however continue permanent in their friendship if each loves the manners of each from custom in consequence of possessing similar manners those however who do not reciprocally exchange delight in amatory affairs but utility are friends in a less degree and their friendship is less permanent but the friendship of those who are friends on account of utility is dissolved together with advantage for they were not friends of each other but of the profitable on account of pleasure therefore and on account of utility it is possible for bad men to be friends to each other and also for worthy with bad men and for those who are neither good nor bad with each other and with the good or the bad but it is evident that the good alone can be friends through or on account of themselves for bad men are not delighted with each other unless each derive some advantage from the other and the friendship of good men alone is unattended with calumny 
for it is not easy to believe anything bad of him who has been tried by us for a long time among these also there is mutual credibility and a confidence that the one will not injure the other and such other particulars as are thought worthy to be ranked in true friendship in other friendships however there is nothing to prevent things of this kind from taking place for since men denominate friends those who are connected together on account of utility in the same manner as cities bracket, for to cities warlike confederacies appear to take place for the sake of advantage close bracket, and since those likewise are called friends who like boys love each other on account of pleasure perhaps indeed it is necessary that we also should call such persons friends and should admit that there are many species of friendship and we must denominate indeed the friendship of good men so far as they are good that which is primarily and properly so called but we must admit that the rest are called friendships from similitude for they are friends so far as there is something good and similar among them since the delectable is something good to the lovers of pleasure these friendships however are not very much conjoined nor do the same persons become friends on account of the useful and the delectable for things which are from accident are not very much united but friendship being distributed into these species bad men indeed will be friends on account of pleasure or advantage through which they are similar but good men will be friends on their own account for they are friends so far as they are good these therefore are simply friends but those from accident and from being assimilated to these chapter five as however in the virtues some men are said to be good according to habit but others according to energy thus also it is in friendship for those friends who live together are delighted with and impart good to each other but those who are asleep or are separated by places do not indeed energize and yet they are so disposed as to be able to energize in such a way as friendship requires for places do not dissolve friendship simply but only the energy of it if however the absence is long it seems to produce an oblivion of friendship whence it is said that taciturnity dissolves many friendships but neither elderly nor austere men appear to be adapted to friendship for in them there is but little of pleasure no one however can constantly associate with one who is sorrowful or with one who is not pleasant for nature appears especially to avoid the painful and to aspire after the pleasing but those who admit the company of each other and yet do not live together rather resemble benevolent persons than friends since nothing is so much the province of friends as living together for those who are in want aspire after advantage those also who are blessed constantly associate with each other for it is not in the smallest degree fit that these should lead a solitary life but it is not possible for men to live together whose company is not delightful and who are not pleased with the same things which fellowship appears to possess the friendship therefore of good men is eminently friendship as we have frequently observed for that which is simply good or delectable appears to be lovely and eligible but to every one that is lovely and eligible which is to him a thing of this kind a good man however is lovely and eligible to a good man through both these dilection however is similar to passion but friendship to habit for dilection is no less exerted towards inanimate things but reciprocal love exists in conjunction with deliberate choice and deliberate choice is from habit we likewise wish well to those whom we love for their own sake not according to passion but according to habit and those who love a friend love that which is good to themselves for a good man becoming a friend becomes a good to him to whom he is a friend each therefore loves that which is good to himself and they mutually impart to each other that which is equal both in wishing well and affording delight for equality is said to be friendship but these things are especially present 
with the friendship of good men chapter six friendship however subsists in a less degree among austere and elderly men in proportion as they are more morose and less delighted with associations for these appear to be especially friendly and effective of friendship hence young men rapidly become friends but not elderly men for they do not become friends to those with whom they are not delighted in a similar manner neither do the austere become rapidly friends but men of this description are indeed benevolent to each other for they wish well and afford assistance to the wants of each other they are not however very much friends because they do not constantly associate nor are delighted with each other which things appear to be especially of a friendly nature but it is not possible to be a friend to many according to perfect friendship as neither is it possible to love many at one and the same time for this resembles excess and a thing of this kind is naturally adapted to take place towards one person moreover it is not easy for many persons to please the same person very much at one and the same time nor perhaps would it be a good thing if it were easy experience and custom likewise are necessary to a perfect friendship which are very difficult things but it is possible to please many persons on account of utility and delight for there are many of this description viz who are thus to be pleased and a little experience is sufficient for this purpose of these two however the friendship which subsists through the delectable is more similar to true friendship when the same things are affected by both persons and they are delighted with each other or with the same things as is the case in the friendship of young men for there is more of the liberal in these friendships but the friendship which subsists on account of utility is the friendship of merchants and of those who are occupied in sordid and illiberal pursuits and those who are blessed indeed viz who are as happy as the condition of human nature will permit are not in want of anything useful or delectable because they already possess everything of this kind for they wish to live with certain persons and they endure what is painful but for a short time since no one could endure it continually not even good itself if it were attended with molestation hence they search for friends who can procure them delight it is however perhaps necessary to search for good men who are such i e who are delectable and who are also such to their friends for thus those things will be present with them which ought to be present with friends but men in authority and power appear to use their friends by making a distinction between them for some are useful and others delectable to them the same things however are not very much affected by both these for neither do they search for those who are delectable in conjunction with virtue nor for those who are useful for worthy purposes but aspiring after pleasure they search for men of versatile manners and for those who are skilful in accomplishing what they are ordered to do but these qualifications are not very much found in the same person we have however already observed that the worthy man is at the same time pleasing and useful but such a one will not be the friend of the man who surpasses others in power and authority unless he also surpasses others in virtue but if he does not he who surpasses will not equalize according to the analogous men of this description however are rare the above-mentioned friendships therefore are inequality for either the same things are affected by both and they mutually wish the same things or they exchange one thing for another as for instance pleasure for utility but that these are friendships in a less degree and that they are less permanent has been already observed by us they appear however through a similitude and dissimilitude of the same thing to be and not to be friendships for from their similitude to the friendship which is according to virtue they appear to be friendships since the one of these has the delectable but the other the useful but both these are inherent in virtuous friendship they differ however in this that virtuous friendship is free from calumny and is stable but these are rapidly changed 
and they also differ in many other things and from this dissimilitude to the friendship which is according to virtue they do not appear to be friendships chapter seven there is however another species of friendship which subsists according to transcendency such as that between a father and his son and in short between a more elderly and a younger man between a husband and his wife and between every governor and him who is governed but these friendships also differ from each other for there is not the same friendship between parents and children as there is between governors and the governed nor between a father and a son as between a son and his father nor between a husband and wife as between a wife and husband for the virtue and also the work of each of these are different and the things are different on account of which they love their loves therefore and their friendships are different hence neither are the same things affected by each towards each nor is it fit they should be required but when children indeed bestow on their parents those things which offspring ought to bestow on those by whom they were begotten and parents bestow on their children those things which it is proper to bestow on their offspring then the friendship between such as these will be stable and worthy it is however necessary in all the friendships which subsist according to transcendency that the love should be analogous as for instance that the better character should be beloved in a greater degree than he loves and that this should also be the case with the more useful character and in a similar manner with each of the rest for when love exists according to desert then in a certain respect equality is produced which appears to be the peculiarity of friendship the equal however does not appear to subsist similarly in just things and in friendship for in just things indeed the equality which is according to desert ranks in the first place but that which is according to quantity in the second place but in friendship the equality which is according to quantity ranks in the first place and that which is according to desert in the second place this however becomes evident if there is a great interval of virtue or vice or affluence or of some other things for then they are no longer friends nor do they think themselves qualified to be so but this is most apparent in the gods for they most abundantly transcend in everything that is good it is also evident in kings for those who are much inferior to them do not think themselves worthy to be their friends nor do those who are of no worth aspire to be friends of the best or the wisest of men in such as these therefore there is no accurate definition as long as they are the friends of some one for many things being taken away the friendship may yet remain but if they are separated by a great interval from each other as is the case with man and divinity friendship no longer remains whence also it is doubted whether friends would wish for their friends the greatest of goods such for instance as for them to be gods for in this case they would no longer be friends to them neither therefore would they be a good to them for friends are a good to each other hence if it is well said that a friend wishes well to his friend for his sake it is requisite that he should remain such as he is but he wishes the greatest good may befall him still remaining a man and perhaps he does not wish that every good may befall him for every one especially wishes to obtain good himself chapter eight the multitude however appear from ambition to be more desirous of being beloved than of loving hence the multitude love flatterers for a flatterer is a friend who is surpassed by him whom he flatters or pretends to be so and also professes to love in a greater degree than he is beloved but to be beloved appears to be proximate to the being honoured after which the multitude aspire it seems however that they do not choose honour on its own account but from accident for the multitude are delighted when they are honoured by those in power through the hope of the benefits they may thence derive for they fancy they shall obtain from them that of which they are in want 
they are delighted therefore with honour as an indication that they shall be benefited but those who aspire after honour from worthy and intelligent men desire to confirm their own opinion of themselves they rejoice therefore that they are worthy persons believing in the judgment of those who say that they are worthy but they are delighted to be beloved per se hence it would seem that this is a better thing than to be honoured and that friendship is a thing eligible of itself friendship however seems to consist more in loving than in being beloved of which this is an indication that mothers rejoice in loving their children for some mothers give their children to be privately educated by others and love them knowing them to be their own offspring but are not anxious to be beloved in return if both cannot be affected but it appears to them to be sufficient if they see their children doing well and they love their offspring though the offspring are unable to pay that attention to their mother which is fit because they are ignorant of her since therefore friendship consists rather in loving than in being beloved and we praise those who are lovers of friends to love appears to be the virtue of friends hence those in whom this exists according to desert are stable friends and the friendship of such as these is stable but thus also those who are unequal may especially become friends for thus they will be equalized equality however and similitude are friendship and especially the similitude of those who resemble each other in virtue for being of themselves stable they are also stable towards each other and neither require anything depraved nor are subservient to anything of this kind but as i may say they prohibit what is base for it is the province of good men neither to err themselves nor permit their friends to be subservient to erroneous conduct but depraved men have no stability for they do not remain similar to themselves but are only friends for a short time being delighted with the depravity of each other useful however and pleasing men remain friends for a longer time for they continue friends as long as they impart to each other pleasure and advantage but the friendship which subsists on account of utility appears to be composed from contraries such as the friendship of the poor with the rich man and of the unlearned with the learned man for he who is in want of any thing aspiring to the possession of it recompenses with something else him from whom he obtains what he wants hither also may be referred the lover and the beloved the beautiful and the deformed hence lovers sometimes appear to be ridiculous when they think they ought to be beloved as much as they love if therefore they are similarly amiable perhaps it is fit they should thus think but it is ridiculous if they possess nothing of this kind perhaps also neither does one contrary desire another essentially but only from accident but the appetite is directed to the medium for this is good thus for instance it is good to a dry thing not to become moist but to arrive at the medium between dryness and moisture and in a similar manner to a hot thing and to other substances these things however must be omitted for they are more foreign than is proper chapter nine it seems however as we said in the beginning that both friendship and justice are conversant with and exist in the same things for in all society there appears to be a certain justice and friendship men therefore call their fellow-sailors and fellow-soldiers friends and in a similar manner those who associate with them in other employments but such as is the extent of their associations such also is the extent of their friendship for such likewise is the extent of justice the proverb too rightly says that all things are common among friends for friendship consists in communion among brothers however and associates all things are common but among others they are limited to certain bounds and to some indeed more so but to others less for with respect to friendship also some are friendships in a greater and others in a less degree 
just things also differ for there is not the same justice between parents and children as between brothers towards each other nor as between associates and fellow-citizens and the like takes place in other friendships injuries therefore are different towards each of these and they receive an increase by how much the more the persons injured are friends thus for instance it is a more dire thing to defraud an associate of money than a fellow-citizen and not to assist a brother than to refuse assistance to a stranger and to strike a father than to strike any other person but the just is naturally adapted to be increased at one and the same time with friendship as subsisting in the same things and being equally extended all communions or societies however resemble the parts of the political or civil communion for men journey together with a view to a certain advantage and in order to procure something which pertains to human life political communion also appears to exist for the sake of advantage to have been established with a view to this from the beginning and to continue so for the attention of legislators is directed to this and they say that what is advantageous in common is just other communions there also takes place among tribes and the populace some communions however appear to have been formed on account of pleasure such as the communion from the celebration of festivals or from societies instituted to promote good fellowship for these subsist for the sake of sacrificing and association but all these appear to be subject to political communion for political communion does not aspire after present advantage but to that which pertains to the whole of life performing sacrifices and for this purpose forming assemblies bestowing honours on the gods and affording a cessation from labour in conjunction with pleasure for ancient sacrifices and assemblies appear to have been instituted after collecting the fruits of the earth as first fruits all communions therefore appear to be parts of the political communion but such like friendships follow such like communions chapter ten there are however three species of a polity and as many deviations from them which are as it were the corruptions of these polities but the polities indeed are a kingdom an aristocracy and the third is derived from the distribution of honours through the medium of wealth which as it seems may be appropriately called a timocracy most men however are accustomed to call it simply a polity but of these a kingdom is the best and a timocracy is the worst the deviation also from a kingdom is indeed a tyranny for both are monarchies they differ however very much from each other for the tyrant indeed looks to his own advantage but the king to the advantage of those whom he governs for he is not a king who is not sufficient to himself and who does not surpass his subjects in every kind of good but a man of this description is in want of nothing hence his attention will not be directed to what is advantageous to himself but to the benefit of those whom he governs for he who is not a person of this description will be a certain elected king a tyrant however is the contrary to a king properly so called for he pursues his own good and from this it is more evident that he is the worst of rulers for that which is contrary to the best is the worst but the transition from a kingdom is into a tyranny for a tyranny is the depravity of a monarchy and a depraved king becomes a tyrant the transition from an aristocracy is into an oligarchy through the vice of the governors who distribute civil offices in a manner contrary to desert bestow upon themselves all or the greater part of everything that is good and always appoint the same persons magistrates paying more attention to wealth than to anything else 
those therefore that govern are few and are depraved instead of being the most worthy men but the transition from a timocracy is into a democracy since these polities border on each other for in a timocracy also the multitude have dominion and all those that are rich are equal a democracy however is in the smallest degree depraved for it deviates but little from the form of a polity i e from a timocracy after this manner therefore polities are especially changed for thus they are changed the least and the most easily the resemblances however and as it were paradigms of them may be derived from families for the communion or society between a father and his children has the form of a kingdom for a father pays attention to his children for their own sake hence also homer calls jupiter father for the intention of a kingdom is to be a paternal government but among the persians the government of a father is tyrannical for they use their children as slaves the government likewise of a master towards his servants is tyrannical for in this government that alone which is advantageous to the master is performed this therefore appears to be right but the persian government is erroneous for of things that are different the governments also are different but the government of man and wife appears to be aristocratic for the man governs according to desert and in those things in which it is proper for the man to govern but he permits his wife to rule over such things as are adapted to be governed by a woman if the man however has dominion in all things the government is changed into an oligarchy for he does this contrary to desert and not so far as he is the better character but it sometimes happens that women in consequence of being heiresses govern even in things pertaining to men the government therefore in this case is not according to virtue but is through wealth and power in the same manner as in oligarchies and the government of brothers resembles a timocracy for they are equal except so far as they differ in their ages hence if there is a great difference in their ages the friendship is no longer fraternal but a democratic government is especially to be seen in those families which are without a master for here all govern equally in those families also where he who governs is a man of a weak understanding every one has the power of acting as he pleases chapter eleven in each of the polities however man he is attentive to their interest like a shepherd in order that they may do well whence also homer calls agamemnon the shepherd of the people such likewise is paternal friendship but it differs in the magnitude of the benefits which it confers for the father is the cause of the existence of his child which appears to be a thing of the greatest consequence and also procures him nutriment and education the same things likewise are attributed to progenitors for a father is naturally adapted to rule over his children and progenitors over the offspring of their children and kings over their subjects but these friendships consist in transcendency on which account also parents are honoured the just therefore in these is not the same but subsists according to desert for thus also the friendship subsists there is likewise the same friendship between a husband and a wife as in an aristocracy for it subsists according to virtue and a more ample good is attributed to the better character and that which is adapted and appropriate is attributed to each for thus also justice is effected but the friendship of brothers resembles that of associates for they are equal and of the same age and persons of this description apply themselves for the most part to the same disciplines and are similar in their manners the friendship therefore which exists in a timocracy resembles this for in this government it is requisite that the citizens should be equal and worthy persons hence they alternately and equally govern such therefore is the friendship of brothers 
In corrupt polities, however, as the justice is but small, so likewise is the friendship, and it exists in the smallest degree in the worst polity. For in a tyranny there is either no friendship or very little, since among those with whom there is nothing common between the governor and the governed, there is not any friendship, for neither is there any justice. But the friendship between them resembles that which is between an artist and his instrument, between the soul and the body, and between a master and his servant. For these, indeed, are benefited by those that use them. There is not, however, any friendship with, nor justice towards things inanimate, as neither is there towards a horse or an ox, or towards a slave, so far as he is a slave, since there is nothing common between these. For a slave is an animated instrument, but an instrument is an inanimate slave. So far, therefore, as he is a slave, there is no friendship between him and his master, but there may be, so far as he is a man. For it appears that there is a certain justice due from every man towards every man who is able to partake of law and compact, and therefore there may also be a friendship between any one man and another, so far as each is a man. In tyrannical governments, however, there is but little friendship and justice, but there is very much of each in democracies, for among those that are equal, many things are common. Chapter 12 All friendship, therefore, as we have before observed, consists in communion, but it may be divided into that which subsists between kindred and that which subsists between associates. But political friendships, the friendships of those of the same tribe, of those who sail together, and such like, are more similar to the friendships of associates, for they appear to exist, as it were, from compact. Among these, also, hospitable friendships may be ranked. The friendship, likewise, of kindred appears to be multiform, and the whole of it depends from paternal friendship. For parents love their children, as being something of themselves, but children love their parents, as being something proceeding from them. Parents, however, have a greater knowledge of their offspring, so as to know more accurately that they are their offspring, than the offspring know that they proceeded from their parents. And that from which a thing is generated has a greater familiarity and alliance with the thing produced, than the thing produced has with its maker. For that which originates from a thing is the property of that from which it originates, as a tooth, or a hair, or anything else, is the property of its possessor. But that from which a thing originates is not the property of any one of the things which originate from it, or is so in a less degree. The love also of parents to their children is superior to that of children to their parents, by length of time, for parents love their children as soon as they are born, but children their parents in process of time, when they begin to understand or perceive that they are their parents. From these things, likewise, it is evident on what account mothers love their children more than fathers love them. Parents, indeed, therefore, love their children as themselves, for those that proceed from them are, as it were, their other selves, by being separated from them but children love their parents as proceeding from them. Brothers, however, love each other in consequence of being born from the same parents, for sameness with their parents causes them to be the same with each other. Hence it is said that they have the same blood, the same root, and such like expressions. They are, therefore, in a certain respect, one and the same in separate bodies. The being educated together also, and equality of age, greatly contribute to friendship, for, according to the proverb, quote, equal delights in equal age, close quote. And those who are accustomed to the same things are associates. Hence, also, fraternal friendship is assimilated to the friendship of associates. Cousins, likewise, and the remaining kindred become conjoined from the friendship of brothers in consequence of immediately originating from the same persons. Some, however, become more united in friendship, and others less, in consequence of the source of their race being nearer or more remote. But the friendship of children towards their parents, and of men towards the gods, 
is as towards that which is good and transcendent for parents and the gods confer the greatest benefits for they are the causes of existence and of being nourished and when they are of a proper age of being educated a friendship also of this kind possesses the delectable and the useful in a greater degree than the friendship of strangers because their life is in a greater degree more common those things however are to be found in fraternal friendship which exist in the friendship of associates and in a greater degree in those that are worthy and in short in those that are similar in proportion as they are more familiar and love each other from their birth and in proportion as those who are born from the same parents who are nourished together and similarly educated are more similar in their manners in this friendship likewise the proof which is obtained from time is most abundant and most firm and things pertaining to friendship subsist analogously in the remaining gradations of kindred but the friendship between man and wife appears to be according to nature for man is more a connubial than a political animal and this by how much more a family is prior to and more necessary than a city and the procreation of offspring is more common to all animals in other animals therefore the communion proceeds thus far i e as far as to the procreation of offspring but men and women not only cohabit for the sake of begetting children but also with a view to the necessaries and conveniences of life for their employments are immediately divided and those of the husband are different from those of the wife hence they assist each other referring their own private possessions to the common good of the family on account of these things therefore both the useful and the delectable appear to be contained in this friendship it will also exist on account of virtue if the husband and wife are worthy characters for there is a virtue pertaining to each and they will rejoice in a thing of this kind children however appear to be a bond and hence those marriages that are without children are more swiftly dissolved for children are a common good to both the husband and wife and that which is common connects to inquire also how a husband ought to live with his wife and in short one friend with another appears to be nothing else than to inquire how justice subsists between them for it does not appear that there is the same justice between one friend and another nor between one stranger one associate and one disciple with another chapter thirteen since therefore there are three kinds of friendship as was observed in the beginning and according to each some are friends in equality but others according to transcendency for similarly good men are friends and between worthy men who are not equally worthy the more may be the friend of the less worthy and in a similar manner with respect to friendships which subsist on account of delight and on account of utility they may be equal or unequal and different in the advantages with which they are attended this being the case it is requisite that those friends who are equal should be equalized in loving and other things pertaining to friendship but that those who are unequal should render to themselves that which is analogous in transcendencies accusations however and complaints reasonably take place in that friendship alone or principally which is founded in utility for those who are friends on account of virtue are readily disposed to benefit each other for this is the peculiarity of virtue and friendship but with those who contend with each other in kindness there are no accusations nor contests for no one is indignant with him who loves and benefits him but if he is grateful he will recompense him by benefiting him in return he however who transcends in the benefits which he confers obtaining that which he desires will not accuse his friend for each aspires after good nor do accusations and complaints very much take place in the friendships which are founded in pleasure for at one and the same time both obtain the objects of their desire if they rejoice to live together he however will appear to be ridiculous who accuses him by whom he is not delighted when it is not possible to spend his time with him but the friendship which is founded in utility is full of accusations and complaints for since they make use of each other with a view to advantage they are always in want of more 
and fancy they have less than is proper, and blame their friends because they do not obtain as much as they are in want of, though they deserve to obtain it. But those who benefit are not able to supply as much as those who are benefited require. It appears, however, that as the just is twofold, for one kind is unwritten, but the other is legal, thus also with respect to the friendship, which is founded in utility, one kind indeed is ethical, but the other is legal. Accusations, therefore, then especially take place, when compacts are formed, and dissolved, not with a view to the same friendship, as that by which they are united. But the legal friendship, founded in utility, is that which subsists by compacts, one kind, indeed, being entirely venal, from hand to hand, viz., such as takes place in buying and selling, but another kind is more liberal, in which one thing is to be given for another at a stated time, but from compact. In this friendship, however, that which is owing is manifest, and is not ambiguous, but a friendly delay is permitted to take place. Hence, with some of these, there are no judicial processes, but they think it is requisite to love those who form compacts from the obligation of fidelity. But the ethical friendship does not consist in compacts, but what it gives, it gives as to a friend, and this is also the case with whatever is imparted by the one to the other. He, however, who gives, thinks it fit that he should receive in return an equivalent, or more than an equivalent, as if he had not given but lent. But if he does not receive the retribution which he expected from the contract, he accuses his friend, and this happens because all or most men wish to obtain things which are truly beautiful, but deliberately choose what is advantageous. But it is beautiful to benefit, not with a view to be benefited in return, and it is advantageous to be benefited. He, therefore, who is able, ought to make a retribution equivalent to the benefit he has received, and willingly, for a friend must not return kindness unwillingly. If, therefore, he has erred from the first, and has been benefited by an improper person, for he was not benefited by a friend, nor by one who did this for his sake, if this be the case, retribution must be made, as if he had been benefited by compact. Hence, he who has been benefited by such a one ought to promise that he will make a retribution if he can, but if he cannot, he who conferred the benefit ought not to think it fit that he should be recompensed, so that, if possible, retribution is to be made. In the beginning, however, it is requisite, when a benefit is offered, to consider by whom it is offered, and with what view, so as either to accept or refuse it. But it may be doubted whether retribution is to be measured by the advantage of him who receives it, or by the beneficence of him who made it. For those who receive it say in extenuation that they receive such things from benefactors as are of little use to them, and which they might have received from others. But, on the contrary, the benefactors say that they bestow the greatest things which it was in their power to give, and which could not be obtained from others, and that they conferred them in dangerous circumstances, or such like necessities. Since, therefore, this friendship subsists on account of utility, the measure of it is the advantage of him who is benefited, for he is the person who is in want, and his friend assists him, in order that he may receive an equal benefit in return. The assistance, therefore, afforded by him who is benefited will be as great as that which he received, and as much or even more must be given by him in return, for it is more beautiful and becoming. But in those friendships which are founded in virtue, there are no accusations, and the deliberate choice of him who benefits resembles a measure, for the authority of virtue and manners consists in deliberate choice. Chapter 14 Dissensions, however, take place in those friendships which subsist according to transcendency. For each thinks it fit that he should have more than the other. But when this takes place, the friendship is dissolved. For the better character of the two thinks it is proper that he should have more than the other. For more ought to be distributed to a good man. This is also the case with him who is the more useful person of the two. 
for they say it is not fit that he who is useless should have an equal portion with him who is useful since ministrant offices will take place and not friendship unless what is done from friendship is according to the desert of the deeds for they are of opinion that as in pecuniary negotiations those who employ a greater sum of money receive more profit thus also it ought to be in friendship the contrary however is the opinion of him who is indigent and who is the worst character for these think that it is the province of a good friend to assist those that are in want for what advantage say they is there in being the friend of a worthy or powerful man if no benefit is to be derived from him it seems however that each thinks rightly and that it is requisite to distribute more to each from friendship yet not of the same thing but more of honour indeed to him who transcends but more of gain to him who is indigent for honour indeed is the reward of virtue and beneficence but gain is the auxiliary of indigence this also appears to be the case in polities for he is not honoured who is the cause of no good to the community since that which is common is given to him who benefits the community but honour is some thing common for it is not possible for a man at one and the same time to be enriched and honoured by the community since no one endures to have less in all things hence to him who is inferior in wealth honour is given but money to him who is to be bribed by gifts for distribution according to desert equalizes and preserves friendship as we have before observed in this manner therefore it is requisite to act towards those who are unequal and he who is benefited either in wealth or in virtue should remunerate him by whom he is benefited with honour thus recompensing him as far as he is able for friendship requires that which is possible and not that which is according to desert for a recompense according to desert is not possible in all things as in honours conferred on the gods and parents since no one can bestow these according to desert but he who pays homage to them to the utmost of his power appears to be a worthy man hence though it would seem not to be lawful for a son to abandon his father yet it is lawful for a father to abandon his son for a return ought to be made by him who is a debtor but a son can do nothing worthy of the benefits he has received from his father so that he will always be his debtor those however to whom others are indebted have the power of abandoning their debtors and therefore a father has this power at the same time however no father perhaps will abandon his son unless the son is transcendently depraved for exclusive of natural friendship it is human not to refuse giving assistance when it is wanted but if the son is depraved he is either to be avoided by his father or his father must not be anxious to assist him a depraved son however sometimes hates his father or at least does not very much endeavour to assist him for the multitude wish to be benefited but they avoid acting beneficently as a useless thing and thus much concerning these particulars end of book eight recording in memory of mitchell edwards